I hadn't been doing anything special on that day. It all happened when I was, like always, sleeping in my ash-gray shirt and sweatpants that were much more comfy than pajamas. Hey, would you mind waking up? Mr. Kaima Masuda? Someone I didn't know was calling out my name, and before I knew it, everything except the clothes on my back was gone. My bed, my pillow, my apartment, heck, the apartment building, and even the ground were all gone, leaving me stranded in a star-dotted vacuum that looked a lot like space. After making sure that I could breathe properly, I opened my eyes. I felt a floaty sensation, as if I were still asleep. For a second I wondered if I had been kidnapped, but after seeing my surroundings, I assumed I was dreaming and tried to go back to sleep. This feels nice and floaty. I'm definitely getting a good night's sleep tonight. Um, would you please listen to me? I am a god, after all. Huh. Yeah, yeah, I'm listening. Is that true? You're not sleeping or anything, right? I don't have much time here. You're being summoned to another world right now. You'll regret it if you don't listen to me, okay? I'm listening, I'm listening. I don't know if I've ever met someone so lazy before. Well, it looks like we're out of time. I hate to let you go, but I guess I'll just have to ask the next person that comes by here. What? but I'll at least make sure you can understand the other world's language. And if you do help me out, I'll make sure you're repaid for your efforts. I wish not to work. The world you're being summoned to has magic, but civilization there hasn't developed very much. You'll have to work to survive. Plus, the fact you're being summoned means someone out there wants you to do some kind of job for them. I want to go home. Well, good luck. A bright light enveloped me, blinding my vision. Day one, a all right. The summoning was successful. Wait, what? A human? But why? I didn't know how it worked, but I appeared in a room with a faintly glowing floor and white walls. Is it still a room? If it's as big as a gymnasium? Either way, that's where I ended up. In front of me was a beautiful girl that looked a lot like the kind of princess knight you could find in all sorts of video games. She had golden hair that reached all the way down to her waist and a firm, though somewhat childish gaze. And lastly, long white boots that went all the way up to her thighs. Yep, those are some good legs. I've got a foot fetish though, so would you mind taking those boots off for a second? I really want to see what's under them. And after that, I'd appreciate it if you would put on some knee socks. Even some black ones would be fine. But I'm getting off track here. Apparently that hadn't been a dream, but the real issue was how extremely sleepy I was. I love sleeping more than I love eating three meals a day. Seriously. But why? I spent all of my DP. Why'd I have to get a small fry like Thias? Mind if I go back to sleep? Eh? You don't mind, right? Oh, by the way, do you have a bed or something? I detailed. What's with this girl? I just want to sleep but she's screeching and ruining the mood. She's pretty attractive, mainly her feet, but I guess looks are only skin deep. What a shame. She'd be some really nice eye candy otherwise. Gur, what's going on? I've never heard of gotcha monsters talking. Oh, right, it's a human. Makes sense that it can talk, then. I guess. Hey, what's with you? Keep it down, you're making my ears hurt. Ah, uh, okay. Wait, no, what's with you? I'm the one who summoned you, so you should just listen to everything I say. Is your mom or dad nearby? I kinda wanna go home, so... I'm not a child. Listen up! You're a monster that's been summoned by me, this dungeon's core. I'll work you to the bone until you die, got it? Dungeon core. Monster. Yeah, I have no idea what's going on. If that god was telling the truth... I've been summoned to another world, and this girl is the person who summoned me. But it doesn't look like I'm a hero or anything. Phew. That's a relief. I don't want to get wrapped up in anything annoying like protecting the world or whatever. That'd get in the way of my precious sleeping time. Come on, stand up and go outside already. Kill all those bandits. I spent 1000 DP on you, so you're actually really strong, right? Holy crap, girl. 
you sure started saying some pretty violent things all of a sudden. I'm a little less sleepy now, seriously. All right, I'll listen to what you've got to say, but first you've got to help me out a little here. What's a dungeon core? What are monsters? What's DP? I can tell that, uh. You summoned me here. Oh wow, I'm impressed. Makes sense that a talking creature like you is a little smart too. Maybe you're a wizard type monster. Well, whatever. This is my dungeon. And obviously, this is the master room within me, the dungeon core. All right. What about the dungeon master? Oh, you know about dungeon masters? That's interesting. But my dungeon doesn't have one. Oh, wait. I guess that would make me the dungeon master, kinda? Naturally, I knew nothing about the dungeon masters of this world, but I could guess that they existed thanks to how many fantasy games I've played. But she also mentioned a dungeon core. That must be the heart of this dungeon. And also, this girl? Hey, wait a second. You said I'm a small fry since I'm a human, but aren't you a human too? Nah. This is just my human form. Hey, wait a second. You need to start calling me master. Ah, that's right, you haven't told me your name yet. What is it? Me? I'm Dungeon Core number 695. A number? Really? That's pretty lazy. But wait. If she's number 695, that must mean there's 694 other dungeons. Okay, I take it back. I would get pretty lazy naming them too. I don't even know if I could think up that many names. All right, you're Rokuko now. Um, I'm what? I mean, it'd be pretty hard to call you Dungeon Whatever Number Whatever, so I'll just name you Rokuko. Full name being Rokuko Dungeon Core. Oh, by the way, my name's Kaima Masuda. Go ahead and call me Kaima. Not Masuda, Kaima. Dungeon Core number 695, henceforth known as Rokuko, looked at me with complete bafflement in her eyes. What? Masuda. Master Kaima. Is that a fake name or something? Wait, what did you just make me essay? Kaima Masuda has been recognized as Dungeon Master. Why? Why? Rokuko and I both said the exact same thing at the same time. A transparent, green window popped up before my eyes. It looked like the kind of message window you see in video games all the time. Written on that window in white letters was a message describing that I had been recognized as this dungeon's master. I have no idea what's going on, but I guess I'm a dungeon master now. Menu. Hold on. I take it back. Cancel. Undo what just happened. The blonde girl. Rokuko summoned her own window and shouted at it, but nothing in particular happened. Ah. Uh, my ears are really starting to hurt, sheesh. Hey, you're being loud as hell right now. Tone it down a little. Actually, just shut up entirely. WH what's with you? Don't order. Me. Arrow. She shut up. Oh, yeah? I'm the dungeon master now. And it looks like dungeons have to obey their master no matter what. He hey. A perfect life without work may have just fallen straight into my lap. That's right. I won't have to work anymore. I'll make this blonde girl do all my work for me while I sleep all day every day. It'll be perfect, dot yeah, I'd have to be a completely trash person to do something like that. Wow. Not to mention, she's a girl. It just wouldn't work out. If she were my age or older, I could at least rest easy while making her do my chores or whatever. But, she looks younger than me. She's like a middle schooler at best. Considering how well-developed some elementary schoolers are nowadays, she could probably get discounts at theme parks without trying too hard. A uh, menu? Whoa! It actually popped up. Let's see. What do we have here? A transparent window appeared before me after I called out for it. It was basically a video game menu. Everything I could do was listed out for me in a clear, easy-to-comprehend way. I had three main options available to me. Dungeon Minions Dungeon Point Catalog Everything was written in nice and easy Japanese for me. Wait. Or is this what that god meant when he said he'd help me understand the language? 
Yeah, that must be it. Dungeon Point Catalog. Looks like I can use that DP Rokoko was talking about earlier to do things here. Oh wow, she's glaring at me pretty hard. Ha ha ha, you aren't scary at all. You're actually pretty cute when you can't talk. I'll give her head a little rub. Oh, that just made her more angry. She's screaming, but no words are coming out. Fantastic. All right, you can talk again. Trash. Idiot. Ah, uh, finally, I can talk again. What did you do to me, you piece of walking garbage? Uh-huh. I'm afraid to say that the only idiot here is you, Rokuko. It seems like you accidentally made me your master. Or in other words, your dungeon master. Undo that. Why? Be because. I'm. I'm the most important person here. Obey me. Obey. The blonde girl glared at me, cheeks flushed red and eyes brimming with tears. But now I know for sure. This girl's an idiot. Don't call me an idiot. Oh, did I say that out loud? But seriously. Think about it. Why did you summon me? Well, to make you a monster in my dungeon. In other words, if I obey you, I'll be forced to fight as a dungeon monster under your command. I'd live or die by the orders you give me. Actually, I'm pretty confident that any order you'd give me would just lead to me dying. So, I'm not going to give up my power over you. No way. I love sleeping, but I'm a bit young to start sleeping for eternity, if you catch my drift. W.L., that's just how dungeon monsters work. And you look pretty weak, so... Looks like we're finally on the same page. Though she's not too happy about it. I said this earlier, but you can call me Kaima. Hmm, okay, Kaima. N-G-H. I can't resist you. Anyway, I'm gonna check out the dungeon real fast. I'd like my sleeping arrangements to be nice and safe, after all. I selected dungeon. From the menu. Just touching it worked fine but I imagine it would have responded to voice commands as well. Okay, let's check out this dungeon map. She was saying something about bandits, so... So, it looks to me that the dungeon core is right in the middle of the room filled with invading bandits. It looks that way to me too. Why? Eh? Don't you know that the dungeon core won't work unless it's placed inside of the dungeon? That's just common sense. I was starting to get a headache dungeon cores don't work unless they're placed inside of a dungeon. This dungeon only had one room. So, the dungeon core was placed inside of that room. And there were eight bandits inside that very same room. This dungeon's already completely friggin' screwed. It was a complete checkmate. Why did she let things get this bad? This is why I used all the DP I had to summon a monster that could beat all those bandits. But what I got instead was you, Kaima. By the way, what'll happen to me, the dungeon master, if the dungeon core gets destroyed? Well, obviously you'll die. The master and the core are connected, they live and die together. Holy crap, I'm gonna die. I'm completely done for. Oh god. Don't worry, it's okay. The core will be fine even if the master dies. What's okay about that? And weren't you just talking about us living and dying together? Ah, uh, yeah? Really, don't worry. You're not going to die yet. After hearing that, I realized that I wasn't dead yet despite how it had been several minutes since I first saw that the core was surrounded. I glanced at Rokuko and saw that she was looking at me with an irritated expression that said, Humph, why are you getting so worked up over nothing? How about I tickle your feet until you pee yourself, huh? Huh? What's going on? Well, about that. It's been three days since these bandits invaded my dungeon, but they haven't tried to destroy its core at all. Why? Look, you can use the dungeon menu to look into the dungeon and monitor it directly. As advised, I opened a monitor through the dungeon menu. A new window appeared from thin air before me, displaying what looked like video footage from a security camera placed inside of the dungeon. The bandits were all sleeping around the dungeon core. Two of them seemed to be awake and keeping guard, but... All right. They don't seem like they're about to attack the core. By the way, the core was about the size of a basketball and was glowing much like the walls and floor of the room I was in. See? 
I don't really know what's going on, but we're safe for now. Plus, I get more DP when intruders are in the dungeon, so it works out. By the way, how do you get more DP? Um, so? To summarize what Rokuko said, one absorb it from the surrounding ground. This tends to be about 10 DP a day to allow time to pass while an intruder is inside of the dungeon. Varies depending on the strength of the intruder 3 kill an intruder. Varies depending on the strength of the intruder 4 offer up a corpse. Varies depending on the former strength of whoever died 5 offer up treasure. Varies depending on the treasure those were the main ways. By the way, it would cost about 20 DP to summon one goblin. Under normal circumstances she would be able to summon one goblin every two days, but the eight bandits sleeping in the dungeon boosted her DP gain by an additional 80 DP each day, and apparently that number would increase if they stayed inside the dungeon for longer. So, using the 900 DP she saved up through 10 days of being inhabited by bandits, in addition to 100 DP she had stashed away for a rainy day, Rokuko had pulled all of her 1,000 DP into rolling a single monster gacha. Yeah. I can understand why she would expect something as strong as 50 goblins after spending 50 goblins worth of DP on something. But sometimes, you gamble and you lose. And wait a second, I'm what she got out of a gacha roll. Seriously? So, why aren't you a dragon? I mean, it wouldn't be surprising if you had rolled a goblin. You're being too greedy. Rokoku was just way too egotistical. Did she think she was the center of the universe or something? Bad things happen to everyone, you can't expect everything to go well for you. You might even end up being summoned to another world and forced to work against your will even though you just want to sleep. Oh, I forgot to mention. Right now, the 10 DP from the ground doesn't count. Huh? Why not? Rokuko's explanation about DP hadn't mentioned anything about intruders getting in the way of drawing DP from the ground. Well, it costs some DP for me to maintain this form. Speaking of which, Rokuko had mentioned that she was the avatar of the dungeon core or something like that. Does that mean she could save us some DP by vanishing? Eh? No, you're misunderstanding something. This is just a special form I use when I want to look fancy. I didn't want the monster I summoned to look down on me. In other words, that's just a temporary form. Oh, can you go back to your normal form then? You're wasting DP. Eh? It's not temporary or anything, but okay. One second. And then N. Rokuko flashed brightly, and then where she once stood was a blonde lowly that looked just like a younger Rokuko. She was wearing a white dress and would only reach my waist even if she stood on her tippy toes. She looked so small and cute a lilicon would be drooling at the sight of her. Even her childishly spoiled gaze just made me smile as if I were looking at a rowdy kid. So, what do you think? This is the low-energy form I use to save DP. Oh, that's your low-energy form, huh? You look pretty young. H.M.? Well, I guess I do look like a child from a human's perspective. What, do you like this body more? I'm not a lilicon, so I think she looked hotter before. I still love her toes even though they're smaller, but I'm not perverted enough to lay my hands on someone that looks like a little girl. So, now we're getting 10 DP again, yeah? Uh-huh. 10 DP a day. And we have 9 DP total right now. She must have waited until the very moment she had 1,000 DP to roll the gacha, given how basically no DP was left over. I scrolled through the DP catalog, but found that you couldn't even summon a goblin with 9 DP. How about a dragon? Lady, even the weakest dragon there, a lesser dragon, costs 100,000 DP. Ha ha! Whoever thought they could get an expensive monster like that for 1,000 DP sure is an idiot. I searched the household goods page and discovered that I could buy lots of things even with just 9 DP. All right, I've decided. On what, Kaima? I exchanged 5 DP for a buckwheat pillow. I'm going to bed. Eh? Hold on. What about the bandits? Be quiet while I'm sleeping. Night. Yep. DP sure is useful. I rolled onto my side and closed my eyes listening as Rokuko's noisy cries slowly faded into silence. Day two I stood up after waking up and stretched my stiff muscles. 
The floor was pretty warm, not cold at all, but it was also hard and constantly glowing. Not exactly the best place to get a good night's sleep. I had been hoping that I might find myself back in my room after waking up, but had no such luck. I glanced to the side and saw Rokuko glaring at me. Gur, why you're finally awake, Kaima? Yo, Rokuko. How long was I asleep? As if I know. You slept for nine hours. Ah, my mouth said that on its own. I didn't know if time moved at the same speed as it did on Earth, but I decided to just roll with it and assume I had indeed slept for nine hours. I checked our DP and saw that our 4 DP had turned into 34 DP. I guess the bandits' DP trickles in over time. The bandits probably aren't all as strong as each other either, so I should just give up on making precise estimations of DP gain. What time is it right now? It's 8 in the morning. By the way, one day has 24 hours in it. Wait. Ah, uh, why am I answering you? Thanks, much appreciated. By the way, end every sentence you say with meow. Don't mess with meow. Each day consisted of 24 hours. As an aside, each year seemed to consist of 12 months, or 365 days. Basically the same thing as Earth. Perfect, I won't have any trouble remembering that. Just for peace of mind, I investigated how much weight my orders held and learned that Rokuko's body would execute them on its own. I'm in another world and there's a girl who has to listen to everything I say. If I weren't a gentleman dedicated to sleep, there would be some adult-only things happening right now. I canceled the meow order and decided to double-check the situation. What's going on with the bandits? They just woke up and went outside. One stayed behind to stand guard. Hmm. So, let's summon a goblin or something. DP summoning. Goblin. What? While I was in the middle of being stunned, a faintly glowing circle appeared on the ground. It then flashed brightly, and before I knew it, there was a small, ugly-looking person with green skin standing where the circle used to be. The same thing probably happened when I got summoned. Okay. Not okay. Oh, we? I thumped Rokuko on the head. I checked our DP and saw that we only had 14 DP left. 20 DP was gone, just like that. WH, why do you do that? Getting hit like that hurts. What do you do if you break me? Don't just up and use DP on your own like that, idiot. What? It's my DP. I can do whatever I want with it. Okay, yeah? She's an idiot. I grabbed onto Rokuko's head and forced her to look me in the eyes. It's not your DP anymore. It's my DP. If you really want to use it for something, get my permission first. You don't want to die, right? Tell me more about this place first. And, can we return this goblin? Nope. So, we're right by Tsaya Mountain. By the way, this dungeon's name is... I heard an adventurer say that. Seriously? They're not even thinking of this place as a dungeon. Come on. Hey, won't you kill that bandit for me? We would get lots of DP if you kill him. MMM, it feels like he would be worth about 200 DP. That may sound nice, but he would be worth just as much if he stuck around the dungeon for ten full days. Nah, we're not going to attack the bandits yet. Why not? He's all alone. We could take him down if we had. Around ten goblins. You'd spend two hundred DP to earn two hundred DP. And we don't even have enough DP to summon that many, anyway. But seriously. Goblins are as weak as they look, huh? Ten goblins to take down one bandit. Dang. We're gonna keep saving DP for now. Don't waste any of it. We'll be better off saving a ton and using it all at once. And right now, we're better off not agitating the bandits. What do you do if we send out goblins and they decide to destroy the dungeon core to stop that from happening again? Ah, uh, I didn't think about that at all. You sure are smart, Kaima. Nah, you're just an idiot. And now that you know that, listen to everything I say. Got it? Oh, okay. I will. Rokuko nodded obediently. I guess in her energy-saving form, both her body and her mind are that of a kid's. Nah, she was always like that. 
She's a ditzy airhead through and through. All of a sudden, my stomach grumbled. Oh, yeah? I haven't eaten anything since yesterday. All right, time to eat. Got any food? Eh? Ah, right. Monsters need to eat food, right? I don't need to eat anything, so I totally forgot about that. Guess she's still gonna treat me like a monster. I flipped through the DP catalog for food. There were lots of things there, but I went ahead and spent five DP to buy bread and water. A magic circle appeared with a flash, and soon enough, darkish bread and a wood cup appeared above it. After splitting half of it with the quietly sitting goblin, we ate together like pals. The bread was really, really hard. I felt as if it were just sitting in clumps in my stomach, but I was tired enough to just go back to sleep right away. Day three two days had passed since I was summoned. Looks like we've got 179 DP now. Wait, no. It just went up to 180. I could summon nine whole goblins with this much. As an aside, I had figured out why the bandits hadn't destroyed the dungeon core. They were using it in place of a foot warmer. The dungeon core glowed faintly and was just a little warm. The boss of the bandits had built his bed in the core room and was putting his feet on it as he slept. I learned that we could look directly out of the master room, but after trying it out, an entire wall turned into a close-up of a dirty foot. Naturally, it was terrible. Hello, Miss Dungeon Core. How does it feel to have your heart getting stepped on? W. L. I'm earning a lot of DP thanks to them being here, so... This is like a win-win, you know? Humph. Our lovable blonde Loli had gotten teary-eyed after realizing that her heart was being trampled by stinky-looking feet. Honestly, she gets cuter the more time I spend with her. I spent some more time investigating the menu and learned that I could look into the dungeon from basically any angle I wanted by using the existing walls and ceilings. All right. Guess I should finally start doing something. You'll summon something, right? You'll summon a lot of goblins and kill them all, right? Ah, uh, buying a lizard man for 150 DP might be smart. I won't forgive that bandit boss. Let's stab him to death. Idiot. They'll just kill us in revenge if we try that. Look at how many of them there are. As expected, she felt humiliated over having her heart used as a simple foot warmer. She was practically barking like a dog and growling at the bandit's boss. Though given how cute her appearance was in energy-saving mode, she was more like a puppy than anything. There's eight of them. We're way too weak to take them on. And if you hadn't summoned that first goblin, we wouldn't need to waste so much DP on food. And mm -hmm, the maintenance cost. I had never thought of that before. Wait. Didn't you waste a bunch of DP on that futon or whatever? Don't be ridiculous. That futon 50 DP was an absolutely necessary expense. So, what are you going to do? I've got a plan, but... Hey, Rokuko, do you know how to write words? And do you think those bandits can read? Writing? Uh-huh, I can write. I saw those bandits reading a book they stole from someone before, so... They can definitely read simple things. Sweet. Then listen closely and write the things I tell you to. Okay. Bus. Wake you up. The boss of the bandits woke up in the cave and saw a chest in front of him. Was this thing here yesterday? Nah, no way. I woulda saw it before sleeping. The hell is this thing? Where'd it come from? We dunno, know, boss. Roderidge was on guard and he said nobody brought it inside or nothing dot. So what you're saying is? It just poofed and appeared in the middle of this cave like magic? Air. I guess so? The bandit boss investigated the chest, but didn't find any traps inside of it. He opened it carefully and saw that an iron helmet was resting inside. It was a high-quality helmet, and it looked new, too. Hey, this thing is pretty nice. We could sell it for a lot of money. Or we could use it either way. Boss, there's something written on the bottom of the chest. Eh? The hell? Letters? Hey, Brockin. You can read, right? Read this. You got it, boss. Let's see. The boss showed the chest to a subordinate and made him read it. The contents of the message were unbelievable. I am the dungeon core. 
Thank you for defeating those goblins. This is a present from me. It may take some time, but if you bring me corpses, I can give you more presents. Dungeon Core Hey, are we in a fucking dungeon? I dunno, I heard this place was just an ordinary cave. Ah, uh, seriously? Looks like luck's finally on my side. Why? Why did you make me thank them? The blonde lowly stomped around in a circle. I can see your white panties, you know. Absolutely shameful. Though, I definitely understood why she was so upset. After all, I had spent every last DP we had giving that, present, to the bandit's boss. To be specific, I had spent 5 DP on a pen and ink, 5 DP on a treasure chest, and 170 DP on a high-quality steel helmet. We now had absolutely no DP left. Zero DP. Silch. Why? It would have been way, way better for us to spend all that DP on goblins. And then die after the bandits came swinging at us? Ha ha ha, sorry, but I don't want to die yet. I just want to sleep. Be but still. That was just... Gur, you traitor. Calm down. That gift just bought us some valuable time. I'll kill them all soon enough, trust me. Eh? Rokuko blinked in surprise, as if she hadn't expected me to say something like, I'll kill them all. But why? Didn't you give them that gift because you're a human and want to help them out? What? No. I just want my sleeping arrangements to be safe. And that's not gonna happen with dangerous guys like them hanging around. Yeah. Th then, well, don't you feel bad about killing members of your own species? Nope. I just wanna sleep. And it's not like I'm gonna be doing anything to them myself, so. Ah, right. I don't have anything else to do today, so I can just go ahead and sleep. I got into my futon and rolled onto my side. Explain what's going on. All right, all right. I'll explain everything. Tomorrow. Sleep tight. Didn't go to sleep. Rokuko's voice faded out as I fell asleep. Day four, ah, I slept pretty well. I really want a better futon. Good morning. You really slept for the whole day. Don't you get tired of doing that? Not at all. So, now that you're awake, explain what's going on. But first, look at the DP. What's going on? I opened the menu to check our DP and saw that we now had 867 DP. Huh. Oh wow, it shot way up. Not quite as much as I was hoping for, but this will do. Are you saying you knew this would happen? Huh. Uh, basically, but let me ask you this first. Did something happen? Some adventurers attacked. According to Rokuko, a bandit standing guard noticed that adventurers were on their way to the cave, so all the bandits hid in the main room out of sight from the entrance corridor before launching a surprise attack. They then defeated the four adventurers without a single scratch on any of them. So, after that, the bandits looted the adventurers' corpses and offered up their corpses to me. They even went out of their way to push them against the dungeon core. I could do that on my own if they just left the corpses lying around in the dungeon, though. They figured that out after I went out of my way to absorb the corpses they weren't pushing against me, I think. They killed them inside of the dungeon, huh? I guess those bandits are smarter than you, Rokuko. What do you mean by that? I mean what I said. After hearing that, Rokuko's smile became a peeved frown, cheeks puffing out. It looked less like she was angry and more like she was pouting. But how did you know that the adventurers were coming? Seriously. Didn't you say yourself that adventurers come here once or twice a month? Ah. Uh, now that you mention it, I did say that. But Kaima, wouldn't you prefer it if the bandits left? No, I wouldn't. I can't kill them all if they run away, right? There's a bunch of DP right there waiting for us. I don't want to waste it. I'm gonna squeeze every last bit of value from them that I can. Wow. You called them DP even though you're a human too. Kaima, I'm starting to respect you a little bit. You monster. Thanks. Now I'm gonna go back to sleep. Night night. You're going back to sleep even though you just woke up. What an idiot. You can obviously only go back to sleep right after waking up. 
It's a precious opportunity. However, we're gonna add a room. We have enough ink to write another letter on a treasure chest, right? Eh? Oh, right. We do. But are you really going to waste DP on a room? We have so much. Rokuko said that while flipping through the DP catalog and looking at all the monsters we could summon for 800 DP. Ha ha ha. Will this blonde lowly never learn? All right, here I go. After some time. Why, why did you make me spend 480 whole DP on that guy? Whoa now. 10 DP for the treasure chest and pillow, 20 DP for the two wooden doors, and 50 DP for the simple bed. We only spent 80 DP on him. What? It cost 200 DP each to add those rooms, didn't it? Don't be stupid. Unlike that steel helmet, they can't take those rooms from the dungeon and sell them. They're permanently ours. Rokuko tilted her head with a confused expression on her face, not understanding what I had meant. Wait a second. We have a big problem. All of our 870 DP is gone, completely gone. Yeah, cause I used it all. On what? Take a look. I showed her the dungeon map. Using the camera, I went outside the dungeon and showed her that I had built another single room cave elsewhere on the mountain and added a dirt path to connect it with the main body of the dungeon. The room had cost 200 DP and the 5 meter wide path had cost 30 DP. P. Ha! I never would have thought about expanding the dungeon from the outside. You sure have a lot of crazy ideas, Kaima. But what are you going to do with that room? Wasn't it a complete waste of DP? Rejoice, my companion. This is a room made especially for goblins, just like you've always wanted. Yay, wait, did I want something like that? Don't you love goblins? She was always telling me to summon goblins this, summon goblins that. It took a bit, but it finally dawned on me. Rokuko loves goblins. She wants to be surrounded by goblins. She wants goblins to serve her. She wants to be queen of the goblins. Um, I think you're taking things the wrong way. Don't worry, I'm not going to make fun of you. Everyone has their own fetishes. My friend, I'll fight by your side even if you do have a massive goblin fetish. Hey, what do you mean by that? What's with that understanding look in your eyes? You don't understand anything. By the way, I'm not a lilicon. I just love feet. The only thing I dig about your current body is your feet. Hey, no, no. Seriously, what are you even saying? And why do you look so condescending? Anyway, there's nothing left for us to do now that we're out of DP. Time to go back to sleep for the third time. I got back into my futon and listened to Rokuko's voice fade out. How long is that order gonna last? Day five I'm awake again, but we still don't have enough DP. Oh yeah? It might be a bit late for this, but I'll go ahead and explain how I'm surviving in here. What I'm eating, how I'm using the bathroom all that good stuff. Food-wise, I was eating a set three times a day. By the way, the bread that came in that set wasn't just hard rye bread. The menu was nice enough to allow me to pick between pastries and even bread prepared with other food items such as meat or vegetables. I would pick the bread with as much food as possible and then split it with the goblin. As for the bathroom, well, I was taking care of business in the corner of the room. Don't worry, I had set up a screen partition and got some toilet paper first. There was nothing else I could do, since I was stuck in the master room. If I tried leaving it, I would end up face to face with the bandits. Thankfully, the dungeon core would suck up everything that came out of me, so we didn't have to worry about the smell or anything. Though Rokuko grimaced whenever she sucked up my poop. How would you feel if someone pooped inside of your heart? Huh? Not good, right? Ha ha ha, you're a girl, you shouldn't be saying poop. What's your problem, anyway? The goblin is pooping inside of you, too. Shouldn't a goblin fetishist like you be crying of happiness? Hey, seriously, is that really what you think of me? You know I'm an intelligent life form, right? Yeah. You're still kind of a mystery to me, honestly. Despite all that, I hadn't showered at all since being summoned. Just when I was thinking about how my hair would probably start to stink soon, I looked at the goblin next to me. His face was as gruesome as ever, 
and his massive tusk-like fangs looked like they would really hurt if he bit you with them. His clothes? Nothing but a ragged cloth wrapped around his waist. He's a pretty wild guy. I would have thought that a wild guy like this would start stinking like a dog after a few days of no washing, but he was still completely clean. Did he have some kind of secret I didn't know about? My questions were all answered by Rokuko. Oh, I've been using the survival magic purification on him. It was literally magic. Right, right. This is a fantasy world. Magic, huh? Well, that's that then. Would you mind casting it on me too? Why? You need purification too? Oh, I see. You're playing favorites with the goblin because you have a goblin fetish. No. I just didn't know that dungeon masters needed purification. And anyway, do that yourself, sheesh. Hey, now, why are you acting like I can use magic? Eh? You can't? Apparently, all humans were capable of using magic. Even the bandits had been using it when I wasn't looking. Wait, seriously? Do I just know nothing about nothing? Oh, wait. This is a fantasy world. Obviously, I don't know much of anything. I wonder if I can use purification, too. I'll try asking her how to use it. You just, like, build up your mana and cast purification. That's all. That didn't help at all. What do you mean, build up my mana? What do you mean, just cast purification? Kaima. You can use the menu, can't you? It's basically the same thing as that. Seriously? Purification. Oh wow, that actually worked. A fluffy, lemony sensation washed over my body from head to toe and purified it. Now I can sleep as much as I want, completely clean. By the way, you can cast simple survival spells with just mana and some mental effort, but you'll have to learn stronger spells through scrolls before you can use them. Scrolls? Uh-huh. You could teach yourself the spells by figuring them out from the ground up with logic, but that's not reasonable for most people. Only researchers really do that. So, normally you'll have to use scrolls to learn magic. Well, I've never used a scroll myself, but... Oh, maybe there are some in the DP catalog? I checked the DP catalog and saw that in the treasure section there were plenty of scrolls, like the Fireball Scroll 500 DP or the Earth Barrier Scroll 700 DP. Each spell belonged to an element, and the four main elements were Earth, Water, Wind, and Fire. There were also special elements known as light, darkness, and space-time. Spells were then classified even further beyond that, with each one either being a bottom rank, low rank, mid rank, high rank, special rank, king rank, or god rank spell. For instance, was a low rank fire spell. And in the midst of all that, there was one mid rank earth spell that caught my eye. Create golem scroll 10,000 dp very interesting. I might be able to use this spell to summon a servant that will obey my every command. Well, technically Rokuko is kind of like a servant that will obey my every command, but she's a girl. And she looks super young in her energy-saving form. I want something more like a robot to order around. I definitely want to get this scroll soon, but I don't know if I should get it or the equally expensive heavenly pillow first. It feels like people are coming. I glanced at Rokuko after she murmured that to me. Bandits? I don't think so. They're probably adventurers. I think the bandits just noticed them, too. I guess they're gonna do another surprise attack? All right. They're almost definitely investigating this cave since those last adventurers never came back. I didn't expect them so soon, but they presented a good opportunity. I decided to tell Rokuko about the rest of my plan to eliminate the bandits. She won't try to do anything unnecessary if she knows what's really going on here. Since they came all the way to investigate us, they're stronger than the last adventurers that came here. After all, it'd just be a waste of time if they sent some weaker people that ended up not coming back either. From the bandits' perspective, they couldn't let anyone see this completely changed and survive to tell the tale. So, they'll have to kill all the adventurers. No survivors. And if those adventurers never return, another group will come to investigate. And of course, that group will be even stronger than the last one. I don't know how long it'll take, but at some point, the bandits will lose. 
and there you have it. That's the plan I have for slaughtering every single one of the bandits. Right now, my job is just making sure the bandits don't try to flee their hideout before it gets crushed. I wonder what'll happen if someone from this world eats a melon roll or something. Melon roll? What's that? I don't see anything like that in the DP catalog. What are you talking about? It's right there. Though, I did just find it a second ago. Kill. Holy cow, this tastes amazing. This is so good. Kaima, did you used to eat things this tasty all the time? So, after letting Rokoko try out some melon roll because she looked pretty curious about it, she started stuffing her face with it, eyes shining. Wait, you eat bread? Wait, I mean, you can actually eat stuff? First time I'm seeing that. What? It's not like I can't eat food or anything. But you don't need to, right? I don't, but it's like... A treat. I'm treating myself. Um, do you have any more? I mean, you know that a single one of these costs 5 DP, right? When it comes with a drink, anyway. You can get six of them at once with a pastry set, so that'll be the better deal. It'll be cheaper to buy a drink from a 5 DP barrel, too. Wait a second. Buying in bulk is so cheap I feel like I was getting ripped off before. But I don't remember seeing this in the DP menu before. What's going on? Well, there's a whole world of bread out there, but we need to save DP right now. There's more kinds of bread like this. You don't have to be so stingy. We have like 2,000 DP right now, don't we? I, it'll be okay if we just spend a little. Just a little. Oh man, she looks dead serious about this. You bought a bunch of useless things like that pillow and futon, didn't you? Let me spend some on myself too. Hey, you got to buy a goblin, didn't you? What? G. Gobsook has nothing to do with this. And he was just 20 DP. You're using almost that much every day just to eat, aren't you? Gobsook? You named him? I never heard about that. Whoa now. Don't forget, I'm splitting half of my food with the goblin. If you include that, he's already cost us way more than just 20 DP. And he's not helping us out at all right now, so he's basically your pet. Th, that's not true. Gobsook has a lot of potential. He'll be a big help to us. Right, Gobsook? Gobsook tilted his head in surprise, as if wondering why we had suddenly brought him into this. For some reason, despite how hideous his goblin face was with its squashed nose and giant teeth, he looked a lot like a dog. I wonder if he'll eat dog food? Well, anyway. I actually don't mind if you spend a little on yourself as long as you don't go too far. It won't cost us any extra DP if we buy our food and drink in bulk, so that's a bonus. We'll actually save a ton of DP buying in bulk, but I'll keep quiet about that. Yay. Then hurry up and buy me a pastry set. Why don't you do that yourself? You can use the DP catalog too, right? Eh? But I've never seen a pastry set or a melon rolls or anything like those in it. Oh wait, I have more options now. Wow, I didn't know I could buy stuff like this here. Oh, there really are a lot of different kinds of bread. Rye bread, wheat bread, melon roll. So many options. Huh. Wait a second. Hey, tell me what you're seeing in the catalog again. Eh? Like I said, rye bread, wheat bread, and melon roll. Just those three? Um? Aha, uh -huh, just those three. Why? I went ahead and bought a pastry set, with my individual choices being cream roll, jelly roll, steamed roll, red bean paste roll, apple pie, and a fried roll. Do you know what these are? Kinds of bread, right? Wow, I've never seen bread that looks like this before. And why does all the bread you summon always end up covered in this weird, transparent stuff? Can I eat that too? Nope, you can't. That's plastic. You rip it apart to get to the food inside. By the way, this is called a jelly roll. Try eating it. Hmm, a jelly roll. Let's see. Nom, hmm. So tasty. Jelly rolls taste amazing too. Wow, there's some yellow stuff inside of it. Oh, so sweet. What is this stuff? It's delicious. I handed over the cream roll, having more or less figured out what's going on. Rokuko. 
Check out the pastry set again and see if you have more options this time. Eh? Okay. I do have more options. I can pick a jelly roll now. Wow, this is all new to me. All right. The next time you want a jelly roll, buy it yourself. Get it in a set with some melon rolls if you want. Really? Ahaha, okay. Th then I'll get three of each. Oh sure, I'd love to have one of your jelly rolls. Thanks. Aya? Right after Rokuko summoned her pastry set, I stole one of her jelly rolls. Yep. This is a cream roll. Any way I look at it, this is a cream roll. Plus, it's completely bare without any plastic surrounding it. Sorry, Rokuko. What I gave you was actually a cream roll. This is a real jelly roll. Eh, really? Wow. So this is an actual jelly roll. Whoa, this one has red stuff inside of it. And it's super sweet. It looks like the DP catalog prioritizes displaying only items that the user of the menu is familiar with. It's very possible that it just fundamentally won't show items that the user doesn't know about. Since Rokuko's pastries weren't wrapped in plastic, just knowing the name of something must not be enough for it to be put on the catalog. Does the dungeon need to have absorbed it before? Wait, no, that doesn't make sense. She's absorbed plastic plenty of times. I guess it does have to do with being familiar with the item. Either way, it's very likely that none of this applies to things from this world. I've never seen an actual dragon before, but it's on my menu. Though I do know that dragons are the classic dungeon master monster of choice. I want to dig into this a little more, but this is getting pretty tedious. I don't want to waste DP either. Rokuko was looking at me impatiently as I contemplated the inner workings of the DP catalog to myself. I can eat them now, right? Right. Yeah, go ahead. By the way, those are all the pastries you'll be getting for four days, so don't go through them too fast. And be sure to split them with gobsuk. What? Rokuko froze with half of a cream roll in her mouth. Don't worry, I'll split my food with gobsuk even if you eat all of those pastries yourself. Not that I'm gonna tell you that, though. Day eleven two days after he had lost five lackeys, the boss came back from town with some replacements. Nineteen replacements, even. There were eight bandits at the start, then the seven newbies, five of which died, so that left ten. Now it's twenty-nine, three times that. Nice. I wondered where he had gotten them. But then I saw two tied-up adventurers in their midst. Whoops. Minus those two, it's actually twenty-seven. Isn't that still enough to form a small village or something? Oh wow. Those are all slaves, except the sacrifices. You can tell just by looking at them, ah? I see the collars now. Well, whatever. Two sacrifices. But wait. Bandits can buy slaves in this world? Apparently, humans who break the law can end up slaves. They're called convict slaves. But they'll go right back to breaking the law if bandits buy them. What's even the point? All right, I'll make a room just for them. I've been wanting to make a jail and see what its deal is for a while now. A jail was an especially expensive, 300 DP room. I was hoping that it'd have some kind of special effect or something. After adding the extra room, the dungeon looked like from above a square with its top right section cut off. Either way, I noticed two of the slaves that stood out from the rest. One was an adult woman and one a young girl. They weren't very dirty, likely thanks to this world's survival magic. Yeah, those rags are so torn up they're basically naked. That's hot. But wait a second. The slave the boss is carrying definitely isn't even ten years old yet. Why'd he buy a kid with dead-looking eyes like that? Is he gonna raise her as his daughter or something? And hold up, she's got dog ears too. Another fantasy staple has come, a dark-skinned dog girl. She even has black eyes and hair. That's the first time I've seen either of those in this world. Actually, I just noticed that the older woman has wings growing out of her arms. Is she a bird person? Is that what I should call them? Bird people? Nah, they're probably called harpies or something. This world sure has a lot of colorful races. Wait, wait. Hold on. Hold on. There. Sex. Slaves. 
We're gonna turn into an adult-only story this late in the game? Well, sure, I guess this does make sense. There've only been dudes out there up until now, so. The bandit boss had likely bought those sex slaves to satisfy the lust of his subordinates. And naturally, so he could have some fun himself, too. The bandit boss grabbed on to the older woman and groped her body with hands so dirty I questioned whether he had ever used purification on them. He then noisily slobbered on her mouth in a makeshift kiss before pushing her onto the bed end. What amazing. That's how humans reproduce, right? I've never seen it before. Ah? Uh, are you after my body too, Kaima? I'm not a lilikon. And hey, stop watching them. Kids shouldn't be looking at that kind of thing. Be but you like my feet, don't you? And look, that tiny slave is watching too. Yeah, they're making her walk on her bare feet. That has to hurt. What a waste of nice, shapely feet. Delicious brown skin like hers should be treasured. God, I want to at least give her some socks to wear. Preferably knee socks. White knee socks or dark knee socks. No, wait. I'd bet socks shaped like puppies would really go well with her dog ears. I feel like you changed the subject there. Don't worry about it. Anyway, time for sleep. Day 18 one week had passed since the bandits bought those slaves. In a certain sense, the dungeon has been peaceful. No adventurers have come by and no bandits have died. They went out looting twice and came back with corpses the second time. For corpses, 600 dp. It must have been too hard to capture them alive. Honestly, though, is two raiding trips a week really enough to sustain 27 people? Unsurprisingly, the bandits were fucking the harpy every single day, treating her like a sex toy. Yeah. That was the only thing I wasn't too happy about. I knew that was the fate all sex slaves faced, but as a Japanese person, it wasn't so easy for me to get used to. I'm really surprised they haven't gotten tired of doing that yet. It's starting to be a real eyesore. I was starting to like them a little, but I guess I just didn't know them very well. Rokuko's not happy about a woman being brutalized like that, huh? She's got more humanity than I thought. It's like, they're covering my dungeon with dirty juices and stuff. It really ticks me off, somehow. Oh, that's what you're upset about. Shouldn't you be getting mad about me using the master room as a bathroom, then? Oh, you and Gobsuk are fine, don't worry about it. You two can't help needing to go to the bathroom. And you're both monsters I summoned myself, so. You're still calling me a monster. Well, I guess you did summon me. It's kind of like you two are just a part of me. I don't like absorbing that stuff, but... Like I said, you two can't help it. All right, makes sense to me. But... Shouldn't you, like, actually love absorbing goblin poop? Kaima? You're misunderstanding something about me. Definitely. By the way, the boss was using the young dog-eared slave as a Dakimakura a body pillow generally with an anime girl on its cover at night since she had the soft, smooth skin of a child. Aside from that, though, she was just a general maid. She took care of the bandit's trash and whatnot. They would occasionally punch or kick her for no reason, but she didn't respond. She didn't even groan. She just stared ahead with her dead eyes. The silver lining was that they didn't lock her up in the jail. She hung out beneath the boss's bed when she wasn't doing anything else. Humans are really neat. Is that how your species always raises children? No way. That's just child abuse, plain and simple. I don't know how things work in this world but I'm absolutely confident that they're just being cruel. I turned off the monitor so I didn't have to watch the harpy being raped and then went to sleep. Day 19, oh well. There's a ton of people coming. I opened up the map after hearing Rokuko whisper that. By pulling the map back to look around the general area, I could see information about the outside of the dungeon. It was limited to a range about as far as I could see by just looking out the entrance with my naked eyes but inside that range, there were plenty of details. There I saw that there was already a platoon of red enemy dots, advancing towards our dungeon with a trained pace. It seemed that my peaceful days were finally over. Or perhaps, peace was finally coming for the first time. Thirty people, huh? I guess they're finally here. 
Not sure if this is too early or what. They're finally here? You knew these people would be coming? Yep. This is probably the squad sent to exterminate the bandits. Yeah, the bandits are finished now. The bandits noticed the knights too right after I finished saying that. I opened up the monitor and started watching them. It really was convenient that I could look into the dungeon from any angle, as if every room had multiple security cameras placed within them. One of the boss's scouts had just gotten back to the dungeon. Boss, we're in trouble. Knights are coming. What the? How'd they find us? We killed everyone who saw us here. The boss of the bandits was panicking. He didn't seem to realize that it was precisely because they had killed everyone who found them that knights had eventually been dispatched to eliminate them. But hold on a second. Knights are humans. They ain't invincible. We can kill them too. How many of them are there? As sorry, I ran back here as soon as I saw their armor. There was at least, you, at least five of them. All right. Guess it doesn't matter how many of them there are. We're still gonna ambush them here in this dungeon. We are? Yeah. We can knock their numbers down with a surprise attack, and either way, we'd be dead if they surrounded us outside. Oh. Nice plan, boss. All right. It looked like the bandits were ready to fight, and they were planning to do so in the dungeon. Very convenient. I'm so glad I've been teaching the boss how to use the hallways and doors to ambush people in the dungeon. I'm so glad he's not smart enough to realize running away is the best option here. So, do you think the bandits can win? Well, it'll depend on how strong those knights are. But if they're at least as strong as those three adventurers from before, the bandits are definitely screwed. They'll all die. It wouldn't be long before I could see the knights directly on the monitor. I decided to watch the bandits get eliminated from start to finish. All this was happening because of me, after all. The bandits spread out, with eight of them staying in the entrance room, eight hiding in the room halfway to the core room, and nine including the boss camping out in the core room itself. Although there was strength in numbers, they wouldn't be able to ambush the knights if they all stayed in one room, though that would be physically impossible anyway. The knights reached the entrance to the cave right after the bandits finished hiding. This. Let's go get em. I felt my shirt being pulled and turned to see Rokuko looking at me with a puzzled expression. Are you sure I shouldn't be absorbing the corpses? We're kinda losing a lot of DP like this. Don't even think about doing that. We won't be able to trick them if you start absorbing those corpses. Trick them? If they learn that dungeons eat people, or at least, if they learn that a beginner dungeon like ours is powering up by eating corpses, they might view us as dangerous and try to destroy the core. I do have a backup plan, but... We'll die if the core gets destroyed. Wait. A backup plan? You didn't mention that before. Remember that goblin room I made a while ago? Oh, right. The one that's kind of far away from us. You were calling it a dummy ordinary cave, right? Yeah. The maps here aren't so accurate, so there being another cave nearby shouldn't arouse any suspicion. Maybe. Hopefully. We'll be able to trick them into thinking that the other cave is the actual, ordinary cave, and then they'll leave us alone. Oh, okay. I get it. Wait, um. What about the dungeon core? In truth, I wanted to place the dummy core in the other cave and use the castling function, but that wasn't gonna happen. Oh, by the way, the castling function allowed one to swap the real dungeon core with the dummy core. It was a great tool but it took 5,000 DP to use. We didn't have enough saved up to use it. Not to mention, it was necessary to connect the dummy core with the real core with a path, which meant it couldn't even be set up if intruders were in the way. Well, we used hallways and doors to separate the rooms on this floor, so worst case scenario, we can turn the core room into an impregnable trap fortress. It was possible to set traps on a floor with intruders by separating rooms with doors and hallways. Though, of course, you couldn't set traps in rooms with invaders in them. Um, but there's a bunch of bandits camping out in the core room. Of course, the bandits count as intruders. Yeah. In other words, all we can do right now is act like an innocent dungeon and hope they leave us alone. I get it. So that's why you don't want me to absorb the corpses. 
But how are you going to make sure they leave us alone? Oh, let's just see what happens for now. I don't want to tell her that there's actually nothing we can do right now. I shifted my focus back to the knights. This must be their treasure room. The bed. I recognize the smell. They must have a woman with them. But this smell is so intense, I imagine they aren't using purification to clean up much. Or perhaps the smell is so intense it won't come out no matter how many times they cast it. The knights had started to investigate the boss's bedroom. By the way, the dog-eared girl was still underneath the bed. She stared ahead with her dead eyes, not moving an inch. Eventually, the knights advanced to the next room without finding her. That wouldn't have happened if they had used life search, but they didn't for some reason. Maybe it only had a limited number of uses. We had taken anything that looked even a little good into the master room before the knights got there. That said, it's not like there was anything good before we went through the stuff. Most of it was just moldy bread. The only really useful thing was, er, a light enchanted magic item? It worked kind of like a lantern. The only things left for the knights were food and the shoddiest of the bandits' treasure. One of them placed his hand on a door and made to open it, but at that moment, a sword had sprouted from the door. Gah! A bandit had stabbed at the knight through the door itself in a surprise attack. He then kicked down the door and started swinging. And before I knew it, the battle was over. But eventually they reached the core room. Though the knights themselves wouldn't realize it was the core room until they opened the door. I shifted my gaze to the bandits. One of them had been crouching by the door with his ear against it. I caught him right as he stood up to go report to the boss. Looks like they're here. All right. Archers, get ready. And be quiet. Shoot them down right after they open the door. Boss, are we gonna be all right? Hmph. They should be pretty worn down by now. All we'll have to do is finish them off with a final push. I wondered how they would react if I told them that the knights had healed themselves and weren't worn down in the least. That'd have to remain a mystery, though. I didn't want them to try and destroy the core as a final act of revenge. The wooden door to the core room creaked open. The boss signaled for the archers to shoot the moment the door opened wide enough. Clang! Clang! The arrows noisily bounced off all the knight's armor. Except for one. By pure luck, good luck for the bandits, bad luck for the knights, one arrow slipped through the eye slit on one of the knight's helmets and pierced his brain. I saw our DP shoot up before my eyes. They had killed him in one shot. Louis! Bloody hell, he's dead! We only got one of them. Boss! Come on, boys! Aim for the joints! Our swords will just bounce off their armor. You'll pay for this, bastards! Humph, making a slave like that attack for you won't change a thing. The harpy slave tried to obey the boss's order but her legs were too weak for her to move very well. She was cut down in seconds. Our DP went up. Wait a second. Aren't you Melon Puke Waver? Don't call me by that name. The boss of the bandits charged forward in a rage. The force of his first blow knocked the armored knight to his knees, and the boss wasted no time to drive his sword into a gap in the knight's armor. He then twisted his sword around as hard as he could inside of the knight's body. Our DP went up again. And what kind of nickname is Melon Puke anyway? What? This is the shameless fellow who puked up a melon while dining with the princess. You'll pay for killing Louis and Eugene, vomit face. I only threw up because the melon had gone bad. It wasn't my fault. Why'd she have to fucking put a bounty over my head? Not only did you eat too much and throw up as a result, but you unjustly blamed the chef for serving rotten food and killed him. Right in front of the princess, too. Shut up. He was just jealous because the princess had fallen in love with me. I'd be the emperor right now if it weren't for him. Fucking damn it. Oh, thanks for explaining why he's called Melon Puke. I'm more or less guessed from the name, but still. That was a wild story. After that, Melon Puke got so mad he fought far better than I had ever expected. He killed one more knight and wounded several others. But that was as far as he got. 
His allies that had been assisting him from the side were gradually cut down, and soon enough he was surrounded. In the blink of an eye, a sword was thrust clean through his stomach. Fyuk. And things. Were just getting started. For me. Melanpu collapsed onto his knees and then fell to the ground. One of the knights grabbed onto his hair and pulled his head up. All right, Melanpuke. Do you have any more allies anywhere? Nope, you already killed everyone, fuck. Why'd this happen? I did everything. They said. His voice had gotten pretty raspy, but the knights still heard him loud and clear. And so, the final bandit turned into DP just like all the others. Was there someone pulling the strings here? They might have gotten away. He said this was everyone, but we can't be sure. Oh, it looks like this room has the dungeon core. Yeah? Huh. So that's a dungeon core. I've never seen one before. This was a pretty shallow dungeon, just like we heard. Only had one floor. One of the knights pointed his sword at the dungeon core sprouting out of the wall. Aureite. Time to destroy the core. Destroy the core. Hey, uh, what did you just say? You're gonna do what now? My mouth dried up. I felt a cold shiver run down my spine. I watched through the monitor as the knight lifted up his sword. And then brought it down. Gob. Gobsuk? Gobsuk jumped out of the master room. Neither I nor Rokuko could stop him. It might have been his natural instincts as a dungeon monster to do everything in his power to stop the core from being destroyed. Take this. We watched as Gobsuk popped into the core room and was immediately cut down. He was cut clean in half and died just like that. Friggin' goblin, getting in my way. Let's try that again. Hey! What do you think you're doing, new guy? This dungeon is under our protection. The captain stopped the knight after he rose his sword into the air again. This is a low-tier dungeon that the Adventurer's Guild manages. It only ever produces goblins and is as simple of a dungeon as can be. Oh, that's right. My apologies, captain. The knight lowered his sword after being stopped by the captain. Crap. I was so close to destroying a dungeon core and becoming a holy paladin. I understand how you feel, but our job here is done. And if you could become a holy paladin through destroying the core of a dungeon that doesn't even have a dungeon boss, the capital would be overflowing with holy paladins right now. Well, that's true. Wouldn't it just be embarrassing to be knighted as a holy paladin for destroying a weak dungeon like this? Thinking about it, Melonpuke was more or less the dungeon boss. Do you want them to say a holy paladin, who conquered the ordinary cave and defeated Melonpuke, or something like that? You'll get destroyed, man. People would call you the Melonpuke Paladin or the Holy Paladin of the Ordinary Cave, something like that. Ah, uh, I wouldn't want that. Rokuko was crouched down on the floor, crying. Goblin or not, we had spent the past few weeks together with Gobsuk. We had tons of memories together. Okay, not really. The only thing we did together was eat meals every now and again. I wonder if Rokuko ever did anything with him while I was asleep. At least give back the jelly rolls I lent you before Dai. I guess not. We were united only by food. Gobsuk. We really owe him a lot now. If not for him, the core probably would have been destroyed and we'd be dead right now. I'd opened the menu and bought a set of six jelly rolls for Rokuko. Here, have some jelly rolls. Cheer up. Eh? Really? I'll cheer up. I'll cheer so up. So, so, so up. Rokuko cheered up so much that I thought light would start shining out of her eyes. Oh, right. This girl's a monster that sent countless goblins to their deaths to try and protect herself from adventurers. The bandit corpses were piled up in the entrance room. It looked like the knights would be taking their deceased allies back home with them. It was honestly pretty disgusting, but I couldn't look away. I needed to stay focused and look for an opportunity to score some extra DP. They're pouring oil on them. I guess the plan is to burn the bodies. In the middle of the cave, though. Air flows through dungeons no matter how deep they get, so I guess they may just not be aware that suffocating due to lack of oxygen is a thing outside of water. That was convenient for me. Once the fires rose up, 
I'd be able to absorb the bodies without any problems. Hey, should we do anything about that dogged slave? By the time Rokoko remembered that, flames had already burned down the door to the boss's room and were fast approaching the bed under which the dog-eared girl was hidden. Her dead eyes reflected that she had completely given up. The deceased harpy slave had the same eyes before she died. Huh. I didn't do anything to protect her from the bandits, but I get the feeling she'll appear in my dreams if I don't save her here. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. She can just turn into DP for us. No, wait. We're gonna save her. Can we get her in here somehow? Um, no. Do you want to go outside and try to get her yourself? Everything's on fire out there. She'll be dead before you get there. Rokuko was right. Since there was an intruder on the floor, we could only enter and exit the master room through the dungeon core. And outside of the dungeon core was a sea of fire. Physically saving her would be beyond impossible. Plus, we can't withdraw intruders or anything like that. She's not an item. After hearing Rokuko say that, an idea struck me like lightning. No. What are you talking about, Rokuko? She is an item. Eh? I started to talk as if trying to convince both myself and Rokuko of that. Slaves are tools. They belong to people. In other words, they're items. Honestly, I've never seen her do anything on her own. She only ever obeyed orders. And now her owner, the boss of the bandits, is dead. The owner of that slave. That item is gone. When the owner of an item dies in a dungeon, their items become the dungeon's items. Which means that girl is now an item belonging to us. Right, Rokuko? But she's a living being with mana. Items aren't like that. Remember how we withdrew that moldy bread earlier? Well, mold is a living being. We could withdraw a treasure chest even if a mouse was inside of it, right? There's no reason why we couldn't withdraw a living being like a human. We can't because she has mana? That doesn't make sense. Magical items have mana. We withdrew that light enchanted magic item, remember? Same deal. We can do this too. We can withdraw her. I glanced between the monitor and the map. The fire had reached the bed and started burning the sheets black. The map still displayed the dog-eared girl as a red dot, signifying her as an invader. Crap, that still wasn't enough. I didn't convince Rokuko hard enough. Be but I'm telling you, slaves aren't items. Then she's not even a slave. She's a Dakimakura. It's a Dakimakura. A pillow in the shape of a super young dog-eared girl. Just look, it can fit under the bed so we guys can hide it when the parents come home. The only option left for me was to use conditioning on myself. In other words, hypnosis. And hypnosis is basically the same thing as sleeping. This is my time to shine. That's a Dakimakura, that's a Dakimakura, that's a Dakimakura, that's a Dakimakura. I imagined it. That girl was a Dakimakura. A Dakimakura that'd feel amazing to squeeze in bed. It had ears to tease and play with. It was shaped like a human so one could dress it up with clothes and ease socks before playing with it. Wow. This is going pretty well. Yeah. I can't let a Dakimakura that amazing get burned up. It'd be a total waste. Ah. Uh, I want to sleep with that Dakimakura. I could spend hours putting different kinds of knee socks on it. It looks pretty nice and warm, too. I could use it as a makeshift heater when the weather gets colder. Speaking of heaters, the boss of the bandits used Rokuko's core as a heater for his feet. Oh, I'm getting off subject a little. You know, I wonder if that Dakimakura is more expensive than a heavenly pillow. A dark-skinned, dog-eared, little girl pillow must be expensive. That's a high-grade item. To some people, that would be the most heavenly pillow in the world. A thorough cleaning will make it clean as new. Yep, yep. Purification sure is useful. I wonder how well it'll clean a Dakimakura. Either way, at least I don't have to worry about taking the cover off and drying it outside where a neighbor might see it. By that point, the dogged girl had turned entirely into a Dakimakura in my mind. I glanced at the map and saw that instead of a red invader dot, there was a green dot indicating an item. All right, it's a Dakimakura. 
Withdraw. To sum it up, I did it. Yeah. H. How did you withdraw her? Invaders can't come into the master room. Huh. All I did was withdraw Dakimakura. Oh yeah, and be sure to absorb the bandit corpses before they all burn up. But leave half of them behind, just in case the knights come in to check up on them. Ah, its hair is a little burnt. What a waste of pretty black hair. Well, hair can grow back, so no big deal. I'll just cut off the burnt parts. A short haircut would look good on it. I rubbed the soot off its squishy cheeks. Oh man, this thing feels really nice. I tried casting purification on the Dakimakura. The purification magic formed a bubble-like shape like always and lowered itself through the Dakimakura from head to toe, thoroughly cleaning off all the filth that H. Ah? Uh? The Dakimakura let out a cute squeal. Why it reminded me. This is actually the doggered slave girl. Not a pillow. Phew. A bit longer like that and I might never have snapped out of my own hypnosis. Hey, all right, I'm back to my senses now. See? I told you we could withdraw her. Oh, you're back to normal? Then explain how you did that. Sure. It's pretty simple. I could do it because it was possible. You thinking you couldn't do it was just an assumption on your part. Magic is more free and less restrictive than you think. Though doing all that was pretty tiring. You saw it, right? I withdrew a slave. Cause their items. Wow. I had no idea you could withdraw slaves, but I guess you can. Yeah, it should be smart to make Rokuko think that. I don't want to have to hypnotize myself again the next time we need to withdraw a slave. But anyway. What should we do with this doggered girl? Should I actually start using her as a Dakimakura? By the way, what's this girl's name? It's kind of hard to talk about her without knowing her name. That's a good point. Air, do you have a name? Or at least, something that people call you? Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, people called. Me and the others, Nika. Master. All right. You're Niku, then. Her response was pretty slow, but she did answer me. Either way, the first thing to do was let her rest. I bought her a futon and some food with DP to start things off. She didn't move at first, but she ate the food and got into the futon after I ordered her to. I decided to think more about what to do with Nika after the knights left. As long as they were still around, we weren't safe. Day 20 the knights didn't really do much after that. They quietly made camp, checked that the corpses had all burned by noon, and then left. Yeah. I think it's pretty impressive that they managed to cook meat and eat it while corpses were burning like 30 feet away from them. Like honestly. Wow. We got a lot of DP thanks to all the dead bandits and how the band of 30-some knights stayed within the dungeon radius for almost an entire day. We didn't even have any problems absorbing the thoroughly burnt corpses. Suffice to say, we made bank. Adding it all up to what we had before. Our DP stock had shot up to 14,504 in one fell swoop. Wow. I've never seen this much DP before in my life. Compared to how little DP we were earning before, we had basically gotten rich overnight. But since the bandits were gone, our daily DP gain was less than before. We didn't have to worry about Gobsuk anymore. But in his place, we had the dogged slave. We had to feed her too. Three meals a day with food and drink. We'll be losing about 10 DP every day. But our natural DP gain was only 10 a day. Maybe due to how we had withdrawn her as an item, the slave girl wasn't earning us any DP. Though it was also possible that she just wasn't strong enough to be worth any DP in the first place. Thanks to that, our DP earnings a day totaled to a spectacular zero. Wait, no? We were technically in the negative since we would need to summon goblins whenever adventurers came just to avoid suspicion. Could I sleep well in a situation like that? No, I couldn't. I was a cautious, cautious man. I couldn't bear to sit and watch as my savings slowly dwindled. So, unable to bear the weight of losing DP, I decided to fundamentally change this ordinary cave. Ha! Huh. I don't want to work. Day 21 all right. Now that things have settled down and there aren't any bandits, let's think about what to do next. 
The main thing on my mind is that create golem spell I saw earlier. Magic that can make golems. Yep, that sounds perfect. Things will be easier for me if I can make golems do all the work for me. Yeah? But all that magic can do is make golems. You should just use that DP to summon golems as monsters instead. They cost 100 DP each, and they're strong enough. So basically, this spell will pay for itself after I use it to create 100 golems. Every golem after the 100th is basically free. Wow, what? That's amazing. But to be honest, there's way too many unknown factors to actually know that for sure. How strong will the golems I make be? Can I really summon them for free? Will I even be able to summon 100 of them? The spell may not end up paying for itself. It's impossible to tell right now. To tell the truth, I halfway want it just because I want to try making some golems. I mean, it sounds really fun, right? Let's not tell her about all this. Alrighty then. I'll have one create golem scroll, please. And... Sweet, there it is. I used 10,000 DP to buy a create golem scroll and soon enough a string-tied scroll made of animal skin appeared. I tried not to think about how we had just lost two-thirds of our DP in a single purchase. Let's try to use this thing. I undid the string and unrolled the scroll. It had create golem written along the top of it with a magic circle in the middle. How do you use scrolls like this? Just pour your mana into the magic circle. I followed Rokoko's advice and tried pouring my mana into the magic circle. It felt a lot like using the survival magic spell purification, somehow. All I had to do was put my hand on the magic circle and clench it into a fist before I started feeling mana flowing out of my body. It was just a little tiring. My mana flowed into the magic circle and started running along its lines. Huh. So this is what it's like to let mana flow into something. How long should I do this anyway? I guess I should just keep pumping out mana until it works. My mana flowed progressively faster into the magic circle. Once it reached its limit or something, the magic circle suddenly stopped resisting the flow of my mana, causing it all to burst and rain back onto me. It felt as if the composition of the magic circle was being ingrained within me as my body was showered with mana. Actually, it probably was being ingrained within me. Once it finished, I bet I could use Create Golem. As for the scroll, the magic circle on it was scorched black, and after all my mana left it, the whole scroll caught fire and turned to ash. I decided to go ahead and try out Create Golem immediately. Two things were necessary to use it, mana, and material to make the golem's body with. Somehow, I just knew that. Knowing instinctively how to use a spell must be one side effect of using a scroll. It seemed that using the ground itself to make clay golems was the most simple thing to do. The golem could have its shape changed by mana. I stood up to leave the master room and go dig out some clay, but before I left, I noticed Meat sitting in the corner of the room with her arms around her legs. She had woken up at some point without me noticing. That was where Gobsuk always used to sit. Mmm, nostalgic. I don't have to go outside myself. If I have a tool available to me, I'd better use it. Hey, Meat Dot, go outside and mine some clay for me. Not a lot, just about this much. Oh, okay. Understood, master. I ordered me to go outside and bring back about a soccer ball's worth of clay. Man, she really does look dead inside. I've never seen an expression that blank in my life. After a while, Meat came back with the shovel and clay. The way she was holding up the clump of clay with her tiny body made it look really heavy. Actually, I bet it actually was heavy for a child like her. It's kinda late to say this but Meat can go in and out of the master room on her own without any issues. Maybe because Rokuko thinks it's normal for that to be possible, or something? Sweet, good job. You can rest now. I patted her head and praised her. While I was at it, I cast purification on her since her hands had gotten dirty with clay. She let out a cute, Hi, Afu, you, cry for some reason. Does it tickle when I cast purification or something? I should have Rokoko cast it on her later as an experiment. Depending on Nika's reaction, I might just learn something. All right, no point waiting around. Create Golem! 
I sent my mana flowing into the clump of clay. The mana formed circuits within it and morphed the clay into the shape of a person. Perhaps thanks to the scroll, the image of a perfect golem arose in my mind. Well, it's actually a lot smaller than I expected, but that's fine. Probably. Everything will be okay. Obeying the instructions that were filling my mind, I kneaded the clay with my hands while pouring more mana into it. It didn't take long until the clay turned into a, somewhat small, human-shaped golem. I had based its design on the things I had played with at school before being summoned. In other words, it looked like a 30 centimeters tall robot. Instead of a servomotor moving its joints though, there was magic. Its body was made of clay instead of plastic and aluminum. Its movements were controlled by an embedded magic circle instead of a CPU. It had a magic stone powering it instead of a battery. Wait, we didn't have any magic stones. Oh well. We can just power it externally. The magic power floating around inside the dungeon's air should be good enough. After spending about ten more minutes sending mana into it, the thirty centimeters tall mini clay golem was complete. Wow! What's that? A golem. What's with all the question marks? Well, golems are usually way bigger than an adult human. I'm pretty sure we would need to make a lot more than a hundred of these for the scroll to pay for itself. I mean, I don't know what's normal or not, so... Either way, we'll just have to make ten thousand of them then. I decided to just order the golem around and see what happened. First, I made it start working on expanding the cave. That would help us save more DP. After bringing up the map and ordering the golem to go to the goblin room and start mining inwards through the mountain, the freshly made mini clay golem left the master room without even grabbing the shovel. Golems sure are dumb, aren't they? That shovel would make his job so much easier. Nope. You don't know what you're talking about, Rokuko. I'm basically stunned here, shocked by the vast potential golems have. Rokuko must have been thinking something like, Golems can't do anything complicated. But that was way too narrow of a mindset. If you think about it, dig into the mountain is a pretty complicated order on its own. To make a robot in modern Japan do something like that, you need to first teach it how to mine a wall in the first place from the ground up. Not only that, but telling them, go here, wouldn't work. You'd have to tell them exactly how many steps to take, and even how to move their legs. They wouldn't stand up on their own if they fell over, and if they hit a wall on the way there, they'd keep walking into the wall forever. But with magic, all I had to do was say, go here and mine into the wall. Golems were amazing. I'm seriously moved right now. But using magic was pretty tiring. I think I'll just go to sleep now. Oh, right. I'll try using meat as a Dakimakura. That's why I saved her, anyway. Kind of. Come here, little girl. Air. Don't worry, I won't do anything perverted to you. Yep. I won't make you wear any socks or anything yet. That can come after we know each other better. Day 21 Let's just make one thing clear. Humans. Are not. Good. Dakimakuras. I tried using meat as one, but... Oh, don't worry. I didn't take her clothes off or anything. I seriously just used her as a Dakimakura. Anyway, it was nice at first. Her skin was nice and smooth, plus her hair smelled nice. But it didn't take long for a problem to arise. Her body heated up fast. She got so, so hot. Yeah, I'm not gonna be able to handle this outside of winter. I finally understand why people huddle together to stay warm in survival movies and stuff. Though I have heard that kids have especially high body temperatures. And I've also heard that dogs are hotter than humans. In which case, it makes complete sense that a doggered little girl would be extremely hot. Plus, it wasn't until I noticed how heavily she was breathing that I realized she was running out of air beneath the covers. That was pretty dumb of me. Obviously, she would struggle to breathe without access to fresh air. I hurriedly pulled her head out of the covers. Which ended up with us lying in bed together, face to face. Her cheeks had flushed from the heat and her mouth was hanging weakly open, which made her lips look really sexy f. Wait. No. I'm not a lilicon. Seriously, I'm not a lilicon. 
her breath was tickling me, so I made her turn and face the other way. I didn't do that because she was making my heart beat too fast to sleep. Her breath was ticklish. That was all. With that I was finally comfortable enough to sleep. But then another problem arose. A pretty big problem, too. You see, Meat couldn't move while I was using her as a Dakamakura. She'd have to push me off her if she wanted to get up, but as a slave, she couldn't do that. Can you imagine what happened because of that? She. Peed. Herself. Okay, okay. I knew it was my fault. I felt something wet when I woke up and then panicked like crazy after seeing Meat crying in my arms. I stood us up and cast purification on me, her, and the futon while patting her head and telling her that everything would be okay. Yeah, it was my fault. I'm sorry. Next time you need to go to the bathroom, just push me aside and go. To show how sorry I am, you can eat as much food as you want today. Ask for anything, it's yours. Okay? Here, have a hamburger. They taste super good. So stop crying. I'm sorry, it was my fault. Meat finally calmed down after she finished eating the hamburger. Um, okay. I would like to begin our first meeting on what to do with Kaima, the pervert who loves to make his slave girl pee on him. Hey, hold up. That's a pretty biased way of framing things, Madam Judge. It was an accident, Your Honor, I swear. I used my position as dungeon master to make Rokuko shut up about how I had accidentally made Meat pee herself. She immediately fell silent, so I decided to start making more golems. The mini clay golem I made yesterday had been working all night. Yeah, I should check out how he's doing first. Let's see here. I brought up the dungeon monitor from the menu and checked up on the golem I had ordered to dig into the mountain. The mini clay golem was steadily scratching away at the wall. His spirit was admirable, but he hadn't made any progress at all. The bare rock wall was just too strong for his clay hands to wear down. That was my mistake. I should have given him a pickaxe or something. Mmm, -hmm, see? He'll just keep on doing what you told him to, no matter what. How long can he stay active? I think it has something to do with the magic stone inside of it. Eh? Well, obviously, he'll stay active until he runs out of mana. I mean, he's a golem. But dungeons are filled with mana, so he basically should never stop as long as he's inside of one. Wow, that's crazy. He basically doesn't need any energy to keep moving. I was losing my mind over how far golems had surpassed my expectations. It was looking like I would be able to just leave everything to the golems and sleep as much as I wanted. Seriously, what? That's not a golem, no way. Like, golems just don't look like that. It's a clock. Yup. It was a golem clock. I had given each of the golem arms different instructions. I told the first arm to rotate completely every 60 seconds, the second arm every 60 minutes, and the last one every 12 hours. In other words, the individual arms became the seconds, minutes, and hours hands of a clock. Together they formed a clock that would keep working as long as it had mana. Making sure it stayed accurate would be pretty annoying, though. By the way, I had realized halfway through that I didn't need to make the golem arms look like actual arms, which is why they ended up being needle-shaped, like the arms of a real clock would be. Everything was made from clay, but I doubted anyone would realize the clock was actually a golem. Why you really made a golem shaped like that? Wakaima. You don't have any common sense, do you? Seriously? You're the one who summoned me from another world. How would I know what's common sense here? So, what are you going to do with that anyway? You can just look at the menu if you want to know what time it is, so. The time of day and such was displayed on the dungeon master menu that I could use. I'll give it to meat. I only made this an experiment, so yeah. Now I know more about what I can do with golems. This wasn't a waste of time at all. And so... I gave Meat the watch as a present. At which point I realized that Meat was still wearing torn up rags as clothes. Holy crap. I immediately bought some cheap clothes dress, 8 dp, cheap shoes child sized, 10 dp, and knee socks white, 70 dp. 
while watching me change clothes i realized that she was missing something and quickly bought a set of female child's underwear 20 dp that was close all that cost a fair amount of dp but she could keep wearing all that pretty much forever thanks to purification it even worked on her underwear no problem thankfully the clothes looked nice enough but i wanted to dress her up in a much cuter outfit once we could spare the dp same for rokuko her dp saving form is pretty cute itself but her other form was pretty much my exact type she looked super cute and her feet were the definition of pretty they were truly spectacular seriously i couldn't stop fantasizing about making her wear all sorts of socks I attached a leather string 2 DP to the golem clock and hung it off Meat's neck. She stared at it for a long time without saying anything after I said it was hers. I thought that was because she really liked it, but then I realized she probably just didn't understand what it was. Right, right, she's a slave. There's probably a lot she doesn't know about the world. Starting tomorrow, I'll teach her everything she needs to know. By proxy to Rokuko. Do your best, Rokuko. I mean, seriously, what's Rokuko been doing anyway? She's basically done nothing for the past month. She needs to work a little harder. I'll have her do my work for me. No, wait. No, no, no. The only future I see with Rokuko as leader is one where our dungeon turns into a goblin paradise and then collapses immediately. I repaired the hands of the mini clay golem, taking the opportunity to turn them into stone shovels. It was actually pretty simple to do that. The stone became pliable like clay after I poured enough mana into it, making it very easy to morph into a shovel-esque shape. And here we have the new and improved mini clay golem, shovel edition. It felt like it took less mana to mold clay than it took to mold stone. In which case, it would probably be better if I made my first human-sized golem out of clay and just gave it a pickaxe. That could come after I spent some more time experimenting with this mini clay golem, though. I knew it wouldn't ever stop moving inside the dungeon, but how long would it last outside of the dungeon? I decided to test that and watched as Tessel moved around for about one solid hour before stopping. I needed to be careful about that. Stop golems would resume moving if you poured mana into them. It depended on the magic stone inside of them, but normally they could last one hour. I knew that thanks to knowledge from the Create Golem scroll. But wait, what the heck is a magic stone anyway? I know it functions like a battery, but that's all I know. Seriously? You'll give me knowledge that involves magic stones, but won't tell me what they are. Hey, Rokuko. What are magic stones? Magic stones are just, um, stones filled with mana. You can usually take them from monsters. Why don't you try buying some with DP? Rokuko casually said that to my offhand remark. It was like wool being pulled from my eyes. Holy crap. Is it just me or is DP way too useful? Dang, I didn't even think about doing that. I can't believe I needed you to remind me about the DP catalog. Am I just an idiot? I'm disappointed with myself. What's that supposed to mean? I took a look at the DP catalog. Magic stones were in the treasure section in the same category as jewels. There were varying grades of magic stones, with the cheapest kind being 10 dp each and the most expensive being several tens of thousands of dp. But for now, I settled with buying just the cheapest ones to experiment with. But it was getting pretty tiring calling him. Mini Clay Golem. Every time I talked about him. And so, I decided to give him a name. You will now be known as Tessel. Your name is Tessel. Got it? The mini clay golem, now known as Tessel, nodded as if saying, Got it. I then changed his order, making him instead go outside of the cave and gather clay for me. Hey, meat. Can you read and write? No, I can't. I'm sorry, master. Meat lowered her head sadly. H. Hey, you know I'm not mad, right? You're making me feel bad, somehow. That's okay. Rokuko, teach Meat how to read. I'll let you eat a lot of melon rolls if she learns well. Same for you, Meat. You can eat as many hamburgers as you want if you do well. Study hard. Eh? I can eat as many melon rolls as I want. Okay. See can. Can I really?
hamburgers always made Meat's eyes light up. Thinking about it, Meat had gotten a lot more lively than she was in the past. The dead eyes she had when I saved her were completely gone. Perfect. No kid should ever have to look like that. But you know, dog girls really do love Meat, huh? I would need Meat to do work for me outside of the cave before long, so the sooner she learned to read and write, the better. I got back to work making golems while Rokuko taught Meat how to read and write. Normally it'd be about time for me to go to bed, but there was one thing I prioritized over sleep, preparations for sleeping really well. I was prepared to cut down on my sleeping time for the sake of sleeping better. Yeah, basically, sleep was still the most important thing to me. Day 25. After doing research on golems for some days, I had found out that you could do anything with create golem spell. Ladies and gentlemen, cores and slaves, I welcome you. This is the hope that illuminates this mysterious world. I present to you the culmination of my golem research. I said with a triumph look but Rokuko was dumbfounded. Hey, I don't see a golem here. What did you want to? Before Rokuko can finish her sentence, I said. Just you wait, my darling core. After saying that I showed her some moves and kicks which only trained professionals can do after training for years. But knowing it was me who couldn't even fight Rokuko was shocked. How was that? I asked her after loosing my breath in some seconds. Being somewhat impressed, Rokuko said. It looked just like those knights from the other day. How did you do it? Simple I turned my clothes into golems, and had them help my movements. Ha! Huh? Rokoko was shocked again she was like what the hell. At first I made a powered armor but it was heavy, stood out, and was too clumsy. And then I realized I could make golems out of anything, even cloth. Meat saw how out of breath I was and brought me some water. While Rokoko being Rokoko was dumbfounded. This is a golem? These are just clothes Kaima, you think weirdly. With a magic stone, the golems can work outside so it should not be a problem going to the town. Kaima, you're going to a town? I won't be able to do much just staying inside here forever, and now that the knights have eliminated all the bandits for us, the road to town should be pretty safe. There's a lot of things I want to learn about, which means I need to do a lot of information gathering. I'll have to go to town eventually. Like how apparently you can become a holy paladin by destroying a dungeon core. If that's true, People might come by here looking to destroy our core. I needed to figure out what the people of this world thought about dungeons. Are dungeon masters stuck inside their dungeon or something? No, don't worry, there's no rules like that. Um, it's just, I thought you weren't planning on ever leaving the master room. Ah, uh, right. I haven't left the master room even a single time after being summoned to this world. That's because there were bandits out there. How could I go outside? They'd have killed me. Ah, uh, that's true. I can't blame you for that. Day 27 Meat learned to read and write pretty fast, so I rewarded her with a hamburger. Rokuko was already munching happily on the melon roll I had given her. So heartwarming. You um. By the way, master. Would you please register your mana on my collar? Huh. It was rare for me to talk on her own like that. I didn't know what she was talking about at first, but apparently the submission collar meat was wearing had a mana registration system. I've heard that every person in the world has a unique wavelength to their mana. Oh, huh? Like fingerprints? You can't take off the collar yourself? I can't. It would kill me. A submission collar was a relatively cheap item used primarily to choke its wearer, but when someone became a slave... They would be forced to make a contract through magic where they would die if the submission collar was ever removed. Basically, contract magic would kill the slaves if they tried taking their collars off. Yep, this thing is a real pain. All right, I'll definitely register my mana then. I want to avoid as many problems as possible here. Okay. Please pour your mana into the plate on my collar. Um, after you do that, please check whether it worked by squeezing the collar. I placed my fingers on the plate and poured mana into it. Yeah. It definitely felt like my mana connected to some password channel system thing. Registration complete? I wasn't too happy about it, but I envisioned Meat's collar squeezing as a test to see if it worked. And then. Ah. 
Whoa. See cancel, cancel. Stop choking her. I saw the collar squeeze tightly. It was visibly digging into her neck. That's not light squeezing at all. Holy crap. Stop. What kind of monster would do this to someone just to call them over? Me, teary-eyed from having her oxygen supply cut off, replied to me with flushed cheeks while coughing. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Eh yeah, hey. Now I'm your slave for real, master. Meat smiled brightly. What? This is the first time I've ever seen her smile. Why now? Day 28. All right, Rokuko? Only summon five goblins if any adventurers come. Only five. No more than that. When you buy melon rolls, get them from the pastry set. You can have two a day. W we'll see. You be careful too, Kaima. Okay? And so, I left the cave with Rokuko staying behind to keep watch it hit me that I was leaving the master room for the first time. I had been letting me take care of getting clay and recovering Tessel and all that good stuff. I could just use the monitor whenever I wanted to look outside. What if the outside air is poisonous to people from my world or something? Like, what if the planet's mana is actually super deadly to me? Aren't we going? Why yeah, we're going. Right now. Right right now. Hurry up and go already. Don't push me, all right? No matter what. Don't push me. Push you? Okay. Hold on. What's going on here, automatic translator? Rokuko pushed me on the back, forcing me out of the master room. I ended up in the dungeon's core room, completely fine. A all right, sweet. Nothing bad happened at all. Phew, I really worked myself up over nothing. I mean, how could mana be poisonous to me? I've been casting spells almost constantly. Yeah. Are you okay, master? I'm fine. Totally fine, feeling great. Let's go, then. Um, why are we just standing at the cave's entrance? You know, come to think of it, I'm the dungeon master. Should I really be leaving the dungeon willy-nilly like this? I dunno. I think I should be more cautious about this and take things really slowly. Hiya. Why are you pushing me? Don't push me. Eh? You want me to push you? Okay, I will. Why? Why aren't you doing your job right, Mr. Automatic Translator? Ah. Uh, why you've he stolen my first time going outside? And my precious first time. Yeah, nothing bad is happening. Why would anything bad happen anyway? I'm being silly. I took another cautious step outside, but moved so slowly that meat started to pull on my clothes. Master? Ah, right. Sorry. Let's get this show on the road. And so, I took my first step towards the forest. Should I push you? Uh. Yes, please. We hadn't encountered any major problems so far, but it still frustrated me that I had to leave safety to go outside where my very life was at risk. I grumbled about it to myself while running along the mountain road with meat. Why did I have to go outside? For safety, of course. It was impossible for me to tell whether I was safe or not without any information. I had so little information that my desire to do research outweighed the possibly temporary safety I had at the dungeon. Hence, I needed to go to a human settlement. Aya, I really don't want to work. Naturally, I was capable of running down the mountain road despite never exercising thanks to my wearable golem. I had ordered it to run all the way to Tsaya village. And so it was. But it was still really tiring somehow, so I needed to stop several times to take breaks. How is meat keeping up so easily? My muscles are gonna hurt like hell tomorrow, sheesh. It took us half a day to reach the city. And so, we were there. Tsaya city at last. Aside from the food and water, we had also brought a fair amount of cash from the dungeon. It was the money we had withdrawn into the master room after the knights came to eliminate the bandits. The city was surrounded by a brick wall about five meters tall, and the entrance gate was protected by a tough-looking guard. Wait a second, whoa. This is a pretty big city. How many people are living here? Halt! What business do you have in Saya City? The cautious-looking gatekeeper ordered us to halt once we got close enough to the gate. 
not wanting to cause any unnecessary problems, we stopped. Your companion must be a slave, given that collar. Does she belong to you? Yes, she does. I found her by chance. Do you have any form of personal identification? If not, you'll need to pay five silver coins and one copper coin. Your slave doesn't need to pay five silver coins because she's with you. Her master and slave collars are a form of personal identification. I checked the wallet I had brought with me. Inside was seven silver coins, ten noticeably big copper coins, and thirty smallish copper coins. Sweet. I have enough. Ten copper coins were worth one large copper coin, and ten large copper coins were worth one silver coin. I didn't know if there was any coin more valuable than a gold coin, though. Oh, and the silver coins are a form of insurance. The guild will give you a form of identification after you become an adventurer. If you show that to me, I can return your coins. Though, someone from the country like you likely won't have enough money to pay for both this and your registration at the guild. It costs three silver coins for one person to become an adventurer, after all. We advanced down the main street of the city and soon enough delicious scents wafted into my nostrils. There must have been a lot of people making kebabs, as the tasty smell of meat was thick in the air. After walking for a bit, we reached a fairly large building. A sign with a drawing of swords, potions, and scrolls on it was hanging on the door. That must have been the signpost for the Adventurers Guild. I went inside and saw that it was filled with people who looked like adventurers, partying hard and drinking a ton of beer. I was surprised to see all of them drinking so hard at noon. Maybe they had worked all night and were on the verge of going home. I followed the guard to the counter, and soon enough the receptionist handed over the registration forms. Surprisingly enough, it was wood-based paper, not sheepskin parchment, or anything like that. I was impressed. Can you write your name? If not, I can write it for you at the cost of one copper. No need. Meet, it's your time to shine. Yes, master. I asked Meet to write my name for me. The only language I could write in was Japanese. I couldn't comprehend. This world's language whatsoever. Suddenly, I realized that the guard and the receptionist were looking meet and knee over with furrowed brows. Was it that rare for a child slave to be literate? I'm surprised. She's such a small child, and yet. Well, I needed her to be useful somehow. I see. For some reason, the receptionist was giving me a kind of disgusted look. Should I not have taught me to read or something? Um, are you really going to register that slave child as well? Is there a problem with that? Can slaves not be registered? Is there an age limit? Is she writing the wrong things? No, there isn't any problem with the paperwork or anything of that sort. Meet finished writing my name, and we quickly finished the rest of the registration. Guild's receptionist perspective. My name is Celia a receptionist at the Adventurers Guild. I wonder, what relationship do these two new registrants have with each other? The girl has such an unpleasant name. Meet. Like she's just an object or something. But she's being registered Ted as an adventurer despite her name. What a travesty. Came of the brute, was it? Got it. Sigh, what an angel she is. She deserves to be protected from that scum. Day 29. After registering at the guild, I took a look at the request board. I came to town to learn more about the world. But there was something more important. I needed to find out what people of this world thought about dungeons. We'd never hold up if guys like that night keep on coming for the core. What sorts of requests are linked to dungeons? Meat happily plunged into the throng of adventurers. Her small body was engulfed by the crowd and disappeared in seconds. After a small while, she came running back with two slips of paper wedged between her lips. I rubbed her head and scratched her chin to thank Meat, causing her to wiggle happily. Yep, she's basically a puppy. Thank you so much. I took a look at the quest she brought back. Master. How about these? As a new adventurer we can't take any requests above rank G. I had Meat find us some that even we could do. If we wanted to take harder requests we had to raise our ranks first. Hunting meat for a restaurant. 
Adventurers in the guild are organized by ranks. As a newbie you start out at G rank, you will rank up based on your performance on the quests. Said the receptionist after I showed her AF rank quest which was about surveying our dungeon, the ordinary cave. That's why I gotta rank up if I wanna take that request. Damn I'm so sleepy, I don't wanna grind. So I took a rabbit hunting quest. The quest had two requirements. Number one hunt at least three rabbits. Number two. The rabbits must be fresh. And hunting rabbits shouldn't be an issue. These are perfect. We headed straight to forest. We found one rabbit on our way to the forest. It was bouncing around the grassy plains much like you would expect a rabbit to do. Honestly. It was super cute. White fur, red eyes, tiny. Yet yeah, it was cute. Cute and fluffy. A cute ball of fluff frolicking amidst the grass. But moments later, Meat had decapitated it with a single slice. Her golem blade, knife, easily sliced through its neck thanks to its vibration capabilities. It was pretty gruesome. Here's the meat. TH thanks. Good job. I'm proud of you. This kid's got no mercy. I picked up the rabbit's corpse by the feet as blood pumped out of its neck and held it upside down for a bit. Once most of its blood had drained, I threw it into a leather bag we had brought. Meat's knife is a golem I made from an iron ingot. With magic power, the blade vibrates, and I can even cut cleanly through a log. With this knife and the golem clothes, anybody can hunt rabbits. At least, even I should be able to. I think I can, I think I can. When I slashed at the rabbit it jumped away and ran. So fast. Stay still so I can hit you. Ugh a worthy opponent. After trying for some time I asked Meat. Hey Meat, how is it going on your end? When I looked in her direction she already had killed three rabbits. After killing the ten rabbits we headed to the adventurer's guild. And handed over the rabbit filled bag. The client grinned after seeing what was inside. Well, well. Looks can be deceiving, huh? Didn't expect you to be this skilled with a blade. Sorry, the girl did basically everything, not me. All I did was hold upside down the rabbits that the great meat hunted and throw them in the bag after they ran out of blood. Meat was the only one who went into the forest. I just stood around waiting for her. But regardless of who caught them, the client was very impressed with the rabbits. It helped that their pelts were still usable thanks to how we drained their blood. All the rabbits, except one, earned the maximum payment of ten coppers, resulting in a net gain of ninety-seven coppers. Though as a bonus for how solid they were overall, he paid us a whole silver coin instead. Huh. Which was the one worth seven coppers? Yeah, yeah. You know it was the one I caught on my own. My bad for slicing its torso in half. Congratulations. You can now rank up. Do you wish to rank up? Why? Rank up. In other words, we'd be leaving G rank and going up to F rank. Then please give me your guild card. Please sit down and wait for a moment. After we gave our cards to the guild's receptionist, I asked me to get the ordinary cave investigation quest. We had finally met our goal now we will do the survey our slef and say everything is normal in the dungeon and that should keep any new invaders from kying for a while. While I was thinking that the guild's receptionist came back with our cards. Thanks for waiting. Here's your new F rank cards. I thanked the receptionist and took our cards. Meat was taking a lot of time so I asked her. What's wrong Meat? It's not. Here. Yep. Which means someone took it I guess. Oh crap, what do I do? When did it get taken? This morning? At noon? Maybe last night? If they just took it, we could catch up to them on the road there. We might end up fighting, though. Would. Would we be able to win that fight? Master? I glanced at Meat. Speaking of which, does Meat really understand that I'm a dungeon master? Like, does she get what that implies? I don't think I've ever talked to her about it. But. Okay. I need to calm down. Rokuko can handle herself. She'll do what I told her to for sure. If what I know about this world is right, that'll be enough. The only problem is. What if what I know and what the guild knows is different? I need to find that out right away, 
which means now's not the time to be sleeping. I headed towards the counter. Behind it was Celia, the same receptionist as always. Sorry for coming right back. I'd like to ask you some questions about dungeons, if that's okay. Many adventurers will soon be returning, but I can answer your questions until then. But what do you want to know? The dungeons around here are all D rank or above, so they should have little to do with you. In other words, because the ordinary cave was the subject of an F rank quest, it wasn't a normal dungeon. Ere I remember seeing a quest about exploring some dungeon named Ordinary Cave. I couldn't find it just now, but it was an F rank quest, which makes me curious about it. Ah, yes. That quest is primarily for rookies. It's a quest based on investigating a harmless, newly born dungeon. Those are quite rare. We post the quest about once every two weeks. Newly born? I'll have to ask Rokuko to see if that's a fact or just a false rumor. By the way, what kind of person took the quest? That information is confidential. Yeah, figures. I'd have appreciated it if she told me, but I'd basically lose all trust in her if she gave away information like that willy-nilly. While I'm here, might I ask what kind of places dungeons are? Dungeons are places where treasure, monsters, and traps appear. It's often said that if you wish to get rich quick, dungeons are your best bet. Though I presume you already knew that much. And naturally. Of course. How could I not? Yeah, I had no idea. Thank you for teaching me what's common sense in this world. Then are you aware of what a dungeon boss or a dungeon core is? Dungeon boss? Not dungeon core? Now that she mentions it, I do remember one of the knights talking about a dungeon boss or something. Air cores are like the hearts of dungeons. Right? Yes, that's right. A dungeon will collapse as soon as its core is destroyed. The dungeon boss is a being that awaits at the bottom of a dungeon, protecting its core. Some theorize that the dungeon core and the dungeon boss are one at heart. Historically, there are legends of the Demon King's castle collapsing after the Demon King himself was defeated. It's quite a popular theory that the Demon King was both the dungeon core and dungeon boss of his castle dungeon. Though I personally believe that the Demon King was just a sore loser who, at the last moment, tried to destroy those who defeated him by any means possible. A Demon King dungeon core, huh? I guess it was just someone like Rokuko going way too far. I tried imagining Rokuko as a demon queen. She stepped on her long cape and fell over. Yeah, Rokuko doesn't fit that role at all. I heard there was a rumor that you can grow stronger by destroying dungeon cores. Is that true? He who dares wins, or something like that. That is rumored, but whether or not it's true is still unknown. And I might add, destroying guild-managed dungeons is punishable by death under imperial law. I would advise you to not try experimenting. Seriously? Seems like our dungeon's protected by imperial law. It might be a good idea for me to calm down a little. By the way, if you wish to know more about dungeons, I suggest that you buy a dungeonology book. Although books are expensive, there is no better way to learn what you wish to know. Now that's the kind of info I wanted. Dungeonology, huh? That's a funny name, but I'm glad I learned about it. I definitely want one of those books. Though, even a copy of Intro to Dungeonology will cost you a full gold piece. Th, that's pretty expensive. You think so? All books are that expensive, in my experience. Really? Well, I don't have any gold pieces right now. The receptionist glanced behind me. I followed her gaze and saw that several adventurers had just returned. Will that be all for today? People are returning now. Yeah, sorry. Thanks for the help. Do not mention it. Giving advice to adventurers is part of my job. Now, if you'll excuse me. The receptionist turned and started helping out someone else. It'd be rude of me to keep bothering her, so I took meat and left the counter. Either way, I doubted the ordinary cave's core was in any danger of being destroyed. Though there was a decent chance some dungeonology scholars or whatever would investigate it due to how rapidly it increased in size. Either way, DP-wise, it'd be cheaper for us to stay here since we didn't need to buy food or anything. 
one path available to me was to become an adventurer and used Sias City as my base of operation. But to put it simply, I couldn't live without my futon. I really wanted to get my hands on that dungeonology book. Though it might be a while before I can get my hands on enough for one gold coin's worth of stuff. Wait. Wait a second. Can I maybe buy that book with DP? I checked the DP catalog and yep, there it was. Maybe it's showing up now because someone told me about it. Let's see here. Intro to Dungeonology, 100 DP. Wait, what? 100 DP? The heck is with that? I can buy a book worth one gold piece, worth one million yen, for 100 DP? I'm pretty sure, five copper coins costs five DP. What in the world is going on here? What's with the exchange rate? Could it be that the dungeon values things differently from humans? Oh wait, now isn't the time for that. Those adventurers could be at the core at the core any time now. First thing first, I have got to get back to the dungeon. Either way, it looked like it would be a good idea to go back to the dungeon and buy Intro to Dungeonology. Meet, we're going back to the dungeon. Yes, master. Meet nodded. Clothes glowed back to the dungeon full speed. As soon as I said that golem clothes made me run so fast that I thought my soul would be left behind in the city. After reaching the dungeon my feet and muscles were killing me. They hurt so bad. It was already close to noon when we reached the ordinary cave. It took longer than expected, but we had finally gotten home. Though, the first thing we saw after exiting the forest and looking towards the cave was something neither of us ever expected. There was Rokuko, sitting on a white chair next to a white table, gracefully drinking tea. She was even in the form I first saw her in, rather than her DP saving form. And in front of her was a lady I've never seen before, looking gently at Rokuko with her long white hair trailing behind her back. She radiated a classy aura that likely reflected some kind of noble status. Beside her stood a blonde. Guy. Ah, uh, wait, no. Beside her stood a cross-dressing blonde girl wearing the black clothes of a butler while holding an umbrella over the first girl. And then, and then. Fufu. What happened after that? Rokuko gracefully tilted her cup to drink the tea. The refined lady used that opportunity to talk to her, smiling gently. Basically, the entrance to our cave had turned into the royal garden of a palace. What the heck is Rokuko doing? Who is that girl? Why are they drinking tea like nothing's wrong at all? I froze in place, and soon enough made eye contact with the broadly smiling Rokuko. Oh, Kaima! Welcome back! That didn't take long at all. What are you doing? Eh? Can't you tell? I'm having a tea party like the refined lady I am. Rokuko, not in her lowly form, puffed out her sizable chest with pride. That's not what I meant. I want to know why you're doing that. Number 89 came over to spend time with me. Oh wow, number 89, huh? Wait. Number 89? She's a dungeon core? I looked more closely at the white-haired girl sitting next to her. She looked like much more of a refined lady than Rokuko. Well, hello there. May I call you Kaima? The lady elegantly waved her hand. To be honest, she was exactly my type. Like, exactly, holy shit. But for some reason, a chill ran down my spine. Let me introduce myself. Said the white-haired lady, oh my god, she is like an angel. I am Dungeon Core number 89, Haku of the White Labyrinth. I was just talking to number 89 about what happened recently. I told her about you too, Kaima. All right, Rokuko. Come here for a second. Ma'am, please excuse us. I pulled Rokuko away and started whispering to her. How much have you told her? Um, I just got to the part where the bandits were all about to die. Oh, and I gave her a melon roll, too. She really loved it. Rokuko let out a girlish squeal of happiness, clearly pleased that her older sister enjoyed her gift. So I thumped her on the side of the head. Oh, why'd you do that? Rokuko barked at me like an angry dog. Has scratched that. Big tits or not, she's still more like an angry puppy. Listen up. Stop telling her things she doesn't need to know. She might be our enemy. 
and no matter what, don't tell her anything about my golems. But number 89 definitely isn't our enemy. Who taught you the absolutely incredible battle strategy of summoning nothing but goblins? Number 89. Who told you to use DP only to summon monsters without ever expanding your dungeon past one room? Number 89. So? Are you really sure she definitely isn't our enemy? B but. Alright. So basically here's how it is. Dungeon core number 89 wasn't letting Rokuko grow as a dungeon. While, simultaneously, her own dungeon was shooting up through the rankings. There was some connection there and it was very possible that she'd be getting in our way from now on. Rather, she would probably eliminate us the second she could if we ever get in her way. Mm, mm number 695. Will your secret discussion be over soon? I would like to join you too. Okay. W, we're coming right over, number 89. And yet, Rokuko still looked happy after Dungeon Core number 89 called out to her. Yeah. If I hadn't used my absolute authority over her as dungeon master, she would have spilled the beans instantly. Though it was still possible that she let some secrets leak. Whether or not I have absolute authority over her, my order wouldn't mean much if she was letting things slip unconsciously. So, what happened to the bandits after that? You, um. Rokuko glanced at me. She must not have known whether or not it was okay for her to talk. So, I answered for her. As you can tell, they were massacred. The band of knights took care of them, then? Yes, that's perfect. But I must wonder how much DP they were worth. Judging from the reports, you two must have earned at least 10,000. The reports? What do you mean by that? Sorry, I don't know too much about you. Ah, uh, I imagine not. You were summoned here from another world, after all. Guess Rokuko already told her about my summoning and all that. Allow me to introduce myself. Dungeon Core number 89 straightened her back end, with a hand on her chest, introduced herself with a clear voice. I am Dungeon Core number 89. A prior master of mine called me Haku. I know that humans prefer such names over numerical designations, so please feel free to call me Haku as well. I manage the Ivory Labyrinth, located within the Liverio Empire's capital city. Dungeon Core number 695 is my little sister, as you know. It is a pleasure to meet you. Dungeon Core number 89 smiled gracefully at me. Haku's a lot shorter than Dungeon Core whatever whatever, so I'll roll with that. I responded to Haku's greeting in turn, taking care to speak with enough gravity and weight that she wouldn't look down on me. Indeed, it is nice to meet you as well. My name is Kaima Masuda. Please call me Kaima. I have been working as the dungeon master of your little sister's dungeon, the Ordinary Cave. I pray that we can work well together. Oh my, you are quite the polite one. I am impressed. Hearing Haku say that made Rokuko panic a little. SH should I introduce myself too? I am dungeon core number 695, and... Ah, uh, we both know who you are, so... Oh, right. We gotta get ready. Some adventurers are coming. My, my. Are you perhaps worried about that because of this? Haka took the ordinary cave investigation quest slip out from her cleavage. Why was she keeping it there? I mean, uh, why does she have that? Haku quickly answered my question. Despite my true identity, I am also an A-rank adventurer, a position I exploited to get my hands on this. The knights from my country gave their report on the ordinary cave and I couldn't help but come see things for myself. So do not worry, Kaima. You'll be fine for at least half a month now. Haku smiled, as if saying the situation was entirely under her control. She was right. No invaders would be coming for our dungeon any time soon, excluding the two in front of me. By the way, Kaima, may I ask you a question? Sure. What's up? The smile vanished from Haku's face. Are you a soldier of God? I felt a chill run down my spine. A soldier of God. No idea what that means. Some God talked to me while I was being summoned here, but I didn't become his soldier or anything. I did meet someone who claimed to be a God, but I don't remember him talking about anything like that. I see. 
as if satisfied by my answer, Haku resumed smiling. I could almost feel the atmosphere warming back up. Forgive me, but I used magic to determine whether or not you were lying. You seemed to be telling the truth, thankfully. I was worried about you ever since number 695 told me that she had summoned you from another world. When did she cast that magic? And that kind of magic even exists? Makes sense, I guess, since there's a magic tool that does the same thing. Now then. I would like to have a conversation alone with you, Kaima. Do you mind? Ah, uh, you can wait here with Chloe, number 695. Understood, my lady. Come with me, princess. I followed Haku as she distanced herself from Rokoko and Chloe. Of course, meat stayed behind too. Yeah. This is pretty dangerous. I didn't notice until she stood up. But Haku has absolutely incredible feet. Crap. I can't stop staring at her feet, even though I know I'm in danger here. Her Vietnamese-style Ao Dai dress hugged her body perfectly, showing off all her curves. I could see the outline of her feet through the thin cloth of her skirt each time she took a step. I want to look under her skirt. I want to take off her shoes and get a good look at her bare feet. Now then. Haku turned to look at me after we had walked a fair distance. The fact that she looked beautiful just turning around really helped me understand why Rokuko looked up to her so much. And then, without a missing a beat, she said, Would you please relinquish your position as dungeon master? I'm afraid I can't do that. The beds in this world suck way too much. They're like, unforgivably bad. I couldn't live with them. I'm not gonna quit being a dungeon master. It's the only way for me to get futons and even better beds. Sincerely, though, what have you been doing to my cute little number 695? How dare you defile her as you have? If you won't quit being a dungeon master, then please at least relinquish your absolute authority over her and then kill yourself immediately. Isn't that basically just me quitting being a dungeon master? I'm not really sure what you're talking about. I mean, I wouldn't mind giving up my absolute authority but suicide is a bit much. Oh my. I like your cooperative attitude. But will you truly give up your authority? I imagine you've already ordered number 695 to do lewd things with you, yes? And then you ordered her to forget all those inconvenient memories. You're just doing whatever you want with her. You humans are all the same. Hold on a second. I didn't do anything like that. Humph, I wonder about that. Your species treat we dungeon cores like toys, giving us orders like slowly fall in love with me over time and marry me. I didn't even realize what was going on until he died. I can't trust you humans at all. I thought I taught that to number 695, but she still. Oh, huh? I guess that's what happened to her. She might not have meant to actually say that out loud. I don't have any interest in non-consensual stuff, so yeah, I'll give it up no problem. Very well. I will have you remove it while I watch. Wait. Wait just a moment. In other words, you are interested in her as long as it doesn't involve your absolute authority? Just what do you intend to do to number 695? You've got a pretty strong imagination, huh? She was just making up false accusations as she went along. Well, whatever. There's just one thing I want to make sure of here. Haku. Are you Rokuko's enemy? I have no idea what you're talking about. In what world would I ever be number 695's enemy? So we're gonna be playing that game, huh? Why did you teach those battle strategies to Rokuko? Those battle strategies? I'm afraid that I taught her so many things. I don't know precisely what you're referring to. I decided to take things step by step and ask one specific question at a time to ensure I knew what was going on. Okay, first of all, why did you teach her to summon goblins specifically? Goblins are the most efficient monster for a dungeon as small as hers to summon. Even if she were to summon a strong monster, she wouldn't be able to maintain it for long. Smaller monsters don't require much food either. Makes sense. Goblins are pretty efficient. Why did you teach her to summon monsters all at once using as much DP as possible? There is undeniable strength in numbers. A strong foe can be beaten by many weak allies. Additionally, 
There is not a single dungeon core alive who would prioritize DP over survival in a dangerous situation. That's true. There's no point in saving your resources for later if there won't be a later. Why did you teach her that building rooms was a waste of DP and that monsters should be prioritized? Rooms can't defeat invaders, can they? Victory can only be obtained by summoning monsters to defeat invaders. She's right. No matter how many rooms you have, you need some kind of offensive strategy to ultimately win. In that case, why didn't you teach her about using traps? Most of them can only be used a single time, which isn't very cost-effective. And to make matters worse, you can place very few traps in a small dungeon. Traps that can be used many times are quite expensive. Makes sense. All right. I think that's enough questions. All her advice makes perfect sense from the perspective of this specific dungeon. But remove one condition and all the advice would be completely worthless. Okay. I understand where you're coming from. Now what I want to know is, how did you make people view her as a safe, harmless dungeon? Yep. The condition was that Rokuko had to be a dungeon managed by humans. In any other situation, invaders would destroy the dungeon core as soon as they defeated the goblins. After all, the ordinary cave had in fact been just an ordinary cave with a core lying defenseless in its only room. Oh my, you've figured it out, have you? Well, the answer is simple enough. I personally created both the Lavirio Empire and the Adventurer's Guild. Rokuko was established as a safe dungeon because I willed it. I had more or less noticed that already. It didn't take me long to realize that she was a big fish in the sea. Ah, and by that I mean both among humans and among other dungeon cores. Oh my, you don't seem very surprised. I mean, you mentioned receiving a report from the knights earlier. You had no intention of hiding your true identity, did you? Well, no. I didn't. Haku smiled and laughed a little, visibly pleased. So, why did you try to ensure that the ordinary cave would stay weak and small forever? Because number 695 is cuter that way. And I want to protect her. That's why I panicked quite a bit when I heard that she had been occupied by bandits. You want to protect her? Why? Well, she is my cute little sister, you know. I yearned for her safety so much that at first I thought about placing a guard by her entrance to prevent anyone from invading her in the first place. But that would just attract unwanted attention from the soldiers of God, who would proceed to hunt her. That's why I instead focused on making her as invisible and forgettable as possible. So? Is that satisfactory enough of an explanation for you? Am I satisfied, huh? Why are you hunting other dungeon cores? One of the knights had said that one needed to destroy a dungeon core to become a holy paladin. Which, of course, had to be a system that Haku set in place herself. She was protecting Rokuko while actively attacking other dungeon cores, and I wanted to know why. Wait. I wonder if she knows that her little system there nearly got Rokuko killed when the knights were here. That has nothing to do with number 695. If I didn't hunt other cores, the soldiers of God would hunt me in turn. She was doing it for her own sake. That was very easy to understand. Makes sense to me. Very well. Is there anything else you want to know? I'll answer any questions you have, while we're here. That's pretty nice of you. Any particular reason behind this streak of kindness? Yes, well. Consider it a reward from me. I heard from number 695 that you made certain every single one of the dirty bandits that stepped on her died. You made sure not a single one of them survived. This is my thanks for that. If even a single one had gotten away, I would have needed to waste my time hunting them down. All right. May as well use this opportunity to ask about holy paladins. By the way, did you know that one of the knights that came here tried to destroy Rokuko's core? I heard. I gave special treatment to the 17th Knight Platoon, and yet their report mentioned one of them trying to swing their sword at number 695. Can you believe it? My goodness, I will never understand how you humans can be so simple-minded as to not understand how lovely and cute and perfect number 695's core is. Naturally, I'm having them all executed. All of them. Of course, 
I can't mention number 695 in the official charges, so I'm planning to forge evidence indicting them all of treason against the state. The true treason would be punishing them with just a pay drop despite how grave the crime of attempting to destroy number 695 is. That makes their executions lawful and just. Ah, uh, I suppose that they are currently returning to the capital with no idea of what awaits them. Ah, uh, this woman's messed up in the head. And she's so stupidly powerful she can easily destroy people's lives if she wants to. What kind of politics involves executing an entire platoon of knights? That's just scary. Oh my, do you think I went too far? Not at all. Oh, by the way, the knights left early out of laziness. They said adventurers would take care of any stragglers for them. Was that in the report too? Hmm, it seems I have another crime to charge them with. I kept my cool and played along with her. I'd be in danger myself if I disagreed with her too much. But either way, I felt like I knew her a little better after all that. I was pretty confident she wouldn't end up becoming Rokoko's enemy. Everything she did was for Rokoko's sake, after all. We should be safe as long as Rokoko doesn't try to hurt Haku for whatever reason. You don't seem to be a useless man who just sleeps all day, so it might be wise for me to recognize you as number 695's dungeon master for now. Hmm. I'll spare your life at the very least, as thanks for doing so well in saving her from the bandits. Sweet, I'm gonna survive this. I feel like she's looking down on me pretty hard, but... Whatever. As long as she's not my enemy. I mean, her feet are super pretty. There's not a single bad person in the world with pretty feet. Actually, sorry, that's not true at all. There's a lot of villains that like to step on people with their sexy feet. Right. Very well. Let us have a dungeon battle. I'll recognize you as her master if you can defeat me. Ha! There's another word I don't know. And my tedious radar is beeping like crazy. Please no. I took a deep breath. Calm down. Calm down. What is a dungeon battle? It's... A competition. Yes, a competition where dungeons attempt to invade each other. There are many rules, but let's start with the basics. The most fundamental rules are that the dungeons connect their entrances with space-time magic and proceed to send an army of monsters into each other. Whoever reaches the other's core first wins. Simple, isn't it? Putting aside the space-time magic stuff, the rules certainly were simple. Though accepting her challenge was completely out of the question. First of all, I will loan you 100,000 DP to use. I will then make a new branch dungeon the same size as your ordinary cave, and then develop it using 100,000 DP as well. You will win if you can touch the dummy core within it. Ah, and by the way, you can keep the DP if you win. I'll even reward your victory with an extra 100,000. What do you think? These conditions seem pretty biased in our favor. How could our the ordinary cave a safe and beginner-friendly dungeon perfect for up-and-coming adventurers. Field trips to see the dungeon core are available. Ever hope to beat her? The Ivory Labyrinth, a legendary dungeon located deep within the ancient Laverio Empire's capital city. Haku was on a completely different level than us. At best, we had less than half of a percent chance of winning. And I still hadn't heard what would happen if I lost. And if you win, Haku? Fufufu. I'll have you repay the DP I lent you. With your body. Ah, uh, and I don't mean that in a sexual way. You'll just have to work in my dungeon as an adventurer. I'll set you free once you've earned 100,000 DP and offered it up to me. You have my word that I will take care of number 695 myself until you've repaid your debt. These conditions are unreasonably favorable to you, so I'm sure you'll accept my challenge. You will, won't you? She was right. The conditions were in our favor. We'd get a hundred thousand DP right off the bat, and we could use it to grow our dungeon in any way that we pleased. But think about it from my perspective. A single goblin was worth twenty DP, but actually defeating them in the dungeon would only earn back two DP. Assuming that logic held true for all monsters, I would need to beat fifty thousand goblins to earn a hundred thousand DP. At best, I would need to beat ten low-rank dragons. Just how long would that even take? 
Wait, hold on. Would killing monsters even count as offering up DP? Monsters cost DP to summon. Wouldn't killing them just make my debt even worse? Holy crap. After all, dungeon masters and dungeon cores are the only things that can actually earn DP. Earning a hundred thousand DP as an adventurer sounds pretty difficult. Oh my, that wasn't my intention. In that case, I'll be satisfied with DP earned from battles as well. Are you suggesting that I work as a monster and as a player killer? In the legendary Ivory Labyrinth, where veteran adventurers from all over the world gather? Fufu. I do have some branch dungeons made to be suitable for beginners, you know. Haku giggled in blatant amusement. Yeah, I can't let my guard down around this person. I mean, uh, around this dungeon core. Very well. I will accept any DP you expend in any of my dungeons to be part of your repayment. How do you feel about that? I think that's much more fair. But what do you get from it? Under those rules, if I, for example, found and used a healing scroll, 100,000 DP, on myself, I would immediately have paid back my debt in full. DP does return to the mana stream after adventurers expend it, but that's merely a side benefit. The main benefit of you working my dungeons is that I get an excuse to take Rokoko to the capital and take care of her there personally while leaving guards to protect her dungeon. Under normal circumstances, she would never accept such a thing. Makes sense. She has a lot to gain if it comes to keeping Rokoko safe. You will accept this challenge. I do need to see whether you're a skilled enough dungeon master to truly protect number 695, after all. I guess turning her down was never in the cards for me. And that's what we discussed, number 695. We'll be having a dungeon battle. Eh? What's a dungeon battle, number 89? Wait, what? Seriously? You don't know that either? Haku and I explained the term to Rokuko. Wow, that sounds like fun. Though it is a competition, so we'll be fighting with DP on the line. I'll lend you your share of DP this time. Eh? You can share DP with me? How do you know so little about anything, Rokoko? I mean, I also didn't know about these things before, but that's totally different. And I wonder how DP is shared anyway. It's, um, it's only natural that you didn't know that, number 695. You never had the opportunity to learn. The truth is, you, um, DP is exchanged by kissing. It's true. We have to give each other a nice, long kiss. Moi. Really? Is that true, Chloe? No. If my memories are correct, a simple handshake would do well enough. I consulted the butler for confirmation and got a quick, firm answer. This is the first time number 695 has ever exchanged DP before, and I'm giving her an entire hundred thousand. It's important that we kiss so that none leaks out and is wasted by mistake. It's easy to make mistakes when you're doing something for the first time. Is it not wise for us to use the safest method here? That excuse is so obviously fake it hurts. A hundred thousand? I can't take that much. I'm just lending it to you. And you'll need around that much to prepare for our battle. After all, this is a competition where we fight with DP as our everything. It would be boring for us both if you didn't have any DP, wouldn't it? This is just a simple handicap for me. We'll have to give it all back to her if we lose, so it really is just a loan. Go ahead and take it. And be sure to do exactly as Haka says when it comes to taking the DP from her. Mmm, -hmm, okay. Thank you very much, number 89. I'll gladly accept your DP. What should I do to take the DP from you, number 89? Close your eyes, open your mouth just a little, and stick out your tongue. Mm, mm yes, just like that. I realized halfway through saying, Go ahead and take it. That my statements would probably be interpreted as orders that Rokuko had to obey due to my absolute authority. So, I added on that last bit about the DP exchanging to earn some brownie points. Ah, uh, Haku's stealthily giving me a thumbs up. I guess a thumbs up means the same thing in this world too? I'll eat you, I'll give you the DP now. She was just about to say, I'll eat you up. Right. Haku locked her mouth against Rokuko's, making sure that their tongues touched as much as possible. 
She embraced Rokuko's trembling body and pulled her closer with her left hand, while using her right hand to lock her head in place. Rokuko looked nervous due to never having done something like that before, but she kept her eyes shut and entrusted her body to Haku. She was blushing bright red and would occasionally twitch as if some sensitive spot on her body was being touched. Haku had been going really slowly and taking her time, but apparently that was all just the beginning. She embraced Rokuko's head with both hands and moved her mouth, causing something, likely DP, to flow into her little sister's mouth. Rokuko pulled her head back in surprise, allowing me to briefly see a shining light between their tongues, but Haku soon pulled her head back. And so, that continued for about ten more minutes. When their mouths finally separated, a string of saliva bridged the gap between their tongues before breaking apart. Fa. Ga ha. Nfa. Their expressions were entirely different. Rokuko was breathing heavily with her eyes shut whereas Haku was smiling in satisfaction while licking her lips. The only thing they shared was their flushed cheeks and dreamy floatiness. A small amount leaked out, but I gave more than that as a bonus. Ha ha. Th thank you, show mush. Number 89. Howa. Wufufu. Was your first DP exchange too much for you? That's fine. I'll keep holding on to you for as long as necessary, so rest well. Haku once again stealthily gave me a thumbs up behind her back. Yeah. That definitely means, good job, in this world too. I checked our DP while Rokuko rested her body against Haku's. 114-032 DP. The exchange certainly seemed to have gone well. I think we had 3,500 DP before this, so. Dang. The DP I worked my ass off to get with blood, sweat, and tears is equivalent to just a minor bonus, in Haku's eyes. Just how much DP does she earn a day? Seriously. Ah, uh, by the way, Kaima. Do not even think about losing intentionally by not preparing for the battle. I won't accept the DP I just loaned you as a way to repay your debt. It has to be new DP. Oh snap, there goes that plan. Darn. I coulda earned 10,000 DP for nothing, too. By the way, this is a gift from me. Haku gave me a copy of Intro to Dungeonology. I took a look at the author and saw that it had been written by Haku Leverio. Ah, uh, makes sense that a dungeon core would write a book about dungeons. This is probably the best source of information I could ask for. Humans believe many things that aren't quite true, so you should read this and be careful. Most of these are things I've thought up myself. One thing that's particularly popular amongst we cores is this section. Haku pointed her pale, white finger to a section in the book named Safe Zones. I glanced over it and saw that safe zones were described as, reasonably enough, safe places where monsters cannot enter. This is just an act on our part. We set up magic tools that appear to serve some kind of function and then order our monsters to never go into the area. That causes humans to let their guard down, thinking the area is completely safe. I get it. That's pretty smart. You could earn DP from the adventurers resting within your dungeon, but the best thing of all was that safe zones weren't safe at all. The adventurers would all have their guard completely down without any eyewitnesses. You could easily kill them all without leaving any evidence behind. Of course, since nobody would know that the adventurers had gone into the safe zone, Everyone would just think they died normally in the dungeon. In a world as lacking in sources of information as this one, a book written by someone famous from the imperial capital would be about as reliable as you could get. Haku's basically manipulating them like the mass media manipulated people back on Earth. You have a lot to learn and much to prepare, so we can begin the battle in three days. Do your best, okay? Do you have enough time to go back to the capital? I walked here since my adventurer identity is weakened to match what humans would expect from me, but I do know teleport. Oh, and by the way, teleport scrolls cost 50 million DP. I thought we were going to connect our dungeons using space-time magic. That is actually a natural ability of dungeons, much like the menu. I dedicated several of my scientists to research it, but all they could figure out was that it was done through some form of space-time magic. 
all their research only resulted in us learning something that was obvious from the start. Isn't that odd? In my opinion, space-time magic is... odd. Enough on its own, but okay. Well then, see you in three days. I'm looking forward to our battle. Hmm. In the depth of my mind are memories of distant lands once traveled, forming a mental path from here to there. Fly through space, fly through time. There becomes here and here becomes there. Fuse, conjoin, connect. Teleport. Haku chanted in a sing-song voice, causing both her and Chloe to float up. Before a bright flash of intense light exploded around them. When the light faded they had left nothing behind but a soft wind that brushed against our cheeks. Rokuko remained in a daze for some time after Haku left, but she came back to normal eventually. So, do you think we can win? For sure. The rules were designed to give us a chance. Though she has a pretty huge advantage over us. Rokuko looked surprised after hearing me say that. She seemingly didn't understand how Haku had an advantage. Really? I know that number 89 is really amazing, but she gave us a whole extra 10,000 DP to use, didn't she? She didn't mention resources she already had in the conditions at all. It'd be totally legal for her to bring out a dragon she had already placed in one of her dungeons, since that technically wouldn't be her using DP. She probably won't go that far, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if her monsters come swinging with magically enchanted weapons or something like that. Rokuko sighed and shook her head. Ha! Kaima, I don't know how you always find crazy loopholes like that. It's like... Impressive, but maybe not in a good way. Hey, that older sister you love so much made those rules with that loophole in mind. She intends to exploit it. That's what's really impressive here. I wouldn't expect anything less from number 89. Yep. She's basically a monster and I do mean that in a good way. All right then. Rokuko, meet. It's time to work. What were the first things I bought with my newfound 110,000 DP? Shovels and pickaxes, of course. WH few, we finished just in time. Um, there are actually a few things we didn't do in time. This is why I said we should have just used DP to take care of everything. We needed that DP to summon monsters, though. You know that. My preparations had been very inclusive. We were ready both defensively and offensively. The focus of our strategy would just be racing straight towards the enemy's dungeon core. Phew. We had used a ton of DP. Despite all my efforts to cut down on costs, we had still ended up using close to 80,000 DP. But not a single one of those points had been wasted. I'm getting nostalgic for when I cared a lot about saving up like 200 dp. Wait a second, Kaima. What's with that pillow? Huh? This one? It's a heavenly pillow, 10,000 dp. What about it? Yep. One-eighth of the dp we had spent was on this baby. Hey, it wasn't a waste of dp or anything. This pillow is absolutely vital for helping me work efficiently and sleep effectively. This heavenly pillow was a necessary expense. More importantly, nice look, Rokuko. You really put your all into dressing up today, huh? Hee <laughs> hee, of course. Honestly, I'm surprised you noticed. How could I not? I mean, she's in her princess night mode. And, er, uh, just so you know, Rokuko, you're not gonna be fighting. I really hope that sword on your hip is just for show. But really, that's no fair. I want something too, Kaima. We still have a lot of DP left, don't we? I mean, I left that DP as an emergency stock in case something happens. What, do you want me to summon 10,000 DP worth of goblins for you? Why goblins? I don't like them that much. All right, all right. And just so you know, I'm planning on giving up my absolute authority after this dungeon battle is over. I had decided to get rid of my absolute authority after the battle was over since I needed it now to make sure she didn't mess up my more detailed instructions. Eh? R. Are you fine with that? Hey, we're partners in body and soul. I'd like us to treat each other as equals. Partners. Why yeah, that's right. Dungeon cores and masters are spiritually connected and stuff. Yep. 
and that's why I'm counting on you right now. But not ordering you around. Leave it to me. I'll do my best. Rokuko smiled brightly and looked so happy. Just after a second we got a video transmission from Haku, aka core number 89. Can you hear me, number 695? Sister. Yes, I can hear you. I'm so happy I get to see you again. An adorable voice came out from the menu, causing Haku to smile. This time, Rokuko was wearing a cute set of dress armor. She looked so cute in it that Haku wanted to seek her out on the battlefield to capture her. Haku found herself lovingly absorbed in Rokuko's angelic, cute smile that was dripping with clear enthusiasm for her first dungeon battle. This little cutie would surely start to cry with tears and snot dirtying her beautiful face if Haku were to mercilessly attack her as planned. Hot. Very hot. But I must take care to not go too far and make her hate me, thought Haku. Fufu. I hope I'm not rushing you, but are you ready to begin? Aha! Uh -huh. Very well. Dungeon battle, start. Haku's words marked the beginning of battle. The moment she finished speaking, a gate appeared near the entrance to her dungeon. It was large enough for a platoon of knights to pass through easily, and on the other side awaited the ordinary caves, golems. I see, I see. Golems certainly are a good choice for an army's vanguard. Clay golems in particular are cheap and therefore easy to gather in large groups. Not only that, but since golems could move for essentially no cost thanks to free mana from the dungeon, they had the least upkeep necessary out of any monster. However, despite being offensively and defensively powerful, they were slow. Please attack with the lizardmen. Lizardmen, attack. Both armies charged towards the gate. Haku, determining that the golems would simply crush her goblins, prioritized attacking them with her lizardmen. The goblins would mainly work as scouts to help with conquering the dungeon itself. Losing them early on the battlefield would be a tactical failure. The lizard men leaped through the gate and swung their blades at the golems. Many of them were hit directly and collapsed onto the ground, bodies broken, but the majority of them won with speed and damaged the golems effectively. But nonetheless, many golems slipped past them and invaded the ivory proving grounds. How are the preparations proceeding, Chloe? Without issue, my lady. The Ivory Proving Grounds was a branch dungeon of the capital's Ivory Labyrinth. It had suddenly appeared a short distance away from the capital itself. Of course, it was in truth a dungeon that Dungeon Core number 89. That Haku had prepared for her dungeon battle with Rokuko. It had been named by Haku herself. She planned to register the dungeon under that name to the Adventurer's Guild. It was a dungeon with five floors in total dug out using 50,000 DP. Minotaurs wandered its halls and traps were placed everywhere, with loaded crossbows hidden and spears prepared to fly out of holes in the floors and walls. There were even lizard men placed about. And among those monsters, many of them held enchanted weapons which would cost 10,000 DP each. That's right. Multiple monsters. By the way, Chloe, I feel as if many weapons are missing from my armory. Do you know anything about this? I would guess that the 17th Night Platoon stole from it before leaving. Yet another crime they have committed against us. I see. There's no helping that, then. I feel as if I've seen the axe that Minotaur over there is holding before, but it must be something else entirely. Indeed, that axe is actually quite common. Oh my, it seems that lizard men have gotten into our dungeon. There was a lizard man nest around this area to begin with. But that has nothing to do with us, does it? Indeed it does not. We are not responsible for native creatures inhabiting our dungeon on their own. Their dungeon had been prepared using more than 100,000 DP, and their conversation revealed how that was done. Of course, they hadn't broken the rule about not using more than a set amount of DP. What they were doing was completely legal. As for the Seventh Knight Platoon, whose members now faced even more false charges. Let us pray for them. The Ivory Proving Grounds, despite being a freshly made dungeon, was already difficult enough to pose immense danger for beginning adventurers. Even a party of C-rank adventurers would struggle to conquer it. If you included the army of monsters waiting by the entrance for war to begin, the dungeon's difficulty would increase even further, 
all the way to B-rank. The attacking force alone was 15 minotaurs, 3,000 dp, 50 lizardmen, 150 dp, and 100 goblins, 20 dp. All of those monsters were favored by Haku for how balanced their strength was with their dp cost. Perhaps out of the goodness of her heart, or perhaps to avoid suspicion, none of the monsters in the attacking force wielded enchanted weapons. Haku had brought her five retainers, including Chloe, into her master room to assist with the dungeon battle. It's a bit late to be doing this now, but the Ivory Proving Grounds military leadership was as follows. Amelia, a Lamia in charge of defense. Dolce, a wraith in charge of managing intelligence such as troop casualty statistics. Sally, a living armor in charge of combat and battles. Misha, a war cat in charge of offensive reconnaissance. And finally Chloe the succubus, who supported Haku in any way necessary. Haku herself served as a unified leader that gave orders to each retainer and took care of the general decision-making. The enemy has invaded our dungeon. Alamia was looking at the map and reporting the movements of the enemy army. She was one of Haku's most trusted retainers. There are around two hundred invaders? The retainers all shook in fear after hearing Dolce's report. No way. I can't have let that many pass. I didn't even see that many of Golem, but it definitely says two hundred here. But still there weren't two hundred Golems. They aren't Golems. They are Grey Rats. Grey. Rats? You mean... They are not even monsters? Even Haku's voice rose in confusion and fear. It seemed that the golems had all been carrying large boxes on their backs filled to the brim with ordinary rats. Of course, since each rat was being displayed on the map as an enemy, they had all been summoned and placed under the dungeon core's control. Rats or not, they were the enemy, and if even a single one touched the ivory proving grounds dummy core, Haku would lose. Even the golems who hadn't passed through the gate had boxes, and soon their tops burst open as a throng of rats raced out. They charged like a pulsating wave of gray water, weaving through the lizardmen's legs and into the ivory proving grounds. Exterminate them at once! I can't! They're too small! The minotaurs can't handle them! Order half of the goblins to focus on exterminating the rats! We're in danger here! They've conquered the first floor! The enemy is now invading the second floor. I count. Around five hundred invaders. It may only be a matter of time until our dungeon is completely conquered. He certainly has a good head on his shoulders, doesn't he? I had no idea gray rats were so suitable for an advance force. Indeed. Forgive me, the first floor of our dungeon was conquered in a matter of moments. I don't blame you, Chloe. None of us expected a strategy like this. Amelia placed several flamethrower traps along the hallways of the third floor. That should buy us some time. Th, thank you very much. Traps could still be placed on any floors without invaders on them. I might have to take some notes and use rats in another battle myself. When caught off guard like this, they are exceptionally difficult to counter. Oh wow, look at them go. I murmured to myself in awe as I watched the map steadily getting filled out before my eyes. Um, the map's filling out like super fast. That means our armies are conquering the dungeon like crazy, right? We're beating Haku? You bet. But just cause we're winning now doesn't mean the battle's over. Naturally, you don't just get a map of the enemy's dungeon at the start of a dungeon battle. That makes total sense. It's a little hard to get lost in a labyrinth you have a comprehensive map for. And the dungeon core would be on it, too. A finished map would make a dungeon battle ridiculously boring. That said, those being invaded can still look at their map and see where all the enemies are. Master the Golem. Vanguard has been completely destroyed. All fifty of them are gone. All right. Just as planned. By the way... That golem vanguard had been composed almost entirely of clay golems I made with Create Golem. Only a few of them at the front had actually been summoned, which saved us a lot of DP. I had made the others out of the clay we got from expanding the dungeon. Talk about recycling. Aren't I eco-friendly? But the most important thing was how much DP it saved, for sure. 
I put magic stones into them just in case Haka got suspicious. But even so, those only cost a tenth of what golems did. I could even reuse the destroyed golems' bodies by absorbing them back into the dungeon, assuming they died within it. Same went for the magic stones. The rat surprise attack, a ton of traps including the pitfalls meat dug out, and finally, the complex second and third floor labyrinths that Rokuko built. I wonder how Haku's gonna hold up? I observed the battlefield while rubbing Meat's head. Hashtag Haku's perspective. There are pitfalls right at the start. Order the goblins to go first. We'll find the pitfalls by seeing where they fall. Back at the Ivory Proving Grounds camp, the retainer handling offensive reconnaissance was hurriedly dealing with the traps before her. Right from the start, she had to deal with pitfalls. Several of their troops were swallowed up by them in an instant. Normally, she would just launch bodies at the pitfalls until they were filled up with corpses, but they were invading an enemy dungeon. The monsters just got absorbed the moment they died. That wasn't a major problem, though. She could just avoid the pitfalls after determining where they were located. Okay, I've marked all the pitfalls down. Invasion start. Ah. Uh, wait, a minotaur just fell. The spears at the bottom killed him instantly. But why? I just saw a goblin walk right there, and he was fine. I had meat working as well. She was digging a ton of pitfalls near the entrance to the dungeon. I'll put flooring on the bottom too. That's the spirit. I want you to put spikes on that flooring after you're done, so be careful not to fall in yourself. I'll be putting covers over the pitfalls once they're all dug out. Roger. By the way, the covers would be really thin and flat golems. Golems were great even outside of doing physical labor. Though I was probably the only one who's ever gone out of their way to make flat plate golems. You can even resize the golems after you make them, not something your average building material can do. With the floorboard golems, I can do anything. I wonder if Haku will realize it. I thought as I was petting meat, but I don't know why she was moaning. I guess dogs do love petting, huh? Meanwhile on Haku's side. Have the monsters move in formation, said Chloe the butler and the strategist. Understood. Somewhere, a pitfall's covering collapsed after a lizard man and two goblins all stepped on it at once. It appears to be a target-dependent pitfall. It is quite the expensive trap, DP wise, said one of the Haku's retainers in a worried tone. Does he want to end it early? said the other. Haku didn't let that slip her by. Wait a second, play it again. Yes, my lady. I see now. I believe the pitfall covers are collapsing based on weight. That's why the goblins haven't been falling. Ah, yes. That explains what's happening, and such a covering could be mass-produced for little DP. That man certainly is clever. There should be empty air beneath the pitfall covers. It will take some time but please advance slowly while hitting the floor and listening for any changes. Understood. Goblins, do it. My goodness. Clever indeed. I can't think of a better way to buy time than this. But now that we know how it works, we have nothing to fear. The goblins advance through the dungeon, hitting the floor and sometimes breaking the pitfall covers. We've conquered the enemy dungeon's first floor. Now, how are things on our dungeon side? The enemy troops have reached the third floor and our flamethrowers are holding many of the rats back. The flamethrower traps were indeed just flamethrowers that spat out fire. This time, Haku had chosen flamethrowers that turned on and off in a set pattern. If she set them to fire constantly, they would soon jam up and become completely useless. Having them pause temporarily on a regular basis was necessary. The lizard men we went out of our way to get aren't proving to be very helpful against rats. How are we doing offensively? The second floor of the enemy dungeon. Is a labyrinth. Truly? He would use a labyrinth to challenge me, the ivory labyrinth? I am impressed, to say the least. Split our troops and begin exploring. Impressed or not, Haku wasn't worried. Labyrinths were effective against adventurers, but not dungeons. Mazes were meaningless in the face of a map, and once the exit was discovered, troops could be directed along the correct path with ease. Oh, it looks like golems are wandering around. 
They're moving in groups of five. Eh, and they have bows? Golems with swords are guarding archers in the back. They're crushing our goblins. What? Golems acting like adventurers? That's quite a sight. We have no choice but to use lizard men against them. Move the goblins as sentries while attacking with lizard men then minotaurs. W what in the world? Those golems have really powerful weapons. They're cutting right through our lizardmen's blades. I can't believe it. The three swordsmen in this golem squad all have magic equipment. What did you just say? These golems. Have magic blades? No matter how economical it was to summon golems, they weren't strong enough to bother equipping them with magic blades. After all, even a low-term magic blade would cost a ton of DP and stronger monsters would make much better use of them. And really now, we've been seeing nothing but golems for a while now. He must truly love golems. Is he using them out of favoritism or something of the sort? If so, that lack of seriousness will prove to be his undoing. Gather our troops and crush the golems between our minotaurs. Understood. W8. What? H. Hold on. The map is acting weird. Why is there a wall right there? What? The map showed a passageway, but looking through the monster's perspectives, no such passageway could be found. And as they tried to figure out what was going on, their gathering troops were being steadily cut down. No way. Is this an illusory labyrinth? No way, one of this size would cost way more than 100,000 DP. Perhaps he isolated only a few crucial areas to be mobile. If so, he could buy one with only 50. No, 40,000 DP. Hopefully that is the case, and that would make this his last line of defense. Haku genuinely admired Kaima's strategical skill. He had used his small pool of DP quite efficiently. Contestant Haku of the White Labyrinth guesses that the trap cost is 50,000 DP. The guess will decide the outcome of the match. Kaima sighed two days ago. The building of the second floor. So, um, are we really going to dig out the basement floor? That seems like a lot of work. Why don't we just get rid of all the clay and stuff with DP? Cause that'd be a waste. I want that clay for golem making. I intended to make the basement floor and second floor. In other words, the second and third floors of our dungeon labyrinthine in nature, which meant adding a bunch of complex, interweaving hallways. Rokuko, you're the only one other than me who can use the map to give detailed instructions to the golems. I'm counting on you. Okay, sure. So naturally, my main role in the operation was making more golems as the dungeon got mined out. I let Rokuko and Meek give the mining golems more detailed instructions while I focused entirely on making new golems. The only problem was that my natural mana regeneration couldn't keep up with how fast I was making golems, so I was drinking mana potions 150 dp pretty much constantly. NGH so bitter? My body must have been absorbing the potions as soon as I drank them, as the liquid didn't build up in my stomach. I could drink as much of them as I wanted, no problem. I should just buy a barrel of this stuff. A barrel. Of mana potions. Oh, looks like mana potion was added as an option under the barrel of liquid item path. Seriously? It only costs 1000 DP too. That's an absolute steal. Maybe the glass on the normal mana potions is expensive? It does look like it's made of crystal glass. Soon, I selected the Add a Floor, 5000 DP, option from the menu. I added one basement floor and one upper floor. If I had equipped the sword-wielding golems with mass-produced golem blades. They were made of stone with only the blade being iron, which helped save a lot of DP since I could make several golem blades from a single iron ingot. The stone was free, as it could be mined from the dungeon walls. I had made the bows without putting much effort into them. The arrows, too, I had made from whatever stuff I found lying around. I would have been that lazy with the bows, too, but since the arrows flew better with wooden bows, I cut down some trees and made the bows out of them. And last but not least. All right. Let's move you from here. The wall golems weren't found out. Hey, Kaima, 
Aren't those wall golems only as thick as the floor golems? Instead of feet I gave them wheels, and like this we can have them go in circles all we want. This self-propelled golem costs zero dp. Combining mana labor and harvested materials, it needs no magic stones as long as it's used within the dungeon. Thinks these walls are largest obstacle she'll face. Will this mistake cost her? Haku's guess 50,000 dp. Actual price 0 dp. I see a door right away on the second above ground floor. The staircase led them right to a room with a large door in it. By borrowing the vision of their monsters, they saw just how firm and durable the door looked. I can't believe that we have to climb back up a floor now. I thought perhaps the third floor would return to more standard practices, but instead, the labyrinth continues up to the second floor. It might be wise to employ this man not as an adventurer, but as a dungeon advisor. If by the time Haku conquered the labyrinth, invaders had already surpassed the third floor of her own, ivory proving grounds. There were still over 150 rats still alive. They were cleverly and effectively avoiding the flamethrowers, as if someone was giving them detailed instructions. But even so, thanks to all the lizard men she had gathered in the staircase room, many of the rats had perished. Well, mere rats won't be able to beat the boss of the dungeon, the Red Minotaur. We don't need to worry too much, let's focus on offense. At the very bottom of the white trial, you have to beat the boss to open the door. That, and a brightly colored sign right beside it. What is written on it? Um. It appears to be a riddle. I'll read it out loud. The answer is simple. You mustn't think too hard about this. Please tell me how to split one silver coin between three people. And that's it. How to split one silver coin between three people. Um, one silver coin is worth 100 copper coins, so. Haku smiled as she watched Dolce start to count on her fingers. I know the answer to this. First, you convert the silver coin into 100 copper coins. Then, you hand the copper coins one by one to each individual, and give the final copper coin to whoever handed out the coins as payment for their labor. In other words, two of them get 33 copper coins, and the third one gets 34. A question as simple as that was nothing to Haku, an experienced dungeon core with a long history of dealing with riddles and puzzles. Fantastic, my lady. That answer certainly satisfies the question. I could not imagine a more perfect answer. And there you have it. Open up, door. A riddle of this level would never be able to stop our lady. Dungeon core number 89. The floor beneath their monsters collapsed. Eh? What? But how? An uncomfortable atmosphere filled the ivory proving grounds core room. The entire floor of the puzzle room was a pitfall and it led to the entrance floor. But why? My answer should have been perfect. Oh, let's just calm down. I mean, look, our entire army wasn't in the room, so we're still safe. We can solve this really soon. You, um, how many were wounded in the fall? Ah. Uh, er, one of the minotaurs broke his ankle. He won't be able to fight anymore. Two of the minotaurs died from the fall, and... All three lizard men survived. But every goblin that fell died. To list off the survivors, we have six minotaurs, twelve lizard men. Minus the three that fell. And eight goblins left. Haku squeezed her fists tightly and choked out her next order. Use the three surviving lizard men to carry away the wounded minotaur. NGH. I cannot believe I failed after being so confident in my answer. This is humiliating. I'll rip apart the wounded minotaur and mount his corpse on my wall so I never forget this shame. And my lady, let's try answering the riddle again, using only a single goblin. We can move our entire army again if we answer it correctly. B but that would be shameful in its cowardice. You do realize that number 695 is watching us, don't you? I think we should prioritize winning here. Th they v conquered the fourth floor. The rats are moving like trained soldiers. We can't stop them. My lady. Chloe was silently begging Haku to realize that there was simply no time. And Haku, experienced as she was, made her decision. Very well. We will boldly, boldly, use goblins here. Hashtag Kaima's perspective. Hey, Kaima. 
Isn't this riddle the one that I? Yep. This is the one you solved in three seconds, Rokuko. You're incredible. I'm sincerely impressed. You didn't even read the entire riddle before answering. W.L., that's because it told me the answer at the start. I can't believe number 89 is struggling so much with it. This kind of riddle is harder the smarter you are. Once you get stuck, it's really hard to realize what's going on. And I mean, wow, your older sister really is smart. I'm actually really impressed with all the wild answers she's thinking up on the spot. I watched Haku's troops out of the corner of Maya while guiding the rats through her dungeon. The extra copper coin becomes the party's shared property, while the other 99 coins are split equally. Poof, whoosh. Crash. Two of the party members are slaves, and their owner gets to keep all the money to himself. Poof, whoosh. Crash. Due to a wrong answer, another goblin fell down the pitfall. Gah! My lady! Haku had completely fallen into the puzzle's trap. No matter how hard or long she thought, every answer was wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. NGH, how fearsome. I didn't expect such a psychological attack during a dungeon battle like this. Um, my lady. Is this truly a gate of wisdom? A gate of wisdom is a special dungeon trap that tests the wisdom of invading adventurers. It was an incredibly sturdy door but anyone could pass through it if they solved its riddle. Haku had challenged the riddle on the plaque assuming that the door before her was in fact a gate of wisdom. W.H. what? Do you have any evidence that it is not, Chloe? Indeed. First of all, I question the veracity of any puzzle that one with a mind as strong as yours could not solve, my lady. And secondly, I must also question whether Kaima would have enough DP to purchase a gate of wisdom considering how expensive the traps before this one have been. Indeed. Haku herself had said, I doubt there will be any significant traps beyond this point. After overcoming the labyrinth, a gate of wisdom would, at the very least, cost 30,000 DP. The simpler the riddle the more sturdy it would be, and the harder the riddle the more fragile it would be. It would cost large amounts of DP to keep the door sturdy with such a difficult riddle. This was quite an expensive trap for a battle of only 100,000 DP. Which means, this is, it is quite possible that it is simply an ordinary door that he expected to be broken. Or perhaps it is a trap where attempting to answer the question in front of it will cause the floor to open. That would be an absolutely devilish trap. No matter how many times you attempted to answer the riddle, the door would never open, even if your answer was correct. The moment you stopped to think about the riddle, you had already lost. And my goodness, this is just frightening. W.H. What in the world is wrong with Kaima's head? I've never seen a trap as unfair as this one. It's just cowardly. But truly, I am impressed you saw through it, Chloe. You supported me when my vision grew too narrow, just as I'd expect from my right-hand woman. Your praise honors me beyond words. Um... Misha, the pink-haired war cat, hesitantly raised her hand. Among all the five retainers in the master room, she was the least suited to solving riddles. To put it simply, she was an airhead. Haku directed a bright, visibly angry smile towards her. What is it, Misha? I've already decided to destroy this door through righteous violence. Are you trying to get in my way? I would never dream of that. It's just, um, I was thinking. Maybe the answer to the riddle is just, simple. H.M.? Simple. W.H. What are you talking about, Misha? Oh, I see. It is true that this is quite a simple trap at heart. It merely presents a question without an answer. And no, that's not what I mean. Um, it says right there at the start that the answer is simple, doesn't it? The air froze. And no way. Ha ha ha, that'd be ridiculous. GG's, Misha, what kind of idea is that? Seriously, Misha, that's just... Their voices were stiff and shaky. By this point, all the retainers were thinking that might actually be the right answer. The retainers. And Haku herself, too. Even Chloe. Chloe. I will give the riddle one more try. Understood. Haku gave the last answer herself, 
prepared for her heart to shatter if that was indeed the correct answer. The answer is simple. Ding! The door made a sound, signifying that it had been unlocked. Haku's heart shattered. The gate of wisdom slowly opened. Haku gathered her shattered heart together as best she could and tried peering through the door. But couldn't. Reason being, there was a solid wall on the other side of the door. And on that solid wall was a sign with, under construction, written on it. Haku's shattered heart exploded. Hashtag Kaima's perspective. Oh nice, she figured it out. Hey, why'd you end the dungeon there anyway? Weren't you going to make a whole floor there? Yeah, but I actually ran out of time before I could finish it. A and not because I was sleeping, okay? Seriously. Rokuko shook her head, clearly thinking. Ah, uh, he totally slept instead of making it. Rokuko checked the map to confirm that there was nothing on the top floor before looking at me. Unable to bear her narrowed eyes, I changed the subject. To tell the truth, I gave up on the riddle after you solved it instantly. I figured it would be best to just be bold and not make the floor at all. How is that bold? I just thought it'd surprise them, basically. Well, it is pretty surprising. Who would end a massive labyrinth with a dead end? But anyway, where do they even go from there? I hid one dummy core in a pitfall and three in the labyrinth. They walked by every single one. Two of them were in small rooms pushing out of the square-shaped labyrinth and one was in the ceiling. Haku didn't notice them since I had hidden them behind wall golems. The dungeon would cease functioning if the real dungeon core were hidden behind a wall, so if I needed to use the castling function to swap it with one of the dummy cores, I would just make the wall golem them move out of the way. As an aside, the dungeon core wouldn't be considered blocked off as long as there was a door to its location. I didn't really know the exact logic behind it, but surrounding it with wall golems was a clear no-go. No idea why, though. But my thoughts were interrupted by our units finding the boss room. I was genuinely stunned that our rats had made it that far into the dungeon. Grawa. Within the boss room was a minotaur. But not just any minotaur. The minotaurs that invaded our dungeon all had brown fur like you would expect, but this minotaur had red fur. Making it a red minotaur. This guy sure is red. But why red? Is he super shy or something? Yep, he's red. I think monsters of the fire element usually end up being red. And you can count on fire monsters having high attack power. That's their thing. Indeed, the red minotaur was snorting fire out of his nose. We can't just ignore him and slip into the next room, can we? No way. The door out won't open until you beat the boss. Our gray rats were facing a red minotaur as their final opponent. There's an idiom that goes like, A cornered mouse will bite a cat. Hopefully being cornered gives our rat pals here enough courage to beat this red, muscular cow. gra The red minotaur swung his metal club sideways, scraping it against the floor. Our rats were blown back in all directions, as if they had been packed tight into a water balloon that just burst. Several of them managed to escape by jumping away, but nonetheless, over fifty rats had died in a single swipe. Oh shit. That was almost half of them. Kaima, are you going to use your secret weapon now? Nah, it's not an actual weapon or anything. It won't help us here. Meet. Prepare our second wave, the Golem Platoon. I hadn't expected the rats to reach the core alone so I had prepared a platoon of golems equipped for dungeon invasion. But could they beat the red minotaur either? Golems weren't fast. They'd be crushed beneath his club just like the rats were. They were ultimately just dolls made of clay and stone, after all. I guess the story of Kaima the adventurer begins here. Wait, Kaima. I have an idea on how to win this. Can we try it out? Rokuko smirked confidently, her tone dripping with pride. Huh? Tell me what the idea is first. Okay. Listen up, because I'm about to tell you something amazing. Believe it or not, minotaurs die if their heads come off. Uh, I think that's true for basically every living thing, not just minotaurs. Guess I should use the last of our DP to buy some nice tools that'll be useful while I'm working in Haku's dungeon. So basically, 
we should just focus on attacking its head. Even gray rats should be able to do some damage then. I do know about that. Won't the fire from his nose just burn them all to death? Not if they clog his nose and stop him from breathing. That's not what. I, wait, hold on. Stop him from breathing, huh? All right. Let's give it a shot. I watched the roaring minotaur closely while giving orders to the rats. All units, attack the specified point. The rats surrounding the minotaur all charged forward. Experienced as gray rats were with climbing even steep cliff faces, the minotaur's legs proved to be no more than ladders assisting their ascent. The red minotaur swung his body around to try and knock them off, but he couldn't shake them all off. Five rats managed to reach his head. The red minotaur tried to spit out fire. But him preparing to spit out fire was exactly the opening I was waiting for. I sent two rats towards his large nose, and soon both of his nostrils were clogged. The minotaur immediately opened his mouth to suck in air. And as he did so, I sent the other three rats straight into his mouth. Wait, what? Kaima, he ate them. Nope. This is what I was banking on, Rokuko. Now that they're in his throat, I'm gonna order them to keep still and block it up. The rats obeyed my orders and kept still, clogging the red minotaur's air duct. Unable to breathe, the red monster could do nothing but flail his body around in a rampage. He crushed the rats in his nose with his hands, but it was too late. He couldn't even roar with his throat blocked up. Helpless, he fell to his knees and gripped his throat. His club fell from his hand and noisily hit the floor. He then tried to pull the rats out of his throat. But his hands were too big and his fingers couldn't reach deep enough inside. He tried throwing up, but his air duct was so solidly blocked that he couldn't even manage that. Saliva flew out of his mouth as he writhed helplessly. And then, after a few minutes passed, his arms weakly fell to the floor and his body started to twitch. One more minute was all it took before the door to the next room opened up. The rats that had been in his throat climbed out of his mouth, covered in minotaur saliva but still alive. Well, we won. Yep. We won. Minotaurs die if you clog their throats, I guess? Uh, I think basically any living thing will die if you clog their throat. Really? That's good to know. Enemy or not, holy crap. I feel bad about suffocating that thing to death with rats. Jeez. I ordered the rats to advance while praying for the red minotaur to have a peaceful afterlife. We still had twenty-seven rats remaining. All we had to do was find the dungeon core, and it had to be in the room right after the boss room. As expected, the next room was the core room. In the middle of it rested a familiar-looking, basketball-sized orb. There was Haku's dummy core with nothing standing between its pedestal and my rats. We can win this. I ordered the rats to jump at it, but someone appeared out of the dummy core at the last moment. It was. Chloe, wielding a spear. You can teleport out of dummy cores too, huh? I didn't know that. I could have made a lot more golems if I had known. I can already see the endless flow of golems appearing from seemingly nowhere in the labyrinth. Wait, hold up. Are you telling me they have a second last line of defense? That's breaking some kind of rule, isn't it? Wait, it doesn't matter. She's full of openings. We can sneak a rat past her. Or so I thought, the exact moment before Chloe. Protect me, flame wall! Crackling fire roared up around the core in a circular fashion, turning the five rats I had sent charging to ash. Oh man, this is too much. I guess the red minotaur was just for show and this is the real last boss, huh? Come on. Hashtag Haku's perspective. Just in time, I see. Protect me, flame wall. That one short chant was all it took for a wall of fire to sprout out from the floor and surround the core. The rats all backed off after witnessing those at the front burn to death. Such was the power of Haku's magic spear, the flame wall spear. First of all, Haku. She was frozen with a smile on her face. I didn't think the boss monster would be beaten by the likes of rats. I know she has my spell lance, but we can't let our guard down. We have not lost yet. Have our attacking units continue their search? 
Understood. My lady, I should be able to save some time with this. How will they move now, I wonder? Chloe began thinking to herself. At most, she expected the rats to bundle together and try charging through the wall of flames. She took a good look at the enemy and saw that the rats were indeed bundling together. Very well. I shall counter their charge. If I ready myself, there's nothing I can handle. It used the wielder's mana to cast the high-rank fire spell flame wall after a keyword was said. Indeed, it was literally a magical spear. And a rare one, too. If one were to offer up even a single, flame wall spear, to a dungeon, one would easily earn one hundred million dp. It was a treasure among treasures. It was one of Haku's favored weapons, an impressive feat considering the massive size of her collection. How could the rats possibly break through? There are no gaps in the advanced spell firewall. In the such a situation, there is just one thing the rats can do. As I thought here they come. Chloe readied herself as the horde of about thirty rats charged her. With the right frame of mind, even the trickiest situation is nothing. This formation is easily dealt, Chloe. As Chloe was fighting and thinking to herself, she heard the voice of Dolch telepathically. Chloe! No, look behind you. The enemy is behind you. There's five of them. What? She turned around, but didn't see anything. She looked for the enemy, but could find nothing. There was nothing behind her. But she said there were five of them. The flames swayed in the air, as if reflecting Chloe's panic. What in the world? Ah. Uh, Chloe. They touched the core. What? But how? She didn't understand anything. The strength drained from her body and the flame wall dissipated. Chloe had failed to fulfill her promise with her lord. That reality hit her with a harsh sense of loss and emptiness. But she kept the spear gripped firmly within her hand. What? What the blazes just happened? I don't know. All I know is that there definitely was five enemies approaching the core. You may have misjudged. Double check the records. They were panicking as no one knows what happened. Well done, said Haku with satisfied smile on her face. She didn't know what had happened, and she felt a need to figure it out. The flames faded slowly, and she noticed that something was resting on top of the dimly glowing dummy core. What? Is that? There she saw something that looked like a transparent, square bug. It was unlike anything she had seen before. We we won, didn't we? Yeah, it seems so. Hooray. After my confirmation Rococo cheered up, she was so happy she basically starts dancing. I'm so glad I prepared that secret weapon. The wall of flame that flame wall produced was impressive, but not perfect. It sprouted from the floor and went up a good distance, but it didn't reach the ceiling. Oh, so that's what those weird things were for. I knew you could do it, master. Hey, don't call them weird. They're called drones, in my word, and they're like tiny helicopters. Okay, yeah? They look weird in this world. I had originally intended for the drones to help the rats reach locations they couldn't on their own while exploring the dungeon. Making them transparent was just a side thing. I just happened to have a bunch of empty mana potions lying around, so I tried making the drone out of the clear glass bottles and things went surprisingly well. The result? My ultimate secret weapon, the stealth drone capsule. I had made them with only a single material, and thanks to them being golems, they didn't even need a power source. And miraculously enough, I made them just large enough for rats to fit inside of them. Though, it was such a tight squeeze that I had to break the drones to get the rats out. I felt kind of bad about that, but we won thanks to it. Hopefully the rats forgave me. Long story short, we didn't have to actually beat Chloe like we did the Red Minotaur. And thanks to the drones being clear, they were very hard to see, especially in the middle of a bunch of roaring flames. It was a bit difficult to pilot the drones while they were buffeted by hot wind, but I managed to land one of them on the core. Things would have gotten real bad real fast if I had missed it. Either way, I successfully made the touchdown. We had won. You defeated me. Following the battle, Haku visited our ordinary cave once again. Chloe was of course with her, wearing the same butler outfit as always. 
I may have lost, but that was a battle with much for me to learn from. Never would I have thought that gray rats had so much potential within them, both as scouts and as warriors. I had known the rats would serve as excellent scouts, but I honestly hadn't expected at all that they would beat the boss on their own. By the way, I sent the surviving rats into the forest and ordered them to survive for as long as possible. I might end up using them again sometime. I'm sure they'll grow in numbers if I leave them alone for a bit. I truly did not anticipate being unable to find even a single one of your dummy cores. Where did you end up hiding your dungeon core? Would you be kind enough to tell me? Sure, if you pay me an extra 50,000 DP. Oh my, that little? Very well. Please tell me. I won't be able to sleep at this rate. Whoops. I said that as a joke, but she's actually planning to pay me. Guess I have to tell her now. I'll keep where I hid the dummy cores a secret for now, though. But I had actually hidden the real dungeon core in such a silly place that I was worried Haku would get mad at me. Fearing the worst, I answered her. Well, to tell the truth, our dungeon actually wraps around the outside of the mountain. There's a small room about one kilometer away from here. I put the core in there. I pointed in the direction of the goblin room from forever ago. My initial plan involved Haku noticing that immediately and going straight towards it, but in the end, I never had to move our dungeon core even a single time. And as expected, Haku was stunned to hear that. But she didn't seem mad at all. Rather, she just seemed to be sincerely impressed. It's true. Now that I'm paying attention to it, I can sense the mana in that direction. I can't believe that you extended your dungeon not only to the field outside of the cave's entrance, but that far around the mountain as well. I didn't notice that at all. In other words, you put the dungeon core in a single room connected directly to the outside. What a bold move. My lady, I am quite surprised as well. I knew number 89's strategies were right. Ah, uh, I don't know how you came to that conclusion, Rokuko, but you're definitely wrong. There's a big difference between using a hidden room off to the side and having your whole dungeon just be a single room. Come on. Ha. Huh. Your labyrinth was impressive as well, filled with tricks even I've never seen before. Even your pitfalls were cleverly inventive. Though I do wish to note a flaw in placing weight-based pitfalls on your first floor. I use minotaurs as my primary offensive might this time, but I also have armies based on weightless wraiths. I believe it would have been better to place those pitfalls on the second floor and with plans to adjust them according to which troops I send out. Weight-based pitfalls. Oh, those broken covers I made. Those. Those were just an accident. I accidentally doubled the thickness of the golem covering a few times due to lack of sleep. The fact they wouldn't break under goblins but would under minotaurs was basically just lucky. I'll keep quiet about that, though, since she went out of her way to give me advice. And it would have been fine for me even if those pitfalls never activated. She just never would have found the secret path in one of them. And also, NGH, was that riddle you used with the Gate of Wisdom from your world? Yep. Honestly, I had a tough time getting that gate thing ready. Not a lot of my riddles worked with it. You know other riddles like that. Well, either way, it was quite a clever trap. May I please punch you in the face just once? Ha ha, nope. She still looked pretty frustrated about getting tricked by that riddle. I decided not to tell her that Rokuko had solved it in three seconds. I'm interested in those riddles you didn't use. They're basically just little word games. Though it looks like they're being translated into your language without my input, so? For example, if I were to say, Go break a leg. To Rokuko, she would hear that as me saying, Go snap the bone in your leg, without comprehending the good luck nuance of the phrase whatsoever. She often just wouldn't quite understand what I was saying. Unfortunately, that meant that even legendary puns were completely lost on her. Following that, a riddle like, What time do you have to go to the dentist? Answer being, 2.30. Wouldn't work with the gate of wisdom. Ah, uh, it seems we've gone quite off subject. There is still much I'd like to discuss with you, but I am unfortunately a fairly busy individual. I built an entire dungeon for this, 
which I now need to take care of. And although I am concerned about that last trick you pulled, it would be exceptionally burish of me to pry that far into another dungeon's secrets, wouldn't it? That last trick. She must be talking about my secret weapon. I wouldn't mind telling her at this point, but she may want to have some fun by trying to figure it out herself. Now then, Rokuko. It's about time for us to exchange DP, isn't it? Why, yuppers? Haku took Rokuko's hand and gave her a gentle, pleased smile. She paid us 150,000 DP in total. Despite talking about how busy she was, she really took her time with the mouth-to-mouth -mouth DP exchange. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself, Haku. Day 34 Haku went home the next day. With the dungeon battle over, I made the decision to get serious about my duties as dungeon master and focus on managing our dungeon. Not. I actually decided to just sleep for a while. We you. I should be able to kick back and relax for a while now. Uh-huh. I'm totally spent after all that. For some reason, Rokuko was resting in a futon laid out next to mine. Eh, whatever. We both worked a lot. I'll let her sleep by me just this once. Master. Huh? What's up, meat? Are you getting too hot? No. I want you to squeeze me tighter. As requested, I hugged meat tightly. Her skin was as smooth and pleasant to the touch as ever. Hold on, Kaima. Listen to what I'm saying, too. And what exactly do you have to talk about? I'm pretty sleepy right now, you know. Seriously, why do you sleep that much? I'm really surprised you actually managed to beat Haku like this. What can I say? I won because I'm in love. E.H.? W.H. What's with you all of a sudden? Rokuko began to panic a little, stammering nervously. Huh? You're the one who asked how I can sleep so much? I just love sleeping. Oh, that's what you were talking about. I totally thought, um, you were saying you loved me or something. Well, yeah? I love you too, Rokuko. Mind if I rub your feet? Actually, just let me rub your feet. No way. Rokuko turned me down, blushing. Eh, all right. I'm gonna sleep then. Hey, Kaima. Are you going to stay with me? You're not going to go anywhere, right? Rokuko spoke to me in a sweet voice, as if seeking comfort. My heart thumped. What, do you want me to leave? No way. Melon rolls don't taste as good without you around, Kaima. I don't know what she's talking about, but all right. I feel like I could sleep all day today. So let's do it. Day 37 Haku had given us 150,000 DP as a reward for defeating her in the dungeon battle. Since we had 30,000 DP left over from the battle itself. Minus the 10,000 DP I gave to Rokuko to do whatever she wanted with. We had in total 170,000 DP to do with as we pleased. I figured it would be best to use all that easy money, DP, actually, to prepare for the future. What project, you ask? With the dungeon as its center will become a rest area. Since I am a dungeon master, what I need to live is DP instead of money. That is why I want to restructure the dungeon to guarantee a stable DP income. We have an example of that working out in Haku's white labyrinth using the capital. People gather at the capital and since the capital itself is part of the dungeon, she gains DP. The DP she collects goes back into expanding the dungeon, which allows for bigger treasures, which in turn attracts more people. There's no way we can completely replicate the white labyrinth, but there's nothing wrong applying the concept at a smaller scale. So then what are you gonna do? asked Rococo. Let me explain. All we have to do is have people stay in the dungeon for a long time. However, Forcibly trapping people is a silly move, I shall make them want to stay of their own free will. We just build an inn, we will make this whole area of the, the dungeon and build an inn there, so we will get both the DP and money from the people who stay. First of all, we will set up the area outside the dungeon, then behind it we can make a field to grow rare plants or something as another revenue stream. So how do we do it? asked Rococo. How do we do what? I asked her back. We will need an innkeeper, right? How about the workers? Is it that slave and me who will work? What I needed was a person. A person that could interact with customers. 
Right now, my squad consisted of me, two lolas, a bunch of golems, and a ton of rats. We weren't equipped to deal with customers. For starters, I had no intention of sitting behind a counter and dealing with customers. At the same time, customers wouldn't take the in seriously if they were greeted by receptionists lolas. Customer service was too complicated for golems, and rats were just out of the question. To make things worse, Arin was in truth part of a dungeon. There were countless secrets we needed to hide, and we couldn't just tell a normal person to keep those secrets. Then how was I going to find help? Yep, you guessed it. Slaves. I would buy a slave. I would need to feed and shelter the slave, but thanks to contract magic, I didn't need to worry about them spilling secrets or avoiding work. Meat was proof that a well-raised slave would become an excellent worker. So, I'm going to town, and I'm planning on buying a new slave while I'm there. Am I not good enough? Meat raised her voice in panic. That may have been the first time I had seen Meat really assert herself. I learned how to read and even use magic. Aye. I'll be even more useful to you, master. Even at night, I'll. I'll be an even better Dakimakura for you, so please. Er, uh, thanks. I really appreciate that. Self-improvement is always a good thing. Good luck. And while you're at it, spend some time thinking about how you'll help your fellow slave get used to how things work here. W-H what? Why you're... You're not going to sell me? Of course not. I won't sell you. So calm down. Why are you stripping? Why? I calmed the panicky meat down and stopped her from stripping. I wouldn't have taught you magic if I planned on selling you to begin with. Plus, you know way too much about our dungeon and what's going on behind it. At this point, I'm gonna have to keep you here forever. Th then, I get to be your slave for the rest of my life, right? Meat spoke happily while wiping away her tears. Yeah, pretty much, but uh... Well, whatever. If she's happy about that, I'll just be happy for her. Hey, just so you know... There are ways to keep being his slave even after you die. The King Rank Darkness spell called Necromancy can help with that. Yes, please use that on me. Rokuko, come on. Did you really have to say that? And, according to the catalog, a Necromancy scroll costs about 800 million DP. We're not buying that anytime soon. Day 38. Since we are going into the town, we had to prepare. I decided to use extra DP we had on hand to learn a few spells. Rokuko came up to me pouting while I was in the middle of packing for the trip. Hey, Kaima. You're really going to that town again? Huh? Yeah. Sorry, but you're gonna have to hold down the fort while I'm gone. I don't want to leave our dungeon alone with just a bunch of golems and rats protecting it. Okay. Not. Did you really think I'd be okay with this? I'm going too. Uh, I mean. Do you really want to leave our dungeon alone with golems and rats? There are goblins too. Why do you always overrate goblins so much? What's so good about them? Would it really be so bad for me to go with you? I mean, nobody's going to come by while we're gone. Well, she's got a point. And if someone does come, they'll probably just be a low-rank adventurer. No A-rank adventurer other than Haku is gonna be rushing down here to explore, ordinary cave. Plus, the guild is still protecting our dungeon, so... Yeah. I'll put the dungeon core as deep into the dungeon as possible for safety and order the golems to protect it no matter what. We should be safe for a day or two that way. All right. You can come with us. Yay. I've never been to a human city before. Rokuko instantly gave me a bright smile. Seeing her so happy and cute made me somewhat blush a little. Ahem, first off, you gotta prepare too. These are the scrolls for elementary magic, right? Yep, I will just learn all the elements for now. You never know when it will come in useful. I bought scrolls of all the elements there was. Earth, water, wind, fire, light, dark, and minimal space-time element, and a spell called wallet, which let me store my money. Oh yeah, Haku also recommended this intermediate space-time spell, storage. As the name implies it lets me store things in a different dimension, and that dimension time also freezes. Speaking of, here we go. 
I put my bedding in the storage so I don't have to sleep on hard beds in those inns. Hey, why are you putting the bedding in? Rokuko shouted at me. Because the town's beds are hard, there are usually some bugs too. Put mine too, please. So, after finishing packing, I went to Tsaya City again with meat and Rokuko. I briefly wondered if the living avatar of a dungeon core would be fine leaving their dungeon, but then I remembered that Haku was walking around outside without any issue. Apparently, everything would be okay as long as that shining rock stayed inside the dungeon. We were inside Tsaya. I decided to start things off by heading to the guild, where I could both register Rokuko as an adventurer and get info on where I could buy a slave. The same receptionist as usual was sitting behind the guild's front counter. Oh my, I see you're still alive. Welcome back. I'd like you to register this girl as an adventurer. Hold on a second, Kaima. Why were you calling me this girl? I have a name. You two seem to be close. Very well. I will give her the interview. Rokuko quickly finished the interview and became an adventurer with no issue. Now Rokuko has an excuse to be hanging around humans too. We did lose some of our slave-buying funds, though. Oh, right. I want to buy a slave. Do you know where I could get one? I tried asking the receptionist about the slave market. I could probably rely on the Adventurer's Guild introducing me to a good place to buy slaves. It was apparently fairly common for adventurers to use slaves. It depends on what you wish to use the slave for. Do you have any plans for them? Yeah, a few. I want one with a lot of life experience. Preferably a smart one, too. And... Right. They have to be a girl. Hey, don't look at me. I'm just following Haku's instructions. She was really serious about me not buying a male slave. It was pretty obvious that she didn't even want me close to Rokuko. I wouldn't mind either way, but Haku's a pretty important patron. I don't want to get on her bad side. Trust me. I'm not trying to make a harem here. I swear. I have no interest in the carnal desires of flesh. I'm not exploiting this situation to get my hands on a girl slave with beautiful feet. I want to lick her feet. Ah, crap, the truth slipped out. My thoughts were interrupted by the receptionist shaking her head in exasperation and telling me what I wanted to know. If you have enough funds a slave market within the city is preferable, but if not, you could also try finding a black market slave trader in the slums. Though the guild will not be able to introduce you to such a trader. I have a little under one gold to spend on a slave. In that case, I recommend Dokasp's slave market within the city. And by the way, if you are looking for an experienced slave, you could try checking the local brothel to see if they are selling any of their slaves today. Ah, uh, no, I didn't mean it like that. We left the guild and immediately went to Daskop's slave market. Rokuko stopped by several stands on the way, so it took a long time for us to get there. And so, we reached the slave market without buying anything on the way. We needed our money for the slave, after all. I looked the place over and... Yep. They may be selling slaves, but this place just looks like a normal old brick building. This place is very different from where I was. Huh, you really were sold to those bandits. What kind of place were you kept in? Um, it was a really dirty place outside the gates. Nothing was gonna happen if we just stood around, so I went into the building with Rokuko and meat. All right. It's shopping time. The moment we entered the building, we saw a counter with a slave standing behind it. Welcome to our establishment. I am the owner of this establishment, Dokasp. Valued customer, I heard that you would like to buy a slave on this fine day. The shop owner gave us a smooth business smile. So, what kind of slave are you looking for? Mm, first of all, I want a girl with really pretty feet. I have lots of things I want her to do, so her being smart would be a huge plus. Rokuko punched me in the side after she heard me casually include pretty feet as a criteria. Hold on, Kaima. Why did you mention pretty feet? And as the first thing, too. Sorry, my friend, but could you keep quiet while I'm negotiating? This is actually an extremely high-level bartering technique. It'll play a very important role in us finding the slave we need. Really? Yeah. 
I'm too busy to explain how right now. So please keep quiet for a bit. Rokuko nodded, though her expression was conflicted enough that I couldn't tell if my answer had satisfied her. But either way, it looked like she'd stay silent for me. Perfect. And came back after a brief while with four women in tow. Judging from their collars, they were all slaves. Yep. They all have fantastic legs and feet, every one of them. Spectacular. Starting from the left, the slaves were a bearer bee skin, a foxered bee skin with a fluffy tail, a vaguely unhappy elf, and a normal human. For whatever reason, they were all eyeing me over as if they were the ones buying me, instead of the other way around. Sup, Palya looking fair a slave? How about me? I'm a great deal. The human girl slave talked to me, for which the slaver used the collar on her neck and tightened it. Hey, don't speak out of the turn, said the slaver choking her a little. Sorry about this one, she is quite a handful, but at sixty silvers, she is the cheapest of the group. A handful? I asked. She had fallen into slavery after being unable to repay a loan she took out for gambling and extravagant foods. Her last owner returned her after she wounded him. The man who bought her said that he'd give her. What sort of the injury was it? Out of curiosity, I asked the slaver. The man who bought her said that he'd give her. A real tasty meal. But then came back the next day saying that she had bit his, uh, member. The slave herself, when questioned, would only say, It tasted like Toto Garbo. Give me my money back. I'm pretty sure that's what the guy you bit should be saying. The slave collar didn't stop her in time. Don't worry, though, the collar still works. Ouch. I am sure every man who heard it must have felt that man's pain. She certainly did have a nice and shapely body, with healthy curves where you'd want curves and a narrow waist to boot. Her hair was blonde with a hint of red, as was common in this area. Visually, she was a feast. Though I was satisfied with her beautiful feet alone. And to be honest, having a buster receptionist with a pretty face was more than ideal. So how did it turn out? I let that turbo jerk by me cause he said he'd give me some tasty food. Can you blame me for doing what I did when he shoved that nasty thing in front of me the second we got back to his place? I was super hungry and really looking forward to whatever good stuff he had ready for me. Really, like, did I have any other choice but to give it a bite and see if it really did taste good? But you know, trust me, if he actually gave me a good meal and filled up my belly first, I definitely wouldn't have pulled any tricks like that. You scratch my back and I'll scratch yours, Kay? What the hell? This slave sure has a big personality. I would do basically anything for the sake of sleeping. I care more about food than my own life. I'll like, die if it means eating a good meal. For real. I like her. Well, she's the cheapest one, so I feel like buying her would be smart. I think so, too. Plus, our food is really good. She'll like that. I like this guy. Hey, hey, Mr. Duskup, would you be super-duper nice and lower my price for him? Please? I'm actually worth like forty-five silvers, aren't I? Hey! Don't say that! Calm down, you can spare a bit of that cash, right? At sixty silvers... It'd be making a killing. Stop running your mouth like that. Ah. Uh, you, my valued customer, this is. I mean. The slaver paled and stumbled over his words. Seemed like this girl really was a bit of a handful. I'm buying her. All right, I'm willing to pay fifty silvers for her. I threw the slaver a bone by adding five silvers. Thank you very much. Hell yeah. Trust me, my dude. You have made a fantastic purchase today. Oh yeah, I never asked what your name is. What do people call you? What? The heck are you talking about? Masters name their slaves after buying them. Am I right, Meat? She shifted the conversation to Meat as if she was saying something obvious. But all she got was a confused head tilt. I didn't know about that. What? How didn't you? This is like ultra common sense. Just think about it. What if you bought a slave with the same name as your mom? No matter how much of a sexy babe she is, it'd be awk as heck during nighttime festivities if you know what I'm saying. So, people get rid of their names after being enslaved. Ah. Uh, makes sense. Hey, Kaima. What are nighttime festivities? Uh, nothing. 
Nothing at all. I patted Rokoko's head. Dirty jokes were a no-go around her. I didn't even want to know what Haka would do to me if I started teaching Rokoko about dirty jokes. What did people call you before today? Well, they called me me too, you know? She responded after licking her finger, as if thinking about the flavor or something. A shudder ran down my spine after I realized it might have been the thing she bit. Huh. Let's think of another one for her, Kaima. Yeah. You like eating a lot, don't you? I could name you after some food. How about apple? Or kebab? Apple isn't the worst name I've ever heard, but kebab? No, thanks. She cackled happily with her own large melon swaying side to side. I wonder if meat is just a common name for slaves. What do you think about a chica, boss man? Huh. What's that mean? It's a name I ripped off from the god of food. They're named Ishidaka, and they're also the god of oceans. So, mixing their name with salt, since salt comes from the ocean, we get a chica. Super cool, huh? Oh wow. That's really clever. We definitely bought the right one, Kaima. Rokuko nodded, impressed, but I had no idea how she got Ichika from Mishidaka and Salt. Probably had something to do with the auto translator messing up. Yeah, I'm used to this now. All right, Ichika's good with me. Here's to a long and fruitful relationship. Hee hee hee, you got it. From Nameless to Ichika. We shook hands again. We all headed to the Adventurer's Guild. Do you want me to register you as an adventurer too, Ichika? Having some idea would be pretty useful. Ah, I used to be a C-rank adventurer before falling into slavery, so... I really don't want to start over from G-rank. Plus, this collar works as ID just fine. Ichika pointed to the slave collar around her neck. Oh yeah? Slaves can use their collars as ID, right? Meat and Rokuko are both adventurers. I guess that's good enough for now. By the way, slaves were treated as items and could go with their masters on any quest regardless of their own rank. I thought about just going straight back to the dungeon, but it was late enough that night would fall on the way back. Worst case scenario, we'd end up camping outside for the night before getting home. In which case, it would probably be better to just do some simple quests and relax at an inn for the night. Looks like we're definitely gonna be taking this rabbit hunting quest. We left through the east gate to go rabbit hunting. The gatekeeper didn't charge us anything since we were on a quest. I knew I could expect great results from the master of hunting, Meat, but I was mainly interested in seeing how Ichika did. She was a former C-rank adventurer, after all. Surely I could count on her kicking butt and taking names, especially when delicious food was on the line. Though leaving her barehanded would probably get in the way of that, so I lent her my sword. Oh, thanksies. Well, I'm gonna be real for a second. I can just use my bare hands for this. Rabbits' pelts are worth way less when they're covered in blood. It's just like common sense to kill them without cutting them up too bad. Huh. But you can't bleed them without cutting them. Bleed them? What are you even talking about, dude? Huh. She doesn't know about bleeding animals after hunting them? If you drain the blood from an animal corpse... The meat won't smell so bad later. It'll taste better, too. Raw meat smells so weird because of the blood. Wow. I totally didn't know that. You sure know a lot for someone with no common sense. Huh, meat tastes better if you drain their blood. Yeah. I feel like that's gonna make a lot of meat more tasty for me, Gehei. Ichika immediately started drooling while imagining the taste of delicious, blood-free meat. This girl really is a food monster. What do you do to drain the blood anyway? A little demonstration should show you all you need to know. Meat, go hunt a rabbit for me. Understood. Meat dashed into the forest. And thirty seconds later, she came back with a rabbit. She had sliced its head clean off. I grabbed it by the feet and held it upside down, causing blood to gush out onto the ground. Ew, there's blood everywhere. It stinks, Kaima. Hey, the blood's gotta get out somehow. It'd make the meat stink if we didn't do this. So? What do you think, Achika? Blood starts gushing out after you cut off its head and hang it upside down. You keep hanging it upside down until no more blood comes out. That's it. Simple, right? 
totally. Looks super simple. But like, I'm kinda distracted by how a tiny bean sprout like meat managed to hunt that rabbit. Like, girl, bagging a rabbit in only 30 seconds is crazy fast. Were you a hunter before becoming a slave? Finding rabbits inside a forest is no joke. Eh? It's really simple. I can smell them. Right, right, you're a beast in. I totally get it now. But like. Still, hunting with thin arms like yours must be hard as heck. Ichika was getting caught up in admiring Meat's skill, but it was her turn to hunt. I wanted to see just how skilled she was, so I left the bleeding rabbit to Meat and followed after Ichika. Rokuko waved goodbye as I left. Ichika advanced through the forest, brushing aside branches and occasionally pausing to listen. After about five minutes, she suddenly flipped her blade around in her hand and slid the blade across the ground in a fast, backhanded swipe. Yo, how's this? Oh, whoa, it's bleeding like crazy. Ichika lifted up the headless rabbit by its feet. Looks like she killed it with one smooth blow. Just what I'd expect from a former C-rank adventurer. Yep, you're pretty strong. You cut off its head in one slice. I can tell you're skilled with blades. Yup, you bet. But I used to be a scout, so I'm more used to daggers. I see, so I gotta do this for some great tasting meat, but I wonder if it's fine doing this in the middle of the forest. Hmm? Is there a problem? Well, let's head back. We headed back to meat and Rokuko with the rabbit in tow. Ah, uh, welcome back, master. Meat was standing where I had left her, with the rabbit still in hand. Plus five goblin corpses scattered around her. All five of them had their heads cut clean off. By the way, Rokuko's head was covered with red blood. For a second I thought for sure she had been hurt really badly, but apparently it was all goblin blood that had sprayed onto her. I looked around and, piecing all the clues together, concluded that the goblins had been drawn to meet by the smell of the rabbit blood and attacked her thinking she was just a little girl, only to be completely slaughtered in return. Ah, yeah, I knew it. I definitely felt that there were some goblins sneaking around. Well, waitevs. Not like Meat would have had any problems taking them down. Ichika said that as if it were obvious that goblins had been sneaking around, but I hadn't noticed them at all. Kaima, cast purification, please. Right. Here. I cast purification on Rokuko. A big bubble engulfed her and cleaned off all the blood. But why was Rokuko covered in blood and not meat? She's completely clean. Oh, looks like you killed them all at once, huh? How'd you do that, meat? They were surrounding me, so I held the rabbit in one hand and used my other hand to, um, spin around. Meat reenacted what she did by holding the rabbit in one hand and spinning around on her tippy toes like a ballerina while holding her golem, blade out. The blade was about on the same level as a goblin neck. She was wearing her wearable golem, but I never taught it any moves like that. Huh. I guess she's using her golem to strengthen her movements, instead of just making it do them for her. By the way, I did this to defend myself. Rokuko crouched into a small ball by Nika's feet to get out of her way and covered her head with her hands so poorly it was a little sad. Ah. That's why she got so much blood onto her. Anyway. It looks like we've finished the goblin extermination quest before the rabbit hunting quest. Nice. I cut off the goblin's right ears to show to the guild later. All right, I'll leave hunting the rest of the rabbits to you too. Thanks. Oh? You're not gonna come with, master? I'm not that good with a blade. The customer wants top quality meat, so it'll be better for me to just stay here and focus on bleeding the rabbits. Rokuko's out of the question, obviously. Well, let me tell you, the best kind of food is the kind you don't have to work for. We went to the guild, reported our completed quests, got the money, and went to an inn for the night. In any case, our inn was the sleeping songbird inn, the same one I stayed at last time. To save money, we got one room for all four of us. Wait, hold on. I'm a guy, you know? I'm the only guy here. Can we at least get two rooms? You're my partner, Kaima. It's definitely important for us to sleep in the same room. I'm your Dakimakura, master. I'll sleep together with you. I don't want to be all on my own, so like, I'm just gonna watch and take notes. 
Take notes? Please. I'm not gonna do anything funny. Of course, I bought a normal meal for everyone. No slave meals. The one I bought last time was the only one I ever planned on buying. Ichika grinned as she looked at the food in front of her. Yup, looks like you really are gonna feed me well. I'm like super duper happy. Food's really important to you, isn't it? I know how you feel. I want all the people who work for me to feel good about their jobs. Oh, you want us to feel good, huh? You know, the moment I saw how healthy Nika looked, I knew you were a major score. So yeah? I'm not gonna complain about anything as long as you keep feeding me this well, okay? Seemed like she was thinking of me as a score as well. She gulped down the vegetable soup and wiped up the remaining drops with her bread, leaving nothing behind. She's not wasting anything. She didn't even waste time, saying, Hold up, let me test this for poison. And starting to eat before me. Um, I don't think this tastes very good. Ichika, you can have my share. Oh? For real? I knew I could count on you, my queen Rokuko. I'll follow you for the rest of my life. Rokuko, however, didn't eat her vegetable soup. She must have gotten picky thanks to how good melon rolls taste. In my opinion, the vegetable flavoring in the soup tasted pretty nice. Thank you, thank you. I. So, what are we gonna do now? Just sleep? Yeah, that sounds good to me. You can use the bed if you want, Ichika. Ichika had asked that after getting onto all fours while looking up at me sensually and emphasizing her sizable cleavage, but I ignored her. Why? Ichika tilted her head, as if not understanding what I meant. Ah, right. There's only one bed, so she doesn't know where Rokuko and I will sleep if she gets the bed. I took my futon out of storage and spread it out onto the floor. I'm gonna be sleeping on this. Rokuko, spread out yours too. Okay. Ahaha, sleeping outside feels really exciting, doesn't it? Rokuko took out her futon from storage and spread it out as well. Niku was my Dakimakura, so she didn't need one. Only after both of our futons were ready did the stunned Ichika finally snap out of her shock. Hey, hold up. What's with those crazy good-looking beds? That's the kind of thing super expensive hotels use. Ah, uh, I'm hella surprised here. I can't believe you two have beds this good. And like, what? You two can use storage too? Weren't the scrolls super expensive? Just like you're dead serious about food, I'm dead serious about sleep. Okay. Listen up, whatever you do, don't interrupt my sleep. I'll say it again. No matter what. Do not. Interrupt. My sleep. I emphasized sleep. When I said it. Ichika let out an. Ah. Uh, of understanding. Dude, I hella get what you're saying for real. I'll never wake you up unless junk gets really serious. I swear upon my breakfast, boss man. Now that was a vow I could trust. I nodded in satisfaction. We actually did just sleep. What the heck? Ichika left the hotel while murmuring some nonsense to herself. We arrived at the guild and saw that the morning train, I mean, the morning quest board rush was in full effect. It was ridiculously crowded. She came back. In her hand was the quest slip for the ordinary cave quest. Fantastic. Seemed like it had just been put out on the day we went. Great timing. Our dungeon may be buff as hell now but I don't want any adventurers dropping by before I've finished building the inn. The requirements were two or more F-rank adventurers and the reward was one silver. That's probably the same details as last time, I guess? Oh. Good job, Meat. I rubbed Meat's head causing her tail to wag. Hey, are you like totally sure we're packing enough for a mountain trip? I mean, I know you have storage, but still. I don't really want to use that too much in public, so yeah. I guess preparing a little better would be smart. I handed over two silvers to Ichika. Could you buy enough stuff for us with this? For four people? For sure. Rokoko looked a bit angry to me so I asked her. What's wrong, Rokoko? Isn't the quest reward too cheap? We were able to beat Haku. How can we settle for such a low price? Well, that was cause your elder sister kept things on the down low, 
I was about to say that but Ichika and Meat came back with the supplies. Master, I got us lunch boxes. I guess we head back now. And so, with our preparations complete, we headed to Tsaya Mountain. After we got some distance away from the town, I put all the stuff Ichika bought into storage and started running down the mountain road carrying basically nothing. We took six hours and thirty-two minches to return. The sun started to set on the way there. Ichika was the only one among us without a wearable golem helping her out, but as expected of a former C-rank adventurer, she kept up just fine. Ichika gave some good advice, suggesting that we start setting up camp. May is the year. I'm super hungry. Can we, like, start setting up camp? Oh, whoops. I gotta let her inside before I start thinking about that kind of thing. And now that I think about it, I never even told Ichika where we were going. Nah, we don't need to set up camp. We're here. This is your base, master? I totally though you were talking about a whole village or something. I had been planning on explaining things once we reached the dungeon, but now that we were there, I wasn't sure what exactly to say. Um, this actually is our base. This is a cave, dude. Rokuko just told the truth straight up. Ichika replied with her straight-up feelings. Yeah, can't blame her for thinking that. Let's just go inside. Tired as I was from running for so long, I wanted to sleep as soon as possible. We entered the cave and soon the rocky floors turned into paved stone passageways with dungeon lighting torches, 50 dp, casting bright, flickering lights along the path. As an aside, these dungeon lighting torches would never ever go out as long as you didn't move them from their initial position. They were probably using mana as fuel or something. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hold up! This is totally a dungeon, isn't it? This is a dungeon. What happened to this being your base? Um, it's also our base? This is a freaking dungeon. Yeah, it is a dungeon. Oh, look out. There's a pitfall right over there. Holy crap there is. What the heck, dude? This is freaking dangerous. Ichika dodged the pitfall with an exaggerated leap. Ha, holy cow. I used to be a scout and I still didn't notice that pitfall. Wow, Rokuko. You sure aren't phased by these pitfalls. Aren't you like G-Rank? Well, it's me we're talking about. That's some hella confidence. Rokuko gave a smug smirk. Yep. It's you. The dungeon itself. Oh, wait a sec, this is the ordinary cave, isn't it? I asked the guild about it. But this is totally not like what they told me. It should be super small with nothing in it. That's because the guild has outdated info. They were talking about the ordinary cave from a month ago. Oh, which means? Things changed since then. This dungeon probably had a paradigm shift. We gotta tell the guild about this. A paradigm shift was a dungeon rapidly growing or shrinking in size, as discussed in Intro to Dungeonology. Though that's just fake information meant to disguise the effects of dungeon battles. Air Master? Didn't you buy me for like chores and stuff? Is one of those chores gonna be asking me to be a meat shield while exploring this dungeon? Ichika, watching Rokuko and Niku advance ahead of her, wasn't sure what she should be doing. Nope. I'm gonna have you work in the inn, not help out the adventurers. Oh, don't touch that. Spears shoot out of it. G-A-H. H holy freaking cow. Ah. Uh, w wait up, master. I guess this dungeon really is your base. No way would you be moving this fast if you weren't used to the place. Master doesn't lie. Nika was speedily advancing through the dungeon right in front of Ichika. She too had perfectly memorized the location of each trap. Suddenly it hit me that I could probably just ask Rokuko to withdraw us into the master room. Huh. I guess all this exercise has tired my brain out a little bit. Hey, Rokuko. You can withdraw us, can't you? Sweet, thanks. Take us away to the master room. Eh? Oh, uh, that's right. We don't need to go all the way to the core room. I'll just withdraw us here. What do you mean, withdraw us? My vision was engulfed by a bright light the moment Ichika asked that. My vision blurred and I felt a little floaty. Before long, I was in a familiar old white room. The master room. Our base within Rokuko's true body. 
Ah, I'm so tired. Hey, Kaima. I'm going to just go ahead and sleep right now. I turn just in time to see Rokuko plopping down onto her, futon. Wait, no, that's mine. What gives? She has her own futon. Ch, what the heck? Where are we? Did we step on a teleportation trap or something? Oh, did I not tell you about this already? I'm this dungeon's core. Hold up, hold up. I'm not keeping up with this. You're a dungeon core? You're not a human, Rokuko? Ichika was rubbing her temples. Does this mean? Rokuko is a human-type boss monster dungeon core? I've never heard about something like that. Wait, have I? It looked she was thinking about this as hard as she could, using all the knowledge she had. Unfortunately, the knowledge she had was intentionally spread misinformation, so she was basically doomed. I decided to call out to her and help her along. Hey, Ichika. Ah! Master, are you? A demon king? Where did that come from? And Rokuko is a boss monster dungeon core, a human type one. If you're a demon king, everything makes sense. In truth, Ichika basically had the right idea. According to Haku, the demon kings of this world are all dungeon cores belonging to the demon king faction, one of many dungeon core factions, with a great demon king on top ruling over lesser demon kings who in turn ruled over the rest of the dungeon cores belonging to the faction. In other words, since I had gained control over Rokuko the dungeon core, I was basically a demon king. Maybe. That would make Haku the great demon king. Metaphorically. She wasn't really the great demon king. By the way, dungeon masters don't exist in dungeonology. Instead, there are things known as dungeon bosses. Sometimes it was a strong summon monster, sometimes it was the core itself. Rokuko was a human-type core, but apparently there were many other types, including dragon types. It would be rational to call Rokuko the dungeon boss from that perspective. So, what would you do if I am a demon king? I'll do anything as long as you feed me the good stuff. Are you planning on destroying Tsaya City? Ah, uh, that'd be a waste of food. Let's conquer it instead. In front of me was a woman willing to betray humanity without a second thought in return for good food. Nah, I want to stay on good terms with that city. I don't want to die either. Ha, okay. But think about it for a sec if you conquered the world, we'd be able to eat as much tasty food as we want. How could we not do it? You'll at least give it a shot eventually, right? Correction. In front of me was a woman actively attempting to betray humanity and conquer the world for her own benefit. Conquer the world. Th, that sounds really nice. Kaima, how about we make our ultimate goal world domination? There was also a dungeon core eager to join in. No thanks. Think about what we'll have to do after conquering the world. Ruling involves a lot of management and other tedious things. All I want is to build the dungeon up until I can sleep peacefully. I don't want to push my luck any further than that. But you'll do it if you get strong enough, right? I'll get killed if I stand out too much. So, no. If I stand out, it won't be long before soldiers of God, heroes, come from my head. They'll probably have some cheat powers from that god or whatever, so the basic math is that heroes equal me dying pitifully. I don't want to stand out. I want to sleep. I'll tell you what's really going on here. Don't tell this to anyone else, but I'm the dungeon master of this place. Dungeon master? Oh, right. Haku's misinformation campaign is hiding the fact that the term dungeon master even exists. This dungeon is under my control. In other words, this dungeon and everything in it belongs to me. Oh. You're not a human either, master? No, I'm a human. But I wasn't raised here, so I don't know much about this world. Which is why. You went and bought me. That's it. Well, anyway. Getting back here really tired me out, so I'm just gonna go to sleep now. Day 40 and so. Tomorrow afternoon, the next day. Huh? You think I would wake up in the morning? No way. I went back to bed. I decided to shift gears into making the inn for real. Due to the investigation quest, I had about one week to finish building it. The location I had chosen for it was right next to the cave's entrance. 
After working for a while and getting most of the outer walls set up, Ichika came sleepily walking out of the cave. Fwa. What's up, my dude? Yo. Morning. Hey, wait a second. Did she sleep better than me? What's up with that? I ignored Ichika screaming about how unnatural my create golem was and just focused on building. But uh, dude, I didn't see anything like this when we got here. Were you like, hiding it from me or something? Nah, I started building it today. Dungeon masters or whatever are builders, too. Time to start with the foundation. I wouldn't be able to sleep in the inn if the foundations weren't solid. I'm basically making my own house here. Let's take this seriously. I took out some stone from storage and set it beside the clay and wood lying around. I had more materials than I could ever use. Mass of stone, change your shape and become a servant that obeys my every command, create golem. I poured mana into the stone while casting the create golem chant that I had said countless times during the dungeon battle. I didn't need to chant or anything, but for some reason, I used less mana when chanting and overall it just made the whole process much easier. Though doing the chant was so tedious I forgot to sometimes. I was pouring the stone into the giant hole and making a single giant stone slab. I didn't know much about real construction, but I figured that the stone would fulfill the role of concrete well enough. In place of rebar, I just made a pillar-shaped iron golem and jammed it into the stone mixture. Making pillars first, and then moving on to walls seemed like the smart thing to do. No way! How did you do that? Next up, the outer walls. I ignored Ichika's yelling and confusion because explaining all this would be such a drag. Hey meat, I need some wood. Ready master. After some time meat came with some golems and a lot of wood, and of course it surprised Ichika. Again. Now to turn these logs into golems, create golem. And now the golems will just snap together. Putting this there looks good, then that goes there, and done. The inn is built, see simple. Ichika's jaw dropped wide open after seeing me complete the inn, in just a couple of hours. We went inside to check out our newly built inn, but Ichika had something on her mind so I asked her. What is it? Master, there isn't a kitchen, and we already built it all. Oh silly girl. I guess we will put it right here then. I removed the entire wall with my hand and it shocked her even more. What the F master, no way. I heard a stomach growl loudly right after I said that. It wasn't mine. It was Achika's. All that mind-blowing stuff has left my stomach empty. Oh, it's past noon, I guess it's time to eat. We were sitting on table when Rokoko came. Good morning. Looks like the house is done. It's not morning anymore. Did she also slept longer than me? But dungeon cores didn't need any sleep. What the hell? Oh yeah, there isn't a restroom. This is my first time making a house, so I did miss a lot, well whatever. I'll show you what my true power is. How? Uh, I pretended to gather power in my fist and bought a roll set 5 dp. Now that our dungeon was earning 100 dp a day, money was no longer an object. Er, I mean, dungeon points were no longer an object. Anyway. I waved the roll set 5 dp around, flaunting it. What the heck? Is that? Bread? He he he. Niku, my friend. Go ahead and feed her. Understood. Niku ripped the plastic off a curry roll, freeing it. The distinctive, spicy scent of the curry roll and the sweet scent of cooked oil filled the air, stirring my hunger. What the? I can't stop drooling. W-H what kind of bread is T-H and G-H? It's a curry roll. It's a little spicy, but it tastes really good. Nika shoved the curry roll into Ichika's mouth as she flailed a little violently. No, T-H this. Am nam. Fwa. Oh no, T-H this scent. Is making my brain tingly. Don't hold back. Eat as much as you want. This is master's gift to you, remember? Nmm, mggh, nam. Nnn, ah. Sh, show good. The sh, tash, tash, show amishing. Perhaps due to the spiciness or perhaps due to the tasty flavor, Ichika smiled blissfully with teary eyes. For some reason, I was starting to feel kinda weird about the whole situation. I was born to meet this food. For Suyer. It tasted good, didn't it? 
Listen to me. If you serve Master well, he'll let you eat a lot of food just as good as this. I'll. I will. I'll do anything Master says anything. So please, more. I knew she'd be happy with the food, but I definitely didn't expect her to go this crazy over it. I'm honestly pretty weirded out. The client this time is Kaima Masuda, a dungeon master summoned from a different world. At first glance, this structure he built is a magnificent inn. But it doesn't have a toilet. I lack various modern appliances in my daily life. But one craftsman stood up to fulfill this small wish. It was Ichika. I was thinking about building an open-air bath for the inn, when Ichika interrupted my chain of thought. Master, I will draw up a revised plan for the house, but what are you doing? I have decided on an inn concept. It didn't have a bathing area. A mountain and needed an onsen, plain and simple. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And so, I entered the second day of construction. I had my golem start digging holes, looking for a real source of hot water instead. Siam Mountain seemed to be a volcano, so it would definitely have some heat sources inside of it. If there was an underground stream of flowing water nearby, digging into it would get us hot water then and there. That would definitely be more efficient than just digging around randomly looking for heat sources. Though, finding the water stream was up to luck too. I developed drill golems in order to dig all those holes. That I made a wearable golem for Ichika. This time, I based the design around a navy blue made outfit set, 500 dp. That was what came up when I looked through the catalog for some clothes fitting for an in receptionist. It was less a Raoul made outfit and more a cosplay thing, but it came with gloves, socks, a hairband, and even underwear in addition to the made outfit itself. Now isn't that just cheap for something that only costs 500 dp? Oh, and of course, it came with knee socks and a garter belt. Those two are very important to me and I won't accept any made outfit without them. Holy cheese balls, this outfit is hella awesome. You're really letting me have this? Yep, yeah, be sure to wear it. Ah, that looks really nice. Kaima, give me one of those outfits too. I'm gonna play you off as the owner of the inn, so I'll be making you a dress like the one Haku wears. Yay. Thank you, Kaima. I can't wait. Meet, I'll get you a matching outfit, since you'll be an employee too. Start wearing it most of the time from now on. Okay. Oh dude, I've never seen lace panties before. You've got some good taste, master. Ichika went out of her way to spread the underwear apart with her fingers and show it off to me. Sorry, but my tastes lie a little bit lower than that. Right, you're one of those dudes into feet. Back at the market, did you ask for a slave with sexy feet or legs or something? You know, I remember him talking about my feet like that too. Oh, huh. Ichika grinned after hearing Rokuko mutter. He, Mastier. Do you want to see me? Put these socks on? W.H., what did you just say? She's going right for my weakest point. Clever girl. You know, I'm your slave, master. You don't need to hold back at all. Holy crap. I want to see it. I want to see it right now. So much. I reflexively ended up staring at Ichika's feet, but she noticed something while rubbing the socks and stopped her teasing. Hold up. Why read their magic stones in these clothes? Huh. Well, so that they can help out even when you're not in the dungeon. Sorry, I should have asked this first. Is. Is this a set of magic equipment? Magic equipment? I had never heard that word before, but apparently it referred to equipment that had special properties activated by pouring mana into it, just like magic blades. This is a rare item. I have never heard of magic stones in the clothing. If it doesn't exist, is it okay to use it so casually? I wondered just then a chicka yelled it actually exists. So after giving her golem clothes I thought of making her a weapon, she told me that she uses kitchen knives as her weapon, so I decided to make her one. I took out a tree branch and an iron ingot bar from my storage, and poured some mana in both, chanting my create golem spell. Ichika watching from the side lines was dumbfounded as the iron ingot and the tree branch shone brightly fusing together. And done. Well, at least it doesn't require magic to make golems. It's a golem. That's out of the ordinary, too. Moreover, it's a magic blade. 
I originally create golem, makes a humanoid golem you can't make weapons with it master, the same goes for your magic, master's magic is already in the realm of the gods. No, you are a god master. After Achika say that I asked the two ladies standing beside me. Is that so? What do you two think? But before they could say anything Achika gave me a suggestion. As expected, create golem, isn't a good name for it, what if you'd give it another name master? Should I not use this, maker magic then? Well, it's better not to use it in public. Do you want to cheat? Seems good. It's great. The inn looks like it's becoming an ideal place to stay. Um, master. You are being strange. A question for you all. Tell me where is Kaima's other hand? And also can you all hit that red subscribe button? Only 3.3% of my viewers are subscribed. Like seriously guys, please hit subscribe pretty please. All right then. I started telling them about Operation Inn. I first decided to build an inn to secure safe sleeping arrangements for myself, but consider this. The safe little, ordinary cave suddenly exploded into a decently sized dungeon, and it even got an inn built in front of it out of nowhere at the same time. What would people think about that? Answer, they would be suspicious as hell. So, I decided to try and make everything fit together logically so I could somehow explain things to the guild. Not to mention, Haku was actually helping me out with this. The owner of this inn will be Rokuko, little sister of the A-rank adventurer Haku. The inn was built by one of Haku's associates, who did so in no time with their skills. Are we all on the same page so far? My sister would definitely know someone capable of making an inn in a single day or at least bringing one from somewhere else. After all, you did that yourself, Kaima. That's it. Well, be sure to keep the fact I made it myself a secret. It'd probably be annoying if people found that out. They all agreed with me so far. Haku herself suggested that we focus on presenting Rokuko as the little sister of the A-rank adventurer Haku. From there, I just happened to meet Haku and one thing or another led to me lending my slaves to her little sister and owner of this inn. Bam. My role will be acting like an adventurer that stays in the inn and sleeps all day. Aren't you just going to do that because you want to? That's not a role, that's just you being yourself. It'll be a lot easier to hide a bunch of things if I'm supposedly in my room all the time. Not like I can do dungeon master stuff in front of people. Yeah, I totally see your point. It's perfect. I know, right? I glanced at Achika, wanting to know if my plan wouldn't fly in this world for whatever reason. My dude, do you and Rokuko really know Haku the white-winged goddess? Like, for real? That's what you're worried about. Yeah, we do. And she gave us permission to say these things. She said we could use her name all we wanted if it meant helping out Rokuko. Oh, like, seriously? I mean... With her backing, we can say whatever we want and nobody will question us, dude. The White Winged Goddess is an A-rank adventurer and a major higher up in the Imperial Capital. Plus, she's partners with Chloe the Black Winged Demon and four other hella strong adventurers known as the Four Braves, forming the S-rank party the Dungeon Busters. She's got so much authority and power nobody's gonna question her. Nobody. In other words, Ichika was backing up my plan. After the dungeon battle, Haku had asked me what I would be doing. I told her I might set up an inn, to which she said, Oh, and I presume Rokuko will be presented as the owner? In which case, you will certainly need my help. Very well. I will permit you to use my adventurer identity as you wish. But in return, do a good job, understand? Yeah, I hadn't thought that far ahead at all. I knew I wanted to make an onsen inn but I hadn't thought up any ideas for how to make people not suspicious of an inn popping up out of nowhere next to a massively expanded dungeon. And yet, the approval of an A-rank adventurer fell straight into my lap. And you know, thinking about it, Haku's really doing whatever she wants as an adventurer, huh? She's got two names and a strong party called the Dungeon Busters. Does she destroy dungeons in her spare time? But you know... It's super funny that we're gonna be claiming that the leader of the Dungeon Busters is the older sister of an actual dungeon core. Like, talk about irony, am I right? Ha ha ha, yeah. The real irony is that that she's also a dungeon core herself. 
Ah, uh, yeah, I'm still hiding Haku's true identity from Ichika. Slave or not, that information isn't something I should be spreading around lightly. Wait, wait. Is this really okay? Is this actually gonna work? What's with you, Kaima? It'll definitely work. We have my sister on our side. Yeah, my dude. We'll be totally fine. Ah, uh, you know, I was hoping that since you're the only one here familiar with how this world works, you'd kind of help me work out the finer details and stuff. I mean, I'm one to talk, but this plan is just ridiculous. It's filled with holes. Could you throw me a bone here? Day 42 it was day 3 of me building the inn. I just wanted a day to rest since I had been working really hard lately. Feelings are important. Also, golems were digging out the onsen while I was resting, so yeah. There were still a lot of things I needed to build, though. Although I could buy food with dungeon points, people would get suspicious if I didn't have fields and crops. So I would need to make some. While I was lazing around on my futon in the master room, Ichika suddenly said something. Wait a sec, aren't you an F-rank master? This dungeon's definitely gonna be an E-rank dungeon, for sure. If you're not careful with those magic blades, it might even end up as a D-rank dungeon. I hadn't expected that at all. Naturally, it'd suck if I couldn't go into my own dungeon. The inn was located with the dungeon regions, so I wouldn't be stuck outside of it or anything, but it'd still be a definite problem. The simplest solution would just be to raise my rank. Going up to E rank from F rank just took completing ten F rank quests and a combat test administered by the guild. The combat test is something simple like killing goblins, right? If so, the main problem here is the ten quests. The only F rank quest I know of is that goblin extermination one. I mean, what's wrong with hunting goblins, my dude? I ranked up just from hunting boars. And so, I got to work summoning goblins and collecting enough right ears to fulfill the quests. Not. Naturally, I'm not enough of a monster to summon a bunch of goblins and then cut off their ears. Feral goblins in the wild are one thing, but I owe a lot to summoned goblins. Heck, Gobsook sacrificed himself to protect the dungeon core. Even I'd feel like garbage summoning them en masse and mutilating them. Guess I'll go hunt some wild goblins. Rokuko tilted her head in confusion. If you want goblin ears, why don't you just buy them with DP? Huh? What are you on about, Rokuko? We can't do that. Can we? There are dragon claws and stuff in the treasure section of the catalog, so I don't see why not. Why not, indeed? I checked the treasure section of the catalog, but there were no goblin ears. Makes sense. It's kinda hard to call goblin ears treasure but I didn't give up there. I checked the other sections and found right goblin ears under the materials section. Right goblin ears. One for six dp. Five for thirty dp, which would earn us thirty coppers. They cost just as much as the quest's reward. The whole point is to encourage adventurers to take care of goblins herding crops, after all. But whatever. This is fine. I care more about my time than that. The quest says to bring ears, and that's it. I'm not breaking any rules here. Anyway, we have the stuff to get up to your rank now. I'll ask about what we need to do to rank up again just in case our dungeon ends up being restricted to D ranks and above. Ichika, do you remember what we need to do to go from E rank to D rank? Um, I think it was. 100 total quests done and a combat test at the guild. They'll want to see how good you are at fighting other humans. No need to sweat that, though. You and Meat would crush that junk, trust me. To know about Rokuko, though. Fighting other humans, huh? I might need a backup plan for that. If I can teach our wearable golems the combat techniques that Chika's built up over the years, we should be able to power up fast and hard. Even Rokuko would be able to take care of herself in a fight. Ichika, would you mind helping me train? And by that I mean, help train Meat. What about you, master? I'll be watching. That's a very important job, you know. It really was important for me to watch their movements through the dungeon monitor to record them, and then teach the golems the same moves through repetition. I wanted to make more human-like golems in the shape of mannequins that would be useful sparring partners. There would be no downsides to doing so. Day 43, day 4 of constructing the inn. It was already mostly complete 
and I had already made one of the rooms mine. The onsen was the only thing left, more or less. I had enough wood to finish that on my own, so I had a chica and meat spar in the meantime. Meat was in her wearable golem mark II, whereas a chica was in her maid outfit golem. For weapons, I had prepared them wooden versions of their normal weapons. The wooden weapons were blades in shape only. Whoa, holy cow! What's with these clothes? I'm not using my muscles at all, but I feel hella strong. Wow, I guess this is Meat's secret. I'll definitely be able to pull off some crazy tricks with these babies. I want to try out a lot of moves today, for Master's sake. My job was to watch them spar. Or more accurately, to open up the dungeon monitor and film them. I had put my wearable golem on a much more human-shaped mannequin golem. By having it repeat what was happening on screen, it would master the perfect moves for assisting me and thereby become the first truly complete wearable golem. This was a lot easier than what I did before, since I didn't have to teach it the motions myself. If it were a robot, I would have to program and detail the exact angle to move my legs, arms, and so on. No thanks. In any case, it was very convenient that my party rank would go up without doing anything if my party members were strong enough. Very convenient, very nice. I didn't even want to be an adventurer in the first place. I just wanted to have a nice time and sleep all day. And yet I get the feeling I've been working all the time lately. What's up with that? Well, no more. It's time for me to buckle down and get to snoozing. I dove into the futon, spread out on the floor of my in-room while still recording Neat and Ichika sparring. This is my room on the third floor of the inn. The wall is three times thicker than normal, so it's perfectly soundproof. The bed is also the best kind that can be obtained with DP. This is the best sleeping environment I can make right now. My bed it must be like this. Now finally I can sleep in peace. Kaima, or not, just as I was about to jump in my bed, Rokoko came running, yelling my name. Kaima! We finally hit an underground water source. And it's warm. I try to sleep. And this is what I get? I mean, I'm not gonna complain about finding water for the onsen, but come on. All right. I'll start connecting it to the bath and all that, I guess. It's clear. It doesn't smell, and it's pretty dang warm, too. Ichika picked up the bucket, and, without a moment of hesitation, started gulping down the water. The hell? What are you doing, Ichika? Foi. Okay, if I'm not dead in two hours, it's definitely not poisoned. And if it is poisoned? Ah, uh, I was just kidding about being dead. At worst I'll get a stomachache or something like that. And two hours later, she was still totally fine. The water wasn't poisoned or anything. Phew. I really hadn't expected her to just drink it out of nowhere like that. Seriously. And so, with the onsen complete, so too was the in. A stepping massage. Obviously enough, that was a massage performed with feet. Normally it would be done by kids who needed to use their full body weight to put a satisfying amount of pressure on someone else's body. Parents often requested that their children give them such a massage. The execution was simple. You put your foot on the person and step down using your body weight. The end. That's right. You step on someone. With your feet. I mean, obviously, stepping on someone means using your feet. That's just how language works. And to someone with a foot fetish like me, that's the best massage I could ask for. Oh who, this feels so good. Meat drilled her toes into my back as if digging into it while rubbing her heel against me. I'm being stepped on while laying down. Sweet mother of God, I feel like my dreams have all come true. Hiya. Hiya. Oh yeah, that's it. Being stomped on feels good too. The bottom of her feet gently stomped on my hips. Foi. Her feet rhythmically hitting my back is making me really tired. Day 44 I woke up and found that I was using meat as a dakimakura just like always, thanks in part to the distinctive sweet scent of a girl. Ah. Good morning. Since the ordinary cave request time limit has reached, I prepared a perfect substitute report, and we came to the guild. And behind the counter sat the usual receptionist. Man, this lady sure works pretty hard, huh? Hello? It's been one week, I believe. 
How was the ordinary cave? Before we get to that, I'd like you to take care of these first. I gave her the forty-five goblin ears that I had bought with DP. I heard from Ichika that I could take the rank-up test after turning this many ears in. Goblin ears, HM. Well, they all seem fine to me. But still, this is quite a lot of ears to hunt in only a week. Did you find a colony of goblins near Tsaya Mountain? Something like that. Truth is, we got all of these in the ordinary cave. Is that so? Would you mind telling me more? The receptionist, sensing that there was more to our story, stood up and gestured for us to come behind the counter. All right. Time to show our dungeon. We were guided to the guildmaster's room. Yeah, we are bringing some serious info here. Makes sense we tell it to him directly. Within the room was the old buff dude. The guildmaster. The receptionist remained standing in the doorway entirely, as if blocking off our means of escape. So, what happened at the ordinary cave? Take a look at this. I showed the guildmaster a magic, golem, blade and two mana potions. In other words, loot from my dungeon that was good enough to sell. And not only that, but loot valuable enough to be a huge find in a small dungeon. To say nothing of the magic blade, even mana potions were a full silver each. This is. I found it in the ordinary cave. Really now? I thought that dungeon only had one room. One room? That's crazy talk. There were tons of rooms, and even some staircases. I got this sword in one of those rooms. There were golems all over the place, so I got out of there. I figured I had gotten a good enough look at the place. He took it and held it at various angles, investigating it. This doesn't seem to be a normal old iron sword. Wait, it has a magic stone inside of it. This is a magic blade. It sharpens when you pour mana into it. Oh ho, that makes it a low-rank magic blade. But still, a magic blade nonetheless. There's also an inn by the dungeon. An inn? W-H-Y the hell was there and in there? The guild master furrowed his brows, baffled by what I had said. Yeah, it is pretty unbelievable. Basically as unrealistic as you can get. But this is where persuasion comes in. Does it matter why? Haku had an associate of hers build it. It's probably pointless for us to try and think about why she'd do that. You've got a point. Who knows what the hell that woman is thinking. She made it clear that the ordinary cave was not to be touched, but, yeah, thinking about this is a waste of time. Which means all we gotta do is take your word for all this and figure out what to do with the dungeon. Sure. The guildmaster closed his eyes and nodded. Nice. Persuasion really worked. Er, well, a lot happened and now I'm actually gonna be working at that inn. I'm gonna be using it as my base of operations from now on. All right. But the moment I thought that and let my guard down, the guildmaster continued speaking. Guess I'll put a branch office of the Tsai Adventurer's Guild there. Huh. Er, a branch office? What do you mean? I meant what I said. If that dungeon really did grow, adventurers are gonna be crawling all over it. Things will go a lot more smoothly if we have an office there. Especially if there's also an inn there. W. Well, yeah, that's true. A town might spring up around that dungeon depending on what it's like. We're gonna have to investigate this further. Which means another quest. You can take it if you want. A town? This is serious. I didn't plan on anything that big happening. If too many people come to the dungeon, I won't be able to make golems do all the farming. Crap, crap, crap. Can I grow crops inside of the dungeon? And it'll be a lot harder to use special golems like the one I used to carry us here. My thoughts were interrupted by the receptionist bringing back our guild cards. He had said we'd be ranked up after they checked out the dungeon, but our cards already had E-rank on them. But that was the least of our problems. I said some halfest goodbyes and left the guild. Things might not go so well for us here. Let's get back to base. I named in the dancing Dalin. That name would provide cover if anyone stumbles upon the golems farming the nearby fields. We could just claim that Rokuko, the owner, was a golem user and the inn was named in her honor. 
and that wouldn't be a lie either since the golems do obey her orders. I was planning on buying a create golem scroll for her when I had the spare DP for it, too. I just have to give them armbands or something that signified that they worked for our inn. Ha! The dungeon also had some hurried organization. As advertised to the guild, I made so the magic sword can be obtained. Since the boss monster wasn't made yet, it will be a problem if they reach to the fifth layer. However, if they don't find a magic sword then nobody will come. That's a problem. So on the second floor I made a magic sword trial room. As soon as the sword is pulled, the exit is closed. To leave the room you must return it to the pedestal. With this, we can earn time while showing the sword's appeal. And the adventurer has just come, our first pair of customers. It was a pair of two men. I took up camp in my room and watched them through the monitor. They get a C-rank and D-rank meal, respectively. The C-rank meal is A, steak set 10 DP, while the D-rank meal is A, B stew set 6 DP. By the way, the food was basically as good as the stuff you'd find in an average restaurant. What kind of meat is it? Probably boar meat. Whoa! This bread is really fluffy and sweet. It looks pretty white, too. This bread's crazy good. So, about your brown soup. Hold on to your pants, but that's some real beef stew. What? Beef as in like from cows? Seriously? Was there some celebration recently or what? You usually don't eat beef unless you're celebrating something or retiring an old cow. That steak you've got is beef too. And since we're still not getting too many visitors. Or more like since you two are our first customers, I gave you an especially thick one as a treat. Seriously? Oh, so this is beef, huh? This steak is worth five silvers by itself. Oh, whoops, it's about time for your dessert. Meat. Bring it out. The bee skin from earlier comes out holding dessert. It's white. No, yellow. It looks like a trappist, but from above it looks like a weird flower. Also, there's some brown sauce covering it. What is this? It's called a purin, and it's your dessert. I push my spoon forward and dig into the purin, causing it to jiggle. And so, that day, I saw a glimpse of heaven. They took a bath and headed to the dungeon immediately after waking up. In any case, thanks to them, we had earned seven silvers, one copper coin, and 125 dp. Each silver was worth 10 dp, so subtracting the points I had used on their food, we had earned 178 dp in total. Oh, and about dp. At some point we unlocked another function, one that allowed me to see how much DP was coming from each individual room in the dungeon. Very useful. Maybe it unlocked because I had built an inn. Either way, I was surprised to see that they were earning us 120 DP per night. I checked the map to see what the invaders were doing, and realized that I could now see how much DP they were individually earning us. It was displayed as DP. That definitely referred to how much DP they earned us in a day. Man, we sure are unlocking a lot of functions here. So, I checked them out and saw Yuzu was getting us 61 DP, while Muzu was getting us 59 DP. One of the rooms in our dungeon had a jail cell in it, a remnant of the prison room I had built for the bandits all that time ago. The moment Yuzu stepped into that cell, his DP count shot up to 183 DP. Basically, the amount of DP earned from an individual changed from where they were in the dungeon. There might have been other factors too, but all I knew then was that being in a jail cell probably boosted an individual's DP gain by a factor of three. I should investigate this further. Ichika's worth 65 DP, so she'd earn us 195 DP if she were in a jail cell. I kept watching Yuzu and Yuzu casually conquering my dungeon for bit, and eventually they reached the trial room. Yuzu walked up to the pedestal and pulled out the magic golem blade. Oh. Their DP counts doubled the moment the exit got shut off. I guess. An individual's DP income doubles if they're in a closed room? Maybe I should make an extra floor of the dungeon and call it like a training area to put locks on the door. Wait, no. People will close and lock their doors on their own. We're an inn. And that's already what happened. 
Now I know why I got extra DP today. They looked so excited after getting the magic blade that I couldn't help but smile. Day 53 Three days had passed since the adventurers went into our dungeon. Our Hadden had a single visitor in the meantime, but we were getting 240 DP a day from them, the Zo brothers, Yuzu and Yuzu. But why aren't they leaving the trial room? They must really like it in there. Just what I'd expect from my dungeon, he hey. All they had to do was stick the magic blade into the pedestal to get out, but they weren't doing that. What could be compelling them to stay inside there? As far as I could tell, they were just walking around the room and tapping the walls. Oh, Yuzu just stuck his normal sword in the pedestal. Almost, but not quite. You're getting warmer. Wait, have they just not figured out what to do? Ah, now that you mention it, they did seem kind of dumb. I don't think you should be saying that, Rokuko. They must have been unconsciously avoiding the correct answer, maybe because they didn't want to give the magic blade up. That reminded me of the experiments where monkeys got their hands stuck in jars when trying to take treats out of them. Let's keep watching them for a bit. They'll probably find their way out soon enough. And if they don't, we get their tasty DP. Okay, Kaima. We've come this far. Maybe we should just keep them trapped in there until they die. With Achika's help, I discovered that DP gain was doubled by being in a locked room, tripled by being in a jail cell, and multiplied by six by being in a locked jail cell. In that last case, however, just being in the cell steadily tired her out. Maybe because DP was being squeezed out of her? I didn't know jail cells had that kind of power. Day 55 Five days had passed since Yuzu and Nyuzu locked themselves up. A long time ago, I believe that I mentioned that an invader staying inside the dungeon for ten days would earn us as much DP as they would by dying. In other words, we had now gotten more DP from Yuzu and Nyuzu than we would have by killing them instantly. I could give them food and just keep reaping in all this sweet, sweet DP. By the way, several upper-tier dungeons apparently had human farms within them. They literally raised humans like animals on a farm to get their DP. I was watching Yuzu and Yuzu while lazing around, thanks to no other visitors showing up, when all of a sudden Yuzu lost his patience and started wailing on the spike wall with the magic blade. But too bad! That golem blade turns into just a normal, iron sword whenever it's attacking a dungeon object. In our dungeon, anyway. Who are you explaining that to? They can't hear a word you're saying, you know. The magic blade is broken. Um. I guess I'll just go ahead and repair the spike traps. It'll cost us some DP. Yeah, go ahead. I left the trap repairs to Rokuko and started thinking about the situation. The golem blade had likely broken during the first swing. And when it was broken, it turned into a normal, iron sword that wouldn't work in the pedestal lock. With no way out of the locked room, the mysterious dungeon power buffing the walls and doors vanished, turning the spike wall into an easily breakable object. Then, while he cut down the spikes with the blade, it got cracked. Makes sense to me. I think I've figured most of this out, but now I've realized something really annoying. Mm hmm? What's that? Well, golem blades are kind of the big prize for our dungeon, but can they even really be used like magic blades? I'm not so sure anymore. Thinking about it, let's say someone blocks an attack with a golem blade. Like someone swings their sword and they block that with their golem blade. If you think about it abstractly, that's the exact same thing as a sword-shaped golem taking a direct hit. And if the golem gets taken down, it turns into a normal, iron sword, without any special properties. Even if they're still in the middle of a fight. Isn't that like a huge fatal flaw? I could repair my golem blades instantly, but Meat, Ichika, and other adventurers couldn't. And of course, those using golem blades were fighting on the front line. Which meant that it was very likely that their golem blades would break while fighting. Yeah. I'm gonna need to fix this somehow. Oh, and I'll make the trap unlock if Yuza or Musa put the magic blade back into the pedestal, broken or not. Owner! There's a visitor here for ya. Huh? They're here for Rokuko, not the inn. Eh? Eh, uh, okay. I am the owner, right? 
H H here I G G G go. Stop, stop. You're not going anywhere like that. Eh? Here, let me take care of this. Rokuko was nervous to the point of shaking, so I decided to tag along with her. But that wouldn't be enough, so I had her temporarily restore my absolute authority. I then ordered her to calm down, smile while next to me, nod if I said. What do you think, owner? Shake her head if I said. Well, owner? And to say. Indeed. If I shifted the conversation to her any other way. Hey, don't get mad at me. I need her to calm down, and this is the only way I know how. We went to the front after Ichika called us again, and there we saw the receptionist who was always behind the guild's counter. She. She had a huge backpack on her back. Judging by how easily she was carrying it, there was either something special about that backpack, or she was just really strong. You are the owner? It's very nice to meet. The receptionist was clearly treating us differently than she did at the guild, a sign that she understood we were in different positions now. Anyway, to summarize what the receptionist said, I came to build the guild branch office. There's space in front of your inn, so I'll build it there. But it'll be under construction for a while, so lend me your bathroom. And your food, too. Oh, and the guild will pay you for all this. You can just charge me what you would any other visitor. That was it, more or less. She must have been talking about the branch office the guild master brought up. Her staying in Arn wouldn't be a problem at all. Oh, and there is a personal quest that the guild would like to offer to your party, Kaima. Several days ago, the guild put up a quest to investigate this dungeon. We're in the process of determining a new name for it, but in any case, two adventurers accepted it and left for this ordinary cave. They never returned. Ah, that must be Yuzu and Muzu. They're sleeping in the trial room right now. They're C-rank adventurers and thus I believe they are fairly used to exploring dangerous dungeons. That they have not returned leads us to believe that this might be quite a difficult dungeon. I see. So? We would like to know if you would like to take over the quest for them, as you have explored the dungeon and lived. If they are alive, we would also like you to attempt to rescue the missing adventurers. Though, it's quite unlikely that they have survived in the dungeon for this long. Naturally, I couldn't just tell her that they were still alive. They couldn't let E-rank adventurers just waltz willy-nilly into a dungeon that C-rank adventurers had gone missing inside of. They need me to go inside and come back alive again before they'd assign it as a limited C-rank dungeon, rather than a full-on C-rank dungeon. I had no reason to refuse the quest. Or rather, I was an E-rank adventurer, so I had to take it if I didn't want to get locked out of my own dungeon. We took the quest. I told the receptionist we'd be taking it, and started to prepare to go into the dungeon. Or at least, I pretended to. Obviously. We had a map and I was the dungeon master. We didn't really need to prepare at all. Fwa! Ah, that was really rough. Good work, Kaima. You too, Rokoko. Why don't you ask me to give you a massage later? She's pretty good. Mmm, -hmm, good idea. I'll have to borrow her from you. Have you used your 10,000 DP yet? Mmm, -hmm, not yet. I was thinking about using it on the gacha again but I'm not sure if I should roll the 1,000 DP gacha 10 times or roll the 10,000 DP gacha once. What's gacha? That word sounds totally rad somehow. Care to drop the deets on me? Oh, right. Ichika ended up super in debt after gambling too much. I forgot about that. She's not just a big food lover. If I let her play the gacha as much as she wants, she'd probably use up all our DP in a single day. You're right. Pulling the 10,000 DP gacha would be way more exciting. Right. If you're gonna do it, you've gotta do it all at once. It took exactly one 30-second conversation for Rokuko to decide on how she should use her DP. Seriously? Like, that's good enough for you. I mean, I said you could do what you want with it, but come on. Oh well. Okay, let's do it. 10,000 DP gacha, guh. Hey, hold up. Don't do that in my room. Do it in the master room. What if something huge like a dragon comes out and destroys the inn? I yelled, but it was too late. Rokuko had already used up all her DP. 
A magic circle glowed into existence with a hum along the floor. Uh. Hey. Hello? That magic circle's as big as the whole room. Isn't that a problem? Oh, I knew the 10,000 DP gotcha would be fancy. Please don't be big. Please don't be big. I prayed that the and I had spent so much effort on wouldn't be destroyed. Meanwhile, Ichika and Rokuko were squealing in excitement. Me, bless her heart, was standing protectively in front of me. Dragoon. Dragoon. You can roll dragons too? We're eating steak tonight, my dudes. I won't let you eat him. I mean, his tail will grow back even if we cut it off, so. What? No. The magic circle began to shrink while spinning rapidly. Eventually, it was small enough to fit within the room. Whoa, whoa, it's getting small. What's up with that? The circle was getting even smaller. I patted my chest in relief. Nothing that size would destroy the inn. But then, it got even smaller. Yeah. It's pretty small now. Yeah, yeah. I'll be able to hold whatever gets summoned in my own arms. Oh. I is this is a miss? Is this what you call the bad roll? Rokuko and Ichika were steadily losing their enthusiasm. Meat still stood in front of me without letting her guard down at all. And so, the magic circle disappeared, leaving behind a palm-sized box. What's this? Only one way to find out, eh? Let's open it, Rokuko. Come on. Oh, okay. Rokuko timidly opened the box. Within it was a single egg and nothing more. A pretty small egg, at that. This is an egg, right? Want to fry it? I bet it'd taste super fab, maybe. No way. But. What is this, anyway? Mmm, I can't tell, but it's definitely something amazing. For sure. So, what is it? Did it come with a manual? Maybe it'll hatch if we heat it up. Sounds good to me. But. You spent 10,000 DP on this thing, so don't break it. All right. Although she had spent all her DP on it, the day ended without us learning exactly what it was. We decided to just heat it in the onsen water for a bit. Though to make sure we didn't kill whatever was inside, we did so under a managed pace, as if using an incubator. Oh, fire, rise up and... Uh, just explode or something. Fireball. Ah, uh, crap. That chant was pretty half-assed, so I lost a ton of mana. I actually felt a chill run down my spine. A fireball poofed into the air and slowly floated towards the spike traps. Master, that fireball is giving me hella bad vibes. I'm thinking we should back the heck up ASAP. Yeah, yeah? Ichika pulled me away and we waited together for the fireball to hit the spike trap. The moment it did, it exploded with impressive force, filling the air with blinding light. But the spike trap was just fine. A all right, it didn't break. Good job, Spike Trap, that was close. Wait. Crap. I thought for sure that one would work. I guess it was just dumb of me to try breaking through metal with fire. Oh well, I'll just fiddle with the traps to make them easier to break. I shook my head at myself and used Create Golem on the traps to fill the spikes with cracks. Maybe because they were traps in my own dungeon. They were already filled with my mana without me needing to pour it into them. They changed shape fast and easy. Ichika and I went into the trial room, stealthily repairing the spike traps along the way. All my acting up to this point had been built up to that one statement. The receptionist said I could work out the details of my payment with the adventurers themselves. The best way to get a lot of money for them wasn't just to rescue them, it was to use my magic blade and demand payment for it. Heh. Pretty impressive, right? Tremble in fear of the life of dead awaiting you. Yeah. Sorry, man. I hate that you lost your magic blade to save us. Of course we're gonna repay you. We owe you our lives for using your magic blade to save us. Thank you. Sincerely. Lower it based on their reaction. Hmm, uh, How about like? T2 gold coins? No way. As sorry. W was one gold per person too much? All right, I know how to barter. Come at me. I'll bargain you into as high of a price as I can. Ah, uh, you mean two from each of us, right? 
We can do that. We'll pay the four gold coins as soon as we get back to Tsaya. You're fine with us paying you that little. You're a lifesaver, man. Seriously. I definitely looked like a stunned idiot as Yuzu and Musa grinned at me. What? I had totally forgotten to ask Achika about what they'd be willing to pay for me saving them. As an aside, they didn't even have to go back to Tsai to get the cash. They just withdrew it from the guild branch office and handed it to me then and there. H.M. For gold coins. This is pretty sweet. They said an A-rank meal would cost all their savings, but look at this. They had plenty. Though apparently three of these coins are uses. Four gold coins turned into dungeon points would be worth 4,000 DP, but I wanted to keep them as coins. I could use them to buy more slaves to work at our inn. To summarize what I had gained from Yuzu and Yuzu's visit, 2,650 DP, four gold coins, 29 silver coins, and five copper coins. I calculated the DP with some rough mental math, not accounting for all the minute alterations to DP gain the dungeon does on its own but it was close enough. If you put that all into earth money, I had earned 4,290,500 yen in 10 days. Oh man, I'm so glad I didn't kill them. I wouldn't have gotten their savings if I killed them in the dungeon. Not to mention the new magic blade they're getting for me. Or the guild's reward for investigating the dungeon and saving them. Well, I sure, investigated, the dungeon but I didn't feel the need to tell them anything more than I had to. Also, the receptionist had stayed in the inn for five days now, giving us five silvers and about six hundred dp. We should have a lot more leeway with our dp now. We have 49,532 dp left right now. We earned 162 goblins worth of dp in just eleven days. Wow, that's amazing. But why did you express that to goblins? Kaima? Well, it's easier for you to understand that way, isn't it? I gave Rokuko a bright grin. Well, it was easy to understand, but I don't like it. I patted Rokuko's head. Day 67 Several days after Yuza and Yuza left, the guild finally decided on a new name for our dungeon. That name being Cave of Greed. Apparently, it came from the fact that you would be putting yourself at risk if you weren't careful about being greedy. Come on, you don't need to warn people like that. It'll be a lot easier for me if they let their guard down. It was classified as an E-rank dungeon. That put it in the lower tiers of difficulty. Well, I can't get mad about that. Yuzu and Yuzu nearly dying despite being C-rank adventurers was basically an accident, and the method for escaping that trap is now public. Congratulations, my sweet little Rokuko. That's a beautiful name fitting for a girl as sweet as you. Thank you very much, Haku. Haku, who came to inform us of the guild's decision as soon as possible, gently rubbed Rokuko's head. Behind her was Chloe, standing around in her butler outfit as always. So, why'd you come deliver that news yourself? Well, of course, I rushed over immediately to be the first visitor of Rokuko's and as soon as I heard it was going public. Sorry, you're going to be the fourth visitor. What in the world? H.M. Could you please tell me the names of the three prior visitors? Everything will be fine if I can just eliminate them. Please don't. You can be the first visitor to sleep in the grand suite, so please, uh, settle for that. And don't kill anyone. Thank you. The grand suite. In other words, the room for A-rank adventurers that I had built just for fun. At the moment, I had no plans for anyone but Haku to stay in it. I had put a lot of effort into making the sleeping arrangements in the grand suite top tier. It had a memory foam mattress, 200 dp, that was much better than a plain futon, 50 dp, placed within a high-quality wooden frame I had made and decorated myself. To top things off, it even had a feather comforter, 100 dp. I couldn't help but congratulate myself on making such a high-quality bed. There were a ton of other minor improvements over normal rooms, like carved reliefs in the furniture, a candle-shaped light magic tool on the table, a glass window with curtains, and so on. It even had its own bathroom and bathing room. Yeah, bathroom and bathing room. Plus, I threw in a massage chair as well. 
That way, guests could get out of the bath wrapped in a towel and go to sleep while getting a massage. So how much does it cost? I'll pay the money as I should. Don't think I'll let you get away with claiming I'm not the first visitor because I didn't pay. Why would I do that? Ah, uh, you know, I actually haven't decided on how much the grand suite should cost yet. I helped him decorate the inside of the room. Haku, how much do you think we should charge? Oh my, you did? Oh, and you'll have our A-rank meals for food. We're passing things off as if you're giving Rokuko the ingredients through storage, so keep that in mind. Very well. Ah, and I imagine the food comes from your world as well? Here, have two gold ones, for both Chloe and I. I'm looking forward to the meal. I would have been fine giving her the food for free, but sure. I'll take what I can get. I'm quite looking forward to that. And, um, I suppose I'll think up a price and pay after I've stayed the night. That would be pretty helpful. I asked the chica what she thought it should cost but she had never stayed at a high-class inn and thus had no idea how much a room like the suite would go for. She was more interested in paying tons of money for food, not sleeping arrangements. If you turn that around, I totally understood how she felt. Anyway, it's kind of late to say this, but I really don't think our current A-rank meal is worth a million yen. I should probably turn it into a full-course French meal fit to serve an entire table of people. Probably. Hashtag Haku's perspective. MMM, I see that the door is not just made of wood. It has metal plates enforcing it, and it even has a lock. I open the door and see that the room is bright inside, thanks to sunlight streaming through the windows. The furniture is all made of beautiful, engraved wood. The bed looks comfortable, and there's a large chair that looks perfect for a cozy afternoon nap. Hmm, but what country are these engravings from? Did they perhaps originate from an artisan from Kaima's original world? Or perhaps he did the engravings himself. He has quite the talent if so. There's a clock resting on the wall. Clocks, I believe, are a magic tool far more expensive than they're worth considering how little utility they offer. Though, they're more valuable out here, where unlike towns there are no bells to ring out the time. As for the window with light pouring through it. I imagine this is a plate of crystal in the window sill. It's very clear. It seems that I can use the cloth on the sides to block the light if I so wish. This, and much of the room in general, must have cost quite a lot of DP in total. All in all, I'd say it's more than fine enough to be considered a grand suite. Oh, I forgot for a moment that it has a bathing room and a toilet as well. I shall investigate them immediately. The bathtub has no water, but surprisingly enough, it's made of wood. Mmm. It smells nice as well. Ah. Is this the lever that produces hot water? There's a sheet of paper explaining things beside it. I see, this lever produces hot water and this one cold. I experiment by pouring hot water into the tub. Mmm. It feels a little bit too hot. Ah, uh, the idea must be to pour out cold water at the same time. What do you think, Chloe? This is quite an excellent room. At the very least, it's superior to any grand suite we've stayed at in the Holy Kingdom. The quality of this room is surprising even to me. I sat down on the chair and decided what to do next from there. This is quite a comfortable chair, I like it. My lady, it says here that the chair you're sitting in is a magic tool known as a massage chair. It seems that it will give you a massage if you put a copper coin into it. Really now? I shall try that out. I ask Chloe to put a copper coin into the chair, and once she does, it starts to shake. WH 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 what in the world is this? Foi! My lady? Hey, are you alright? I am fine. Ah, this is amazing. Foi, it feels so good. Ah. I feel like just falling asleep now, as I am. I spend a lot of time finishing up work so I could come here, so. Ah. I wake up and see that Chloe covered me with a blanket as I slept. H.M. This blanket is quite soft. It's not very thick, but it still feels nice and warm. I must ask them to lend this chair to me. I imagine it will cost at least ten gold pieces. I have never seen a magical tool like this before. 
in which case it must be fairly valuable. Surely it's worth no more than fifty gold pieces. If you've grown that fond of it, why not investigate it yourself to try and make your own? Ah, that's quite a good idea. But since I took a nap, I'm now in the mood for supper. I hope it's not too late for it. Either way, I believe I just have to push this button and wait for them. The button has a simple cover over it so as to prevent accidental pressing. I put that aside and press the button. Immediately, I hear the sound of two pieces of metal vibrating against each other outside of the room. I wonder how this works. Is this thing in the inn's options as well? After a brief wait of only three minutes, someone knocks on my door. That was quite fast. I suppose they're using DP for the food as well, then. Sister, I've brought you your food. Please come in, Rokuko. I open the door wide and see a pushable food cart in front of Rokuko. It has three meals on top of it. Each meal is covered with a silver dome known as a cloche, hiding their contents. That is another sign of this service being quite high level. Wait just a moment. Why are there three meals? I wanted to eat with you, sister. Is that okay? But of course. Come now, Rokuko, take a seat. Leave the rest to Chloe. Achimph, I can't do that. Chloe's our visitor today. Rokuko carefully places the meals on the table. Ah, uh, just seeing that makes me want to give her a gold piece tip. And here we go. Ta-da! Rokuko lifts up one of the cloches, revealing an assortment of food stuffed onto a single plate. The plates have ridges which separate the food, allowing multiple types of cooking to be delivered at once. That is quite a clever idea. He he he, isn't it? Um, this is Hamburg steak. This is a Napolitan. And these are fried shrimp. These long things are French fries. And this bit with the flag in it is omelette rice. Ah, uh, and this is buttercorn stew. Oh, right. The green drink is called um cream soda. It's a drink, but it's a dessert too. The white stuff on top is called vanilla ice cream. It's really cold and sweet. It melts fast, so you should drink it soon. I pick up my fork and begin eating while listening to Rokuko's explanations. Hamburg steak, hm? It's definitely meat. It's not like any steak I've had before, but it's definitely made of meat. And I believe this meat is beef as well? Either way, the mushroom-filled sauce is fantastic. This, Napolitan, is a kind of pasta. I suppose this sauce covering it is made from tomatoes. It has a sharp flavor that stimulates my tongue fried shrimp. This feels like seafood. I wonder what? Frying. Entails? This must be another kind of food from his own world. It seems that you can eat omelette rice with a spoon. These are cooked eggs covered with tomato sauce, with a side of some kind of small grains HM. This isn't bad at all. But what is with this flag? Buttercorn stew is sweet, warm, and practically makes my heart melt. Ah, this purin is quite tasty. It's squishy, sweet, and makes me feel like melting. Ah, oh my. That was close. My mind was nearly consumed by this heavenly dessert. This drink, no, this dessert wields both intensity through its melon soda and peaceful calm through its vanilla ice cream. It dominated my heart and mouth. In the end, the vanilla ice cream melted into the melon soda creating a combination so heavenly I feel as if I've caught a glimpse into the true meaning of the world. Eh? This is all only one gold piece? Yes, that's certainly cheap. I let out a sigh of impressed satisfaction. It certainly earns high marks from me. That was extremely fulfilling. I'm honored to hear you say that, sister. That's our Inze rank meal. I'm really proud of it. HMIC. A meal of this caliber is only worthy of an A rank to them. Rokoko. What is the overall name of this meal? I feel that A rank meal is simply too drab of a name for something like this. It's called the um. Grut. No um. Glutton set. This must be their answer to those gluttons that come to the cave of greed, wanting to eat a lot of delicious food. Oh, sister. Do you mind if I take your flag? I'm collecting them. 
Oh my, not at all. Here you are. I take the small flag out of my omelette rice and hand it to Rokuko. While I'm at it, I give her Chloe's as well. It seems that all of our flags have different designs. I didn't understand the purpose of the flags while eating, but now I recognize them as collector's items. He's attacking people's greed for collecting items while feeding them. Kaima has quite the fearsome mind. Oh yeah, sister. Did you try the onsen? It feels super good in there. I have not yet, but... Now that you mention it, it's been far too long since I've visited an onsen. Do you want to visit the onsen together, sister? Oh my, that sounds delightful. An onsen. MMM, yes, that certainly sounds nice right about now. I'm fond of the personal bath in my room, but a large bathing area like an onsen will allow me to bathe with Rokuko. Despite having just finished eating, I decide to go to the onsen immediately. I've visited a real onsen created by a hero, so I can teach you how to properly bathe in one. There's a proper way to bathe in onsens? Wow, I'm looking forward to learning that. It was a very nice bath. I didn't know that in real onsens, you don't wear any bathing outfits or anything. Oh my, Rokuko, did you overheat in there? Your cheeks are quite flushed. Although onsens by the imperial capital do have bathing outfits to wear, this is an onsen. A bath created by Kaima, a visitor from another world. It's only right that I would teach her to bathe in public naked like those from his world do. And thanks to that, I saw something wonderful. The only problem was that someone else was in the onsen. If not for that human, I could have been all alone with her. Ah, next time, I'll just reserve it for the two of us. Fufufu. Now I'm really looking forward to my next visit. Now then, I suppose it's time to sleep. Will you join me, Rokuko? I will. Speaking of which, I don't believe we've slept in the same bed before. That makes sense. As dungeon cores, we do not need any sleep and only choose to as camouflage or as a form of frivolous entertainment. Though of course, it does help speed the passing of exhaustion. When I returned to my room with Rokoko, I was shocked seeing Chloe in bed lying down. I shouted her name, Chloe, but she won't respond. Can it be an assassin? Someone aiming me, I asked for Coco. That can't be, because we are inside my domain. Right, if someone had invaded, there's no way you want notice. If Rokuko chan didn't notice, maybe Kaima did? Or what if it was long range magic and they did it from outside Rokuko's domain? While I was thinking that, Chloe got up. I call out to her, causing her to immediately jump out of the bed and bow before my feet. Bowing like that is a classic form of apology derived from alternate worlds. It is also known as genuflection. However, it's rare for Chloe to make such a blunder. I wonder what in the world happened. The truth is, I wanted to check the bed to make sure it was up to standards before you slept on it. However, it felt so oddly comforting that before I knew it, I was. Hmm. It's entirely as if you've been charmed by a spell. Although this could be the work of a magic tool. I find it hard to believe that a succubus like Chloe would fall under the effects of a charm spell. After all, since succubi specialize in charms, it would have to be an extremely powerful one to catch Chloe unnoticed. I've never seen Chloe do something like that before. I can't blame her though, these beds are really comfy. I gently touch the bed as well. And my fingers sink into it. What in the world? This isn't cotton, is it? I reflexively push my palm against it. The bed is soft, yet still firm enough to resist my hand. Oh my. I nearly became charmed by the bed myself. I pull a tactical retreat and observe the bed from afar. The frame is made of tastefully decorated wood, which would no doubt make it a valuable luxury item. I'll have to try making one of these blankets myself after returning home. I can certainly understand how Chloe was taken off guard by this bed. Succubi, given their nature, can get quite invested in beds and such. Sister, it'll be hot with both of us in bed, so let's use this thinner blanket instead. Rokuko picks up the thin blanket on the massage chair and brings it over. She seems quite used to doing that. Kaima hasn't laid his hands on her, has he? He better not have. Over here, sister. 
Rokuko gets on one side of the bed and, leaving plenty of empty space for me, pats the other side. I, I feel a happiness that's difficult to describe right now. A trembling happiness that feels as if it's filling my entire body. I get into the bed as invited and, like a pair of happy sisters, I do think we truly are a pair of happy sisters, but in any case, like a pair of happy sisters, we nestle together and fall into a blissful sleep. The comfortable bed is nice, but that's not important to me. What I truly care about is the fact I'm sleeping together with Rokuko. Dungeon cores don't need actual sleep. But even with that aside, up until now, Rokuko hasn't had the leeway necessary to do things such as sleep. I myself had forced her to live in dangerous, rough conditions in order to hide from the soldiers of God. Just cause or not, I cannot help but feel guilt and regret over what I put her through. With that in mind, perhaps I should feel grateful for Kaima. Or at least right now. If he makes Rokuko unhappy for any reason, I will never forgive him. But in any case, this experience is certainly worth 100 gold coins. Day 68 Hashtag Kaima's Perspective 25 Gold Pieces No Question Haku gave me a small bag packed with gold pieces first thing in the morning. Uh, what? That is how much a night's stay in your suite is worth. Twenty-five gold pieces per person, and thus fifty gold pieces for two people. A copper piece was equivalent to about one hundred yen. So one hundred of those would be worth ten thousand yen, or one silver piece. Now taking it a step further, a hundred of those would be worth one million yen, or one gold piece and she just gave me fifty gold pieces. In other words, fifty million yen. I had definitely delivered Haku's food through Rokuko with instructions to get in the onsen together with her in hopes of boosting the price as much as possible, but fifty million yen for a single night's stay was more than I had ever imagined. And on top of that, Haku put another thirteen gold pieces on the counter. And as for the food, one gold piece is simply too little for a meal of that caliber. I know the special circumstances under which you are acquiring the food, but normal inns would charge around ten gold pieces for such a meal. You should raise the price to five gold pieces at the least. Here is my payment for our meals, splitting the difference, with Rokuko's included. Five million yen per meal? A. Child's Deluxe Lunch, 10 dp, and Cream Soda, 8 dp, is worth five million yen. Inflation is a hell of a drug. Economically speaking, I'm making over 99% net profit from this. I mean, I definitely want to earn as much as I can from this, but I kind of feel like I'm ripping people off. Like, sure, it's deluxe, but I literally fed a child's lunch to Haku, and she's paying this much for it. Ichika also said that the meal would be worth five gold coins, but it just... Honestly, I feel like this is a bit much. Are you suggesting that you cannot trust my opinion? It seems you do not fully agree with me, so I will explain my reasoning in more detail. However, she was kind enough to elaborate for me. All right. Sorry. First of all, I assume that you attempted to match the price to how much DP you spent on the food. However, the resulting price feels lacking and inconsiderate of such costs as transportation and labor. For example, cherries were apparently fruits grown in a distant eastern country called Wakoku. A single one of them would cost fifty silvers in Saya. They rotted quickly, so fresh cherries had to be stored in storage. And the only adventurers with storage going back and forth between Saya and Wakoku were generally A-rank adventurers. Sending an A-rank adventurer that far on a delivery quest would run you up five gold pieces at least. To make up for that, you would buy in bulk, and subtracting the cost of the cherries you ended up with. Fifty silvers per cherry. Makes sense. I never considered that until she brought it up. Yeah, the only reason I could buy stuff like vegetable stuffed bread rolls for cheap in Japan is thanks to factories, mass production, and a globalized economy with cheap shipping. Recreating Japanese recipes in this fantasy world that doesn't have factories, or even the recipes for the food will naturally lead to a lot of invisible costs coming out of seemingly nowhere. This world has magic and dungeons, but it hasn't developed any forms of mass production yet. Crap. I made a big mistake trying to equate one copper to 100 yen. 
thanks to making a shortcut between this world's money and Japan's money, I ended up calculating prices based on what they would be worth in Japan. Haku's suggested price for the A-rank meal is basically exactly what Ichika suggested to me. She should have worked a little harder to convince me. Oh, wait. Slaves can't really backtalk their masters too much. Right. This is completely my fault. By the way, I suppose it would be best for me to tip Rokoko directly with DP, yes? Yeah, yeah? That sounds good to me. Okay, Rokoko. Open wide. All right, yo. Haku asked Rokoko to prepare for the DP transfer. Okay, okay. Here comes another kiss scene. Or so I thought, but then Haku thrust her finger into Rokoko's mouth. And them? Come now, don't pull away. Loosen up your shoulders and relax. Okay? Let it flow over you. And then and. Haku's cheeks flushed slightly as Rokoko sucked on her finger desperately, ears bright red. Th this is a... Uh, yeah, this is something. Really gets the blood flowing. After a while of that, Haku pulled her finger out of Rokoko's mouth. A small string of saliva bridged the gap between them. You aren't going to kiss her this time? Correct. Now that Rokoko has made her debut as a public dungeon, I imagine she will end up in dungeon battles with other cores that come to duel her. She needed to learn how to accept DP from them without using her mouth. Uh, I can understand all that. But why are you licking Rokuko's saliva off your finger? I almost pointed that out, but decided not to. Her murderous glares were bad for my heart. By the way, speaking of other dungeon cores, did you know that there's another dungeon in Saya Mountain? It's on the other side of the mountain, more or less, so I imagine you won't be seeing them any time soon. Haku said that without a care in the world. Haku, do you know what the word flag means? Flag? Like those tiny ones you put into the glutton sets, omelette rice? Air. Never mind. I'm not sure why, but I've got a really bad feeling about this. Suddenly, I remembered the egg that Rokuko had got with her 10,000 DP. We didn't know what it was, but Haku might. And so, I had her look at the egg that for some reason had grown to the size of a soft ball. I, uh, I'm pretty sure eggs aren't supposed to get bigger. This is weird. I wonder if it's going to get even bigger. Here, sister. Do you know what it is? Oh my. It's been a long time since I've seen one, but I believe this is an immortal phoenix egg. Phoenixes are quite tasty, you know. Haku's inspection revealed that it was a phoenix egg. Apparently, they tasted pretty good. I wonder if you could just keep eating the same phoenix over and over? I'm pretty sure they're immortal or something. They are like big clumps of mana, so their blood is useful for making medicine. Phoenixes are truly useful in many ways, though they aren't too powerful as monsters. They're not strong? Although they revive on their own after dying, they're more or less birds that are constantly on fire. They're classified as B-rank monsters due to their rarity, but in a fight they're weak enough for a single C-rank adventurer to defeat them. Their primary advantage is that they don't use DP when reviving, I suppose. They're weak, huh? Guess this guy's not gonna be a boss in our dungeon. Might be smart to have him wander the dungeon as a rare monster or something, though. By the way, you'll want to really heat up the egg if you want it to hatch. I suggest throwing it into a fire. Though it wouldn't die even if you froze it or something of the sort. Egg or not, it is still an immortal phoenix. It would also revive even if I broke its egg. It would revive. As an egg. How it worked was a mystery. Apparently, the only thing that could kill a phoenix was old age. Though they turn into eggs after reaching old age, so it was questionable whether or not they truly died. Wow, an immortal phoenix. Thanks for telling us, sister. I really want to thank you, but I'm not sure how. Thufufu. It's the thought that counts, Rokuko. Ah, but there is one thing. Erm, I would quite like the, um, the massage chair from the room. W, would that be possible? I'll pay in DP if necessary. Oh, hell yeah. It's money making time. Time to wring as much DP out of her as I can. Oh, that thing? It just tickles me. I don't think it feels good at all. 
Let's just give it to her for free, Kaima. How about no? Is what I'd like to say, but Haku, you've been a good friend to us. I don't mind giving it to you for free. Oh my, really? I'm quite happy to hear that. Haku's smile was filled with suspicion and her eyes practically pierced my soul, trying to figure out what I was planning. I smiled back at her as brightly as I could. My face muscles hurt. Seriously, I'm just being nice here. Well, I'd be pretty grateful if you tell me about that dungeon on the other side of the mountain. I get the feeling that they might end up posing some problems for us later. Oh my my, that's no problem at all. Haku gave a slight smile and began telling me information I wanted to know. The dungeon was known as the Flame Caverns. They were indeed on the opposite side of the mountain from us. Adventurers needed to be crank or above to enter it. Same for even getting information about it. The monsters within it were almost always fire-based, though there were some earth monsters as well. Now, that was all information that any adventurer, sea rank or above, could get at the guild. Everything after that was information I could only get from Haku herself. The dungeon core is a salamander type. Its number is 112. Salamander type, huh? Furthermore, the Flame Caverns had a dungeon master as well. And that master was a dragon, even. Apparently it was a red dragon that had originally been living in Tsaya Mountain long ago. Dragons have a tendency to be attracted to shiny objects. I imagine their dungeon is absolutely filled with treasure. Air, I'm more worried about the fact that dragons can become dungeon masters. Anyone with intelligence can become the master of a core they match wavelengths with. Though I believe there are some other requirements involved, with names and such. Masters tend not to advertise themselves very much, so it's still mostly unknown what requirements there are to become one. Oh yeah? I became Rokoko's master without really knowing what was going on, now that she mentions it. Ah, uh, I almost forgot. You won't be able to use your rat strategy on their dungeon if you end up in a battle with them. Huh? Why not? The floor of their dungeon is quite hot. A good pair of boots would provide enough protection to not worry about it, but rats wouldn't fare so well. They would likely all be crippled by the end of the first floor. Now that's some good info. If she hadn't told me that I'd probably have summoned a lot of doomed rats. And, I guess I really should start preparing for a dungeon battle with those guys. Shouldn't be anything wrong with me thinking up a battle plan right now. Wait, wait. I might lose some sleep getting plans ready. And I was just reaching 13 hours of sleep a day, too. Anyway, that was basically all the information Haku gave me. Though as I mentioned, you likely won't be seeing them for quite some time. They are on the other side of the mountain, after all. Haku, come on! You're tripping a lot of bad flags here. And so, Haku left with clear reluctance after giving Rokuko one final hug. Her visit had proved very beneficial to us, both financially and intelligence-wise. Huh. Thinking about it, Haku is kind of like a bonus character to our dungeon. I'm starting to see her as a goddess of good fortune or something. Guess I should start praying to her. Oh, and by the way, I decided to let Rokuko do whatever she wanted to with the DP tip. I didn't want to even think about what Haku would do to me if she found out I took it from her. How much did she give you, anyway? Um, about 100,000 DP. Yeah, I'm sure she'll be fine if I take just a little of that. It's tempting. Anyway, about the phoenix. So, um, do you want to break the egg and see if it really revives? I went along with Rokuko's invitation and broke the egg with a lit torch. Have you ever heard of the Vietnamese dish known as hot vit lan? It's a type of boiled duck egg except that the egg has a live bird inside of it, just days away from hatching. It's a dish famous worldwide for how gross it is. Pretty weird, isn't it? Boiled eggs aren't gross and bird meat isn't gross, but mix them together, and you've got something extremely gross to most people. Ha! The mind can play some funny tricks, huh? Okay, enough trying to escape reality. The broken phoenix egg looks exactly like hot vit lawn. I feel like I'm gonna have nightmares about this. So, that's what Haku said would taste delicious if we ate it? Dot, you've got a pretty strong stomach, huh? I'm impressed. 
sincerely. Soon enough, however, the gory mess was consumed by flames and, with light particles gathering around it, regenerated as an egg right on the spot. The broken shell remained on the ground. I figured that the phoenix eggshells would be valuable for something. Anyway, the hot vit lawn. I meant, the phoenix egg apparently hatched best in fire, so I decided to place it in one of the torches in the dungeon that mysteriously never burned out. Not having to worry about its safety was pretty convenient. I dropped and broke it once by accident while putting it in the torch, but it revived in no time. It was another busy day. Let's rest. After I check the automatic golem I put to excavate the mountain and expand the dungeon, I go to sleep, my first and only love. Good night world, hello my dear sleep. Day 73 Several lazy days passed and soon enough I forgot all about the flags Haku had tripped. Rokuko suddenly burst into my room while I was sleeping and using Niku as my Dakimakura just like always. We're in trouble, Kaima! The tunnel broke through. I glanced at the dungeon map and saw that we had dug into some kind of hollow cavity. Looking at it directly through the menu, I saw a red cave sprawling out in all directions. Though I had to look through a golem since it was outside of our dungeon. Hey, Rokuko. Is this... It's definitely not our dungeon. What are we gonna do? This is probably the flame caverns. I see an adult dog-sized red lizard over there licking his lips with his red tongue, so yeah, this has gotta be the place. Crap. He just made eye contact with our golem. Retreat. Block the hole. I'll use DP to build a wall. I made the golem take a single step back as a wall rose up where he once was. The red lizard immediately charged towards it. The wall. Just barely finished in time. We could hear the lizard slamming against it repeatedly from the other side. Phew, that was close. One second slower, and we would have started a war. Kaima. I'm pretty sure that the war has already started. Yeah. The war started, and we just avoided it. Wouldn't be weird if that wall broke down in no time. We'll plan a counterattack while buying time. Just gotta put some traps in the hallway. Bottomless swamp and spear ceiling, right? The wall broke down and the red lizard charged through right after we finished setting the traps and preparing the golem for battle. But the lizard just charged into the bottomless swamp and got stuck. Undeterred, it pushed forward, trying to use all its strength to break free. We held it down with the golem and dropped the spear ceiling, skewering it and sinking its corpse into the swamp. No coming back from that. All right. Let's rebuild the wall and pretend this never happened. All right. We rebuilt the wall, removed the final five meters of the tunnel from our dungeon, and collapsed the ceiling. That should be enough. Of course it wasn't. A flame-covered lizard burst through the rubble while furiously spitting fire, taking up about half of the tunnel that we had designed to be wide enough for carriages to pass each other. In other words, he was the size of a horse-drawn carriage. He dried up the bottomless swamp, burned down the spear ceiling, and slammed into the golem, crushing it. You were... Who the fuck are you? A salamander. A huge lizard, flames shooting out of his body from head to toe like a lion's mane. And on top of all that, fire poured of his mouth each time he yelled. Either way, I decided to greet him. Stop! Dungeon Core Number 112. And I had basically confirmed that he was indeed the Dungeon Core. It was an accident. I'm sorry. You have my sincerest apologies. Oh? You're a pretty fucking honest guy, huh? Huh? Wait, this is a fucking dungeon, ain't it? Who the fuck are why you you? You're what? This dungeon's master? Show yourself. Since he knew that we were a dungeon core and master, he probably wouldn't attack us out of the blue. But just to be safe, I sent out a golem instead. Huh. You're the dungeon master, huh? Wait, this is a fucking golem. Yeah, this is me. And sorry, I didn't intend to invade your dungeon or anything. I won't kill you, so show your real self already. He did seem like someone I could talk to and the fact he didn't charge the golem down immediately was a solid sign that he wouldn't kill me before I could say my piece. Worst come to worst, Rokuko could withdraw me the moment I was in any danger. And so, 
I steeled my resolve and showed myself. After walking there, I couldn't use the teleport function since an invader was in our dungeon. It was a long and empty hallway, but he had charged pretty far into it, so I got there pretty fast. It was only one hundred meters-ish away from the entrance to our dungeon and the former goblin room. So, how the F-U-C-K are you gonna make up for this? The salamander roared in front of me. I mean, yeah, we're definitely the ones at fault here. Well, first of all, I'll apologize. More concretely, we'll fix the hole ourselves. And, all right, do you know what genuflecting is? Oh, genuflecting? Yeah, I know what the fuck that is. You get on your knees and kind of lower your head. Yeah? That's right. But do you know about the form of apology even greater than that, known as the genusness? Nope, never heard of that in my fucking life. What is it? Oh man, he fell for it with a name like that. This might actually work. I'd normally just bow my head and leave it at that, but I didn't want this guy looking down on us and causing problems later. Tricking him like this was basically asking for a fight, but I've been preparing for a battle with the flame caverns ever since Haku told me about them. Right now, I just needed to buy some time. When you genuflect, you show your remorse by lowering your head, but when you genusness, you lower your entire body to apologize. I gave a made-up explanation while spreading my futon on the tunnel floor. Hey, what the fuck do you think you're doing? Huh? Preparing to genusness, of course. It's such a sincere apology that it takes time to prepare for. All right. I got it. I'm glad you get it. I got into the futon. And then I made my declaration. For the next seven days, I'm going to Janusnus for five. No, eight hours straight every day. W-H what? Eight hours? That's not enough for you? Then twelve hours. I'll spend twelve hours. An entire half of each day like this. Please, let that be enough for you to forgive me. Aoriite already. If you're gonna go that far, I ain't got no choice but to forgive you. Heh. I was wondering what kind of master that number 695 would have. Looks like you're a guy who really knows what's up. But remember, men gotta follow their word. Seven days, twelve hours a day. You better not fucking back out of that. All right? Yeah, I know that. And so, the lizard left in satisfaction. I didn't know when he'd be coming back, but I figured I'd just keep on genusnizing. In my room. Day 7-8. You're just fucking S-L-E-E-P-I-I-N-G. The salamander returned, blowing away all the sand I had used to fill up the end of the tunnel. It had taken him five days to realize what was going on, longer than I had expected. But to be honest... At that point I just wished he would have stayed tricked for the whole time. I didn't want to lose my excuse for sleeping twelve hours a day. So, punk. You fucking with me or what? Honestly, I'm hurt. Do you really think genusnoozing is as simple as sleeping? Trust me, it's not. Why, yeah? Oh man, is that hesitation? I might be able to trick him again at this rate. Yep. Think about it like this. If genusnizing is just sleeping, then genuflecting is just sitting, right? NGH. That's a good fucking point. I'm putting myself through so much to apologize, and you thank me by destroying the clay wall I built. The salamander started to waver after I emphasized that point. Huh. Air ah. Uh, I. How are you gonna make up for this? The salamander took everything I said with utter seriousness. Gullible. This guy's really gullible. Salamander? A mo like gullamander. All right, Auriite. This time, I'll fix up the wall for ya. That's it. You're not gonna make up for mocking my sincerity and the depth of my regret? Sorry, man. Ah, uh, don't worry about it. I got a little too heated up myself. I guess twelve hours of genusnizing a day isn't enough to satisfy you. You, uh, I don't fucking know. Maybe? Okay. I'll order one of my subordinates to Janusnus alongside me. W-H what? I'll hold her down myself, so she can't move even if she wants to. Force Janusnizing. What the fucking hell? That's pretty intense. All right. That's good enough. 
I can tell you're damn serious about this, Kaima. You are a good guy. I am number 112 Dungeon Core. I am Kaima, number 665 Core's master. Can I call you a Tetsu? Oh, I like it. I am counting on you, Kaima. And so, Itetsa left in a good mood. Classic Gullimander. Didn't take much to dupe him again. A promise is a promise. I'll have Nika get in bed with me and use her as a Dakamakura. Just like I've been doing this entire time. Day 82. I thought about it some more and yeah, you're just fucking sleeping. Huh. Oh, hey, Itetsu. I'm surprised to see you here again. You sure have a lot of spare time, huh? Itetsu came again the next day, as expected. But this time, there was a girl riding his head with a red lizard tee, well, a rough bumpy tail that looked kind of like a crab's shell. Uh, isn't his head on fire? Is she gonna be okay? Who's that with you? My fucking master. That's right. And I know you're fucking messing with my husband, 112. Master? I guess that makes her a red dragon. Which makes that a dragon tail. Also, she's a Tetsu's wife? Wow. By the way, my normal body is way too big to fit into this tunnel so I went out of my way to come in my human form. Be grateful. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's the kind of gratitude I like to see. You're welcome. The young-looking red dragon puffed out her chest in satisfaction. She's pretty cute. Too bad she's married. So, Mrs. 112, what exactly are you unhappy about? Mrs. That's right, I'm married. Right, 112? Yeah. You're my amazing fucking wife. I love you, Redra. Hey, don't flirt in my dungeon. Sheesh. I get the feeling that she's gonna be just as gullible as her husband. But like I said, Mrs. 112, what exactly are you unhappy about? I personally think that my genusnizing is a more than sincere apology. Your genusnizing is full of bullshit, and I know it. Oh wow, getting straight to the point. She might not be dumb like her husband is. I'm lowering not just my head, but my entire body as well. Is there anything more apologetic than that? Here, let me turn this around and ask what you think would be the best posture for showing one's regret. Mm hmm? Air, now that you mention it. Maybe like showing your stomach and rolling around? All right. Then you'll be satisfied if I start genusnusing on my back, right? What? I will. I'll be apologizing in the exact posture you suggested. But you know, I'm surprised you two still don't believe me even though I'm going this far to apologize. It really makes me sad. And no, we're not doubting you or anything, all right? I put a hand on my head and lowered my eyes with so much for sorrow even I questioned whether I was being too obvious. But Redra reacted entirely as if she was in the wrong. Just what I'd expect from the Gullimander's wife. I decided to be a little more forceful. You know, if you really do believe in me. Then how about this? I want this tunnel to reach all the way from our dungeon to the other side of the mountain. Can we make something work? I don't think so. Oh? You really don't believe in me, then? You've got the wrong idea. Er, most of Tsaya Mountain already belongs to our dungeon in the first place. There's no space for your tunnel. Redra hurriedly explained herself. Would you mind giving us a small part of your dungeon, just enough for the tunnel? I'll pay you DP for it. Sure, for 500,000 DP. Changing ownership of the territory and moving aside the contraptions in the way of the tunnel would cost about that much. 500,000 DP? I'm pretty sure moving contraptions around wouldn't cost nearly that much. And we'd be spending DP to change ownership of the territory, not them. Is she trying to cheat me here? That's pretty cheeky for a gully wife. 500,000 DP is a bit too much, I think. I could try haggling with gold coins too. What would you say to an offer of fifty gold coins? Why would I want gold coins? Don't be dumb. We don't need anything but DP. Redra turned me down with a grin. Figures. I wouldn't have minded paying that much if it got us the tunnel, though. Wait, wait, wait. Dragons love shiny things, right? I should try showing her the merchandise. 
What if you bought each gold coin for 10,000 DP? I took out a glittering gold coin and held it up so Redra could see. Ha! Why would I pay 10,000 DP for a single? A single? Why you know, that sounds like a good deal. Hook, line, and sinker. I waved the coin back and forth. Redra's eyes chased it. When it moved right so too did her eyes, and if I moved it up left her whole face tilted up to follow. She was completely enraptured. But we're not done yet. She's still debating it in her head. If you're really on the fence about this, allow me to offer you a special deal. If you agree to buy all fifty gold coins for five hundred thousand DP, I will give you not only the free silver pieces, but also this crystal knight statue with absolutely no extra charge. You will? The moment I put the transparent yet shining knight statue on the table, Redder's hot eyes opened wide in surprise. The statue was about twenty centimeters tall. I had made it from empty mana potion bottles. I it's amazing. It looks like it'll start moving at any second. Amazing. It could move if it wanted to. It was a golem, after all. I had built it as an anti-dragon weapon, and thus had intentionally made it shine incredibly brightly. That paid off, as Redder's eyes were shining even more brightly than the statue. Wait. I remember now. Itetsu suddenly shouted. Number 695 is a fucking ally of the traitor number 89. Fire shot out of his mouth. Welp. Seems like Haku's known as a dirty traitor in the dungeon core world. Makes sense. She does hunt other dungeon cores, after all. And so, our negotiations crumbled right then and there. Why? D does that mean I don't get to have that knight statue? You don't. I don't know the fucking details, but I do know that any friends of the traitor are enemies to us. But I still want that knight statue. Do something, 112. It's a dungeon battle match. We bet the domain for the passage and you bet 50 gold coins and the figurine. Thus I began my preparations for the match. The victory condition is to capture the flame cavern. These are the irregular rules that was made to balance the match. We attack the, the flame cavern for one day. If we beat the fifth floor boss room, we win. Or, if we touch the dungeon core on the lowest floor we win completely. If we beat the fifth floor boss, they give us the domain to create the crossing passage. If we touch the dungeon floor on the lowest floor, they give us half of the Mount Saya. If we lose we give the crystal knight figurine, gold, and silver coins. Then the match will start in a week. Wait a moment. I said to Redder the dragon, wife of Itetsu the Gullamander. There's two figurines, this is one of the set. Please take it. When I showed her the other figurine Redder's eyes started shining again. Thank you, she said, you are good guys. Not at all, then, see you in a week. What's with that grin on Kaima's face? After a week, day 89. Hey Kaima, are you ready? The battle will last one day. If we defend it, we win. If you beat the fifth floor, you win. If you can touch the core and lowest floor, we will give you half of the mountain. I know you can start any time, said the flame cavern couple who contacted us through Dungeon Monitor. Can you come to me fast? Otherwise I will have nothing to do, Redra said laughing trying to provoke us. It's useless to provoke us we are going to win, said Rokuko with a cracking voice, and looked in my direction worried thinking if we will actually win one week before day 82. I can't believe we're having a dungeon battle with dungeon core number 112. CC can we really win this? Rokuko asked me that in a panicky tone after I returned to the inn. Well I've got some plans that should help us win. I have been thinking about this for a long time. Really? How could trip so many flags we were guaranteed to meet them soon? Of course I started planning on how to deal with them. We win just by getting past the fifth floor of their flame caverns. Haku's dungeon only had five floors, remember? Uh huh. Do you think I, who beat Haku san, would lose to some dragon? Rather than that, I am looking forward to fight a dragon. I said confidently after hearing me say that. Rokuko smiled and blushed a little. So we just need a way to get into the boss. I want to see the dragon fighting. I will do my best, I replied. By the way, what is this golem? Ah, uh, this? 
I had found a way to fabricate Phoenix's eggshells. The golem threw the eggshells behind it each time it broke the Phoenix egg. It would then wait about a second for the resulting hot fit lawn to burst into light and revive, after which it would break the new egg, starting the process anew. There was already a mountain of eggshells right behind the golem. Kaima, What are you doing to my little Fenny? Well, I mean, I was thinking that the eggshells might be strong enough to resist even a dragon's fire breath. Don't you think that's too good to pass up? You think it's worth being this evil? My poor little Fenny. A phoenix knows no death. Its life is one of endless reincarnation. Saying something cool doesn't give you a free pass. I will never forgive you if you lose, Rokuko said to me angrily while pouting her cheeks. Rokuko and I were stationed in the master room, along with Niku and Ichika. All right, Ichika. Open the door. You got it, boss. I ordered her to open the door of the room that I had thoroughly, thoroughly prepared for just this occasion. Hashtag Atetsu's perspective. But even after the gates open, no monster army comes marching through. He's taking his sweet time. Bold move for someone with a one-day time limit. Is he just not tack? I immediately fall silent. A huge flood of water has started racing through the portal. What? The water races down our tunnels like an unstoppable tsunami. It hisses as it covers our hot floors and walls, washing away our red lizard armies without slowing down for a second. What? I can't believe it. This is a volcano. The only entrance to our dungeon is at the mountain peak. At worst, a little rain water gets in sometimes. And yet here is a flood of water, dominating our halls. It's flowing with so much force that our red lizards are getting stuck at the end of the flood, crumbling into a meaty ball of useless underlings. The water races through our dungeon and reaches the second floor in no time at all. The green dots signifying allies on the map slowly drop in number as red lizards die from drowning, being slammed into walls, or just being crushed by their fellow lizards. W.H. What's going on? What the hell is this? Ha ha. What the fuck? On top of everything, the tsunami is somehow filled with enemies. I check the map and see it filled with so many red dots it's like the screen is getting painted over in red. That meant that letting the water keep flowing was a bad idea. It's already smashed through the second floor and reached the third floor, only thirty minutes after this dungeon battle started. He's conquered two floors already. At this rate, he might actually be able to reach the fiftieth floor in a day. Ha ha ha, he was actually fucking serious. Thirty minutes per two floors would be ninety-six floors in a day. Twice as fast as necessary. But I can't let that happen. Here's what I gotta do. Moving fast, I dig a hole in the still dry fourth floor leading to the outside of the dungeon. Naturally, I can't change stuff on a floor that's being invaded by enemies. I'll have to give up on the third floor and above. The water quickly reaches the fourth floor but now it's flowing outside of the mountain, along with a bunch of red lizards. Heh. You're pretty good, Kaima. Hashtag Kaima's perspective. Wow, what is this? It's pretty brutal. What do you mean, what is this? It's a water attack. Pretty basic stuff. How is it basic? Well, I mean, it's a volcano with just one entrance at the top. What else would you do? And I mean, it's a fire dungeon. It'd just be rude to fight a fire dungeon and not flood it with water. I basically settled on this the second Haku told me what kind of dungeon it was. All I did was pack a bunch of water sources close together onto the ceiling of a room in our dungeon. A very, very big room. Once the battle started, I opened the door and unleashed the flood. Of course, it wasn't just simple water. I had mixed in a bunch of plankton with it and plankton only costs 1 dp per 1,000 critters, so it was cheap. Since this world lacked microscopes, they had no way of telling that there was plankton in the water. Their small size meant they were hard for us to use, and that they couldn't really move much and I couldn't use their eyes to see, but given that they were treated as ally monsters, I could use them to map out the enemy dungeon. I had mixed in a few ball-shaped water golems just to be safe but they all died after slamming into the walls of T-intersections and other places. Yeah. 
water golems are pretty weak if you don't surround them in something. Itetsu reacted quickly. He opened a hole in the side of his dungeon and redirected the water through it. Just as I had expected him to. Okay. I didn't get to use them last time, but now we're gonna start invading the dungeon with the second golem platoon. Rokuko, me to Chika. Initiate plan B. Is everybody ready? Uh-huh. All right. Golem platoons charge. Hashtag Atetsu's perspective another large wave of enemy dots appear on the monitor. This time, it's a platoon of golems. But they aren't any golems I know about. NGH. Hey, those golems are fucking armed. WH what? They're golems with weapons and stuff. The golems are wearing rock armor and helmets while wielding shields, swords, and even short spears. But most surprising of all is how they're marching in a rigorous military formation, as if they were a human army. They're also carrying boxes, though I can't tell what's inside of them. Did he really need to use golems for something like this? Golems are weak on their own, but they're way stronger than your average human when they team up like this. The red lizards have their blows blocked by the front row shields, then get skewered by the back row's spears. Even their fire breath gets blocked by the shields, leaving them open to the spears. The golems kill with brutal efficiency, working together so well they're like an elite military squad. Our main attack force, red lizards, have been completely defeated. And before long, they reach the staircase to the next floor taking the shortest route possible. They're slower than the water but they're making good progress. And the moment they reach the staircase, another platoon of golems appears. They're also wearing stone equipment and move in unison. They advance through the halls protected by their fellow golems and begin conquering the second floor just as they did the first. And another platoon of golems is heading its way too. They don't seem to be as heavily armored as the first platoon, but they're pulling something behind them. It looks like a long snake curving back to their dungeon where it seems to be connected to something. What's it for? How long is it? The golems just keep advancing, stretching it behind them. Eventually, as expected, the platoon of golems with the snake thing meet up with the other platoon. What the F-U-C-K? Another massive horde of enemies appears on the map. But they're not golems. I can't see them at all. But I can see that the snake thing the golems have been carrying is swelling like hell. It used to be flat, but now it's packed full of something. Packed full of invaders. It's probably carrying the same water that first flooded into our dungeon. Ha 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 ha. This is pretty fucking serious now. Water filled with invaders is flooding into my dungeon from the tip of the snake thing. The fourth floor is being steadily covered in red enemy dots. I can only laugh loudly and buckle down to try and recover from this. Redra, I am counting on you. It's my turn. My hands are itching for battle, said Redra the Red Dragon. You know that. Take care and don't get killed, said Atetsu. Yes, I love you. One twelve, replied Redra. After saying their goodbyes, Redra reached boss room on the fifth floor and transformed into the real dragon, and screamed in a heavy voice I will destroy them all. We gotta beat the final boss on the fifth floor of a fifty-floor dungeon? What kind of crappy game is this? totally unbalanced. Just awful. Looks like the flood plan failed. I never figured out a way to beat the dragon. Did you, Kaima? Guess I'll just show you my answer. Let's enjoy our front row seats to a dragon getting exterminated. An armored golem peeked into the hole to the boss room. Gawa! The monitor was immediately overwhelmed by bright white light, then went dark. The other golems saw what had happened. Dragon fire. The armored golem was enveloped with fire so hot it melted his equipment, burning him to ashes in an instant. Uh, how freaking hot does fire have to be to melt stone equipment? Holy crap. Jaya Iyo. The ground shook each time Redra roared. I was only watching her through the monitor, but I still felt immense pressure. So this is a dragon, huh? I'm sorry, master, but I just peed myself. Ha ha ha, don't sweat it. I came close to doing that myself. Purification. Hayafu. Th thank you very much. I cast purification on meat, cleaning her up in a bubbly flash. 
I wonder if Rokuko and Ichika are holding up okay. Yeah, girl, don't feel bad. Red dragons are strong enough that a party of A-ranks should feel lucky to scrape by with only a few dead allies. If I were looking at that dragon up close, I definitely would appeave myself too. That's just how it is. Are you okay, Rokuko? I'm fine, I can cast purification myself. Rokuko, voice shaking, had fallen to the same fate as meat. But anyway, putting all that aside, I've got to do something about this red dragon. I said all that about watching a dragon get exterminated or whatever, so yeah. Hey, Mr. Golim. Do the thing I told you about. Hashtag Atetsu's perspective. Gahaha. I knew these small fries would be nothing to me. Redra laughed loudly while melting golem after golem with her fire. That's my Redra. But be careful, ya hear? You worry too much. 112. Just look, they haven't even hit me. The flood of water had definitely surprised them, but thanks to how quickly Atetsu had opened a hole to divert the water flow, the only real lasting effect were the puddles of water covering the floor. The only thing that held Redra up was the fact that all the water was marked as an enemy on the map. Her mind raced, considering whether the water was filled with slimes or something smaller, but her thoughts were cut short after a new golem came marching in. Ha, huh, they wanna die that much. W8. What? H, hold on. Ah? Uh? What's up, Redra? Oh, this is... Redra started to breathe fire, but hurriedly swallowed it back down. That threw Atetsu off for a second, but he understood after seeing the golem. It was holding a crystal statue as a shield. H, hey. Isn't that the statue he said he'd give me if we won? The match of the one we already have. Ha! Can't use your fire now, huh? What a fucking guy. If she breathed fire at the golem, the crystal statue would likely be damaged in the process. They had agreed to the dungeon battle largely because Redra wanted that statue. It was the worst possible thing he could have used as a shield. And gh, then I'll just use my claws. Redra tried using her claws to crush the golem directly. But the large claws of a dragon weren't capable of movements that delicate. They were meant for swiping away hordes of enemies at once. It wasn't likely that she'd be capable of deftly crushing the golem while leaving the statue unharmed. Grr. They were in trouble. She couldn't do anything. Even growling didn't do anything since they were facing a golem. A normal monster with an animal brain would have dropped the statue and fled in sheer terror. The statue-wielding golem, on the other hand, drew its sword and charged in swinging. Unable to swipe him away, she had to sit there and take the blow. Screech! The blade let out an odd noise and dug into Redra's scales. You? A magic blade? She hurriedly took a step back. But the tip of her wing nearly clipped the crystal statue. She folded them as tightly as she could against her body to try and prevent that from happening again. And gh, this is tough. The golem came charging again, with its statue shield held up high. Redra, in turn, backed off again. She didn't want to harm her precious treasure. That was all she could think about. And gh, what can I do? Here? What? In the midst of her running away, Redra noticed that the floor had at some point become submerged by water. Each step she took sent water flying everywhere. She looked around and saw that the vent hole they had opened was being blocked up by golems. The water filling the room was likely the same enemy water as before. Tricky. She inhaled deeply to let loose a wave of fire on the golems blocking the hole. But the golem she had been fighting with dashed over to them, crystal statue gleaming brightly. Aya! She once again had to swallow her fire before letting it loose. A puff of heat blasted through her lips. Redra couldn't bear to remain in the room unable to attack her enemies. She was physically strong enough that she could continue chasing the golems around for the rest of the day, but not mentally. What should I do? This isn't a fight. Do something, 112. Do something. Redra, the dungeon master, said that to Itetsu. Ah. Here we fucking go. And Itetsu, Dungeon Core number 112, had to grant that wish by any means necessary. Even if it guaranteed their defeat. 
All he could do was try to make their defeat as painless as possible while minimizing their long-term losses. Hashtag Kaima's perspective. Hey, Kaima. How about we make a deal? Itetsu contacted me while I was giving orders to the golem carrying the crystal golem shield. A deal, huh? Depends on the deal. I want you to give us that crystal statue. If you do, we'll let you pass the fifth floor. In other words, they don't mind losing if I give them the statue. And, uh, I'd appreciate it if you don't pull any more tricks that make it impossible for Redder to attack you. I don't mind handing over the statue to get past floor 5, but that second part is a bit much. I'll make it work if you take us straight to the bottom floor without getting in our way, though. Ah? Uh? Ah. Uh. Redder can't fight like that. You've gotta at least let us fight in the final boss room. Wait, really? I just said that for the hell of it. I can't believe he actually went with it. Really, though, something about what he just said feels off somehow. Ah. Uh, he must be under the influence of absolute authority right now. Redder did just scream. I can't fight, do something about this. Better this than you flooding our dungeon and making us open a bunch of holes. Let's take this to the real boss room and settle things there. Deal? Ah, uh, yeah, that makes sense. The flooding must be really rough for him. Rough for the monsters and stuff in this fire-based dungeon to survive a massive flood of water. I knew flooding his dungeon was the right call. All right, which means you won't get in our way as we travel to the boss room. Unlock all the doors in your dungeon and deactivate the traps. We'll have a one-hour-long ceasefire. Ah, uh, and that hour doesn't count in the 24-hour time limit. Alright. It's a deal. Hey, Redra. There's gonna be a one hour ceasefire. Thus, our victory was secured and completing the bonus conditions became a lot easier. Um, uh, Kaima? I'm not really sure what just happened. But did we win? Did we beat core number 112? And the dragon? Rokuka looked at me with a stunned expression on her face. Yeah, I guess we did. We took the dragon down. Now we just gotta touch the dungeon core on floor 50 for the complete victory. And of course, that's what we're gonna do. Rokuko's eyes widened. Are you serious? Wait, what am I talking about? Of course you're serious. You bet I am. The whole reason I negotiated with the Tetsu at all was to set this up, you know? But we can't use the statue as a shield anymore, and we can't use any strategies that make her unable to fight. How are we gonna beat her? Well, naturally, I've got a plan. The one you gave me. The plan. I gave you? Rokuko tilted her head in confusion. Hashtag Atetsu's perspective. Giarrrrrrr. Why the long face? I did something about it, Redra. B, but now we lost the dungeon battle. I'm sorry, 112. If only I hadn't been so selfish. Redra was acting timid in a way very unlike herself, but Atetsu just laughed it off. That's not what the Redra I know would say. And who cares? We got the second crystal statue, that might as well be our win. Won't be getting the gold coins, though. But now we gotta let them down all the way to floor 50. So what? You're not gonna lose, Redra. Kaima woulda reached floor 50 no matter what if he got past the fifth floor, it's all the same. Not only that, but had the flooding attacks continued, the entire dungeon would have ended up underwater with severe damage to all its monsters and traps. Itetsu figured that out and knew that the resulting repair costs would be far greater than 500,000 DP. And now we got a promise that you get to have a nice, fun fight. Pretty sure we're the ones who came out on top here. You've got my trust, Redra. Yeah. I'll give em hell. I'm counting on it. You can fight all day without needing to rest, yeah? Go as wild as you want. Yeah. Redra cheered up immediately as the Tetsu rubbed her head in satisfaction. Hashtag Kaima's perspective a platoon of golems marched down the staircases, guided by a red minotaur as red lizards and flame hounds watched from afar. It was a truly surreal sight. Redra's ready to fucking fight. I'll guide you to the bottom, so hurry it up, all right? I could hardly believe my ears after Atetsu told me that. Absolute authority must have been messing with his head, or something. 
I followed the minotaur he sent over and it really did guide me to the downward staircase. He had even built a bunch of new staircases to take us directly to the bottom. It felt more like an apartment building staircase than a dungeon staircase. We got past the first 49 floors after only about an hour of walking. Self-confidence is fine and all, but isn't this a little much? Though I'm guessing this is probably just better for him than me flooding his whole dungeon. We still had over 12 hours left. Red are likely intended to fight for that entire time. Red dragons were dragons specialized for battle, and one could easily fight for over a day at full potential. They were basically cheaters in that although they had to inhale first, they could breathe as much fire as they wanted. Also, all my dragon knowledge came from Rokuko. According to her, All dragons are really strong, but red dragons are built for combat. Their fire breath and claws are top class. Haku's white dragons are more like jacks of all trades, so they might lose in a head-to-head -head fight. But listen, listen! White dragons are. And so, even though I asked her about red dragons, Rokuka wasted my time for a solid hour talking about white dragons. Thanks to her, I knew more about dragons than I ever wanted to. Apparently, she had dreams of following in Haku's footsteps and summoning a lot of dragons. Since she couldn't afford any right now, she spent her time learning more about them. If you love dragons that much, why didn't you spend your 100,000 DP tip on one? Huh. If you're gonna buy a dragon, you don't want a subspecies, you want one of the strongest ones? Ha ha, how cute. How much DP do you think real dragons cost? Even a baby costs millions of DP. So, what's their weak point? Apparently the best thing to do is get on your knees and beg for mercy. Or run away! Rokuko beamed a confident smile. Uh, that's not really fighting them. Or winning. I ultimately didn't learn anything about a weak point or something similar. The tip that dragons loved shiny things was proving more useful than anything Rokuko knew. That's Haku for you, our dungeon's goddess of good fortune. The golem platoon reached the boss room. Break time was almost over. Okay, Kaima! It's time for a full-on battle with a dragon. Don't worry, I just used the bathroom. Meat and Ichika used the bathroom while they could, and of course, I did as well. Now I don't have to worry about pissing myself when Redra starts spitting fire everywhere. Hashtag Atetsu's perspective. They were in a boss room more than wide and strong enough for a red dragon to wield their strength to its fullest potential. In the middle of said room was Redra, spinning her head around while breathing fire. That alone was enough to destroy nearly a hundred of the armored golems surrounding her. Though each broken golem was quickly replaced with a new one. Gahaha! This is it, this is what I've been waiting for. Redra laughed, extremely pleased. Nobody wanted to fight a dragon, especially a red dragon. As a result, few adventurers ever challenged the flame caverns, and this was the first time in years of boredom that Redra could really stretch her wings in battle. She was strong enough that she could invade a nearby kingdom and do serious damage, but Redra wasn't one to enjoy bullying the weak. She also had her duties as dungeon master to take care of, and Itetsu was her husband. She didn't want to leave Tsaya Mountain if she could help it. With all that in mind, it should be clear why she was having so much fun mowing down golems boldly challenging her. She was having so, so, so much fun. The golems even wielded magic blades somehow, which could harm her scales. There were hordes of them, and they all worked together to inflict damage on her. They were basically flies tickling her if she paid attention, but if she let her guard down, they would really hurt her. And that's exactly what she wanted. A battle with proper enemies to fight. Aya, I'm loving this. How many of you are left? How much longer is this fun gonna last? It must have cost a fairly sizable amount of DP to buy full sets of equipment for all the golems. That worried Redra, as it meant there might not be many for her to fight. But her fears were relieved by the sight of a new golem. It was carrying an egg about the size of a small watermelon. Redra didn't understand why. Is that an offering or something? Guess I'll make some fried eggs. She breathed out fire all over the golem holding the egg. But the golem didn't melt. 
or to be more precise, the golem's stone armor and helmet melted, but both it and the egg were fine. What? I've never seen a golem like this before. It was kind of white and kind of yellow. The same color as an egg. That made the actual egg harder to see, as if it were being camouflaged. Well, not like that matters. This time, she launched her claws at it. That naturally broke the golem apart. But it threw the egg away moments before impact, straight towards Redder's mouth. She had been in the middle of sucking up air to breathe fire again, so the egg flew perfectly right between her wide open rows of teeth. NGGGH? She reflexively swallowed the egg. But it got stuck midway down her throat. The egg had stopped itself in her throat as if it had suddenly grown arms and legs. WH, what's going on? Her airflow wasn't completely blocked. It may have been a large egg, but a red dragon's throat was by no means small. But it was still hard to breathe. And before she could fully process what was going on, the egg crawled down her windpipe, avoiding the way down to her stomach. Soon it reached something else entirely. Her lungs, from which she breathed fire. And then N N G G H. This feels so gross. W-H what the heck is? Slice. A sword sprung out of the egg and stabbed her lungs. Gah! Ah, gah! Redra stumbled, feeling pain and suffering unlike anything she had ever felt in her centuries of life. Although dragons had incredibly sturdy bodies, they were still beyond vulnerable to internal attacks on their scaleless organs. Lungs weren't equipped to deal with things going inside of them. She weakly spat out fire and blood in a cough that forced the egg out of her body. NGH cough. WH what the heck? She had swallowed adventurers and been attacked from the inside before. But it didn't hurt nearly as bad then. Dragons were strong enough to easily melt armor and weapons inside of them, anyway. A dragon's insides shouldn't even flinch from being stabbed by a normal blade. This must have been that something Itetsu was talking about. NGH. Cough, cough. She spat out all the blood that had pooled within her lungs. The cuts were already sealing on their own, proof of how sturdy dragons were. But they shouldn't have any more of those eggs, Ria. Redra looked around and saw that she was surrounded by nearly a hundred golems, each holding an egg. Of course, that was enough for even Redra's blood to run cold. Aya! You wa! She immediately started destroying the golems and eggs. Only once all the golems and eggs were destroyed did she take a deep breath. No golems came forth to replace them. Ha ha! What, already finished? Redra's wings relaxed as relief washed over her. She then glanced at the floor and saw an egg just sitting there. Perhaps she just missed it earlier. Humph! Smack! She crushed it with her tail. Finally, every single egg was duh. Suddenly, right before Redder's eyes, light gathered and the egg revived. What? The heck is with this thing? She crushed it with her claws. But within seconds, it revived again. Ah! She crushed it again at the same time. Revive. Crush. Revive. Crush. Revive. What? The heck is even with this thing? You ah! Redra, descending into a craze, continued attacking the continually reviving egg. Hashtag Kaima's perspective. All right, just as planned. Redra had become completely enslaved by the egg, meaningful wink. She was having a lot of fun dancing around and playing with it. While sobbing. Hey, Kaima. That's Fenny, isn't it? Yup. Your plan was right. He can revive no matter how many times she kills him. He's doing great. This isn't exactly what I had in mind. Couldn't you have had him, like, do something a lot cooler than just die over and over? Come on, he's an actual egg, not the protagonist of an action movie. Don't expect too much from him. By the way, the egg golems I made from collected phoenix eggshells naturally did not revive upon death. They were ultimately just golems, after all. But they were golems built from the eggshells of a bird that lived amongst fire. I experimented with the eggshells and found that they had enough fire resistance to easily survive direct exposure to the thermite process, that is, a fire of about 3,000 degrees initiated by mixing metal and aluminum. 
it didn't even leave a mark. Which led to today's strategy, Rokoko's genius, egg attack plan. At first I thought I'd try to recreate what happened in the Inch High Samurai folktale, but dragon stomachs turned out to be a lot stronger than I expected in more ways than one. So, I shifted my focus to their lungs instead. The egg-shaped golems had their magic blade feet arms and legs inside of their outer shell, waiting to come out whenever necessary. I had ordered them to sprout their limbs upon entering the throat, and of course, to hide them when spat back out. But the egg-shaped golems were very light. A dragon could easily blow them out of its throat without much trouble. That's why I ordered them to quickly stab Redder's throat before being spat out, thereby traumatizing her. I would then have the real phoenix egg, which looked identical to the egg-shaped golems, roll out and attack her. I also had a platoon of golems carrying egg-shaped golems around her just in case she wasn't panicking, that is, in case she wasn't traumatized yet and needed another egg in the lungs to set her straight. The results were as you saw. All I had to do was stealthily place the real phoenix egg on the ground and the deal was sealed. This is horrible. Thank you. Rokuko gave me her valued opinion. In reality, though, I could have had the egg explode in Redder's lung and killed her on the spot. I only didn't do that because it would have made me feel pretty terrible. Plus, I didn't want a Tetsu swearing to get revenge or anything like that. Being on good terms with your neighbor is important for sleeping well. It'd be hard to catch a nap if someone was beating on your walls all the time. So, how are you going to win now? Take a look at this. Oh, the map. Wait, what? Why is there a friendly signature on the other side of the boss door? Remember that crystal golem I gave Itetsu? Eh? Crystal golem? You mean the crystal statue you just gave them? No, not that one. Remember? Way back before the dungeon battle even started. Indeed. I was referring to the crystal statue I gave Atetsu the day we negotiated the terms of the dungeon battle. Or, in other words, the crystal golem I gave them. Didn't you give that to them? I said they could take it, but I don't remember saying it was theirs. But, but, didn't you call it a present for them? That was if they bought the gold coins for 500,000 DP. The deal changed after that, so yeah. It was some pretty harsh wordplay, but since I didn't actually give it to them, the statue still belonged to us. And despite how it looked, it was a golem, which meant it was our pawn. A part of our army. The golem in the treasure room is our ultimate trump card. I'm gonna finish this battle off while Atetsa is distracted by Redra. I controlled the crystal golem, making it exit the treasure room and look around. Now, where's the dungeon core? The fifty-first floor had nothing but the treasure room, Itetsu's bedroom, and a staircase up to the fiftieth floor. Nothing else. Soon, it got close enough to hear Itetsu desperately calling out to Redra to try and calm her down. Itetsu was right beside it, talking to Redra through the menu. The stand supporting the core was exquisitely designed. But it was short enough that even the somewhat small crystal golem could climb it. I stealthily made it stab its tiny sword into the pedestal like a climbing pick so it could reach the top. And so. Hey, Redra! Get a grip! Wait, what? The hell is this thing doing here? And touch! Itetsu noticed at the last moment, but it was too late. Using my trump card, the crystal golem, I successfully touched their dungeon core. A certain tactician once said, The results of a battle are determined before it begins. I met with Atetsu the day after the dungeon battle to discuss the terms of his defeat and reap my rewards. We would have done so yesterday, but he needed a lot of time to calm Redra down. Ha ha ha, you're a real piece of work, Kaima. That statue was a fucking golem too, wasn't it? You got me. I've never seen a crystal golem that small before. I didn't suspect a fucking thing. Atetsu laughed, seemingly not worried that much about his loss. Ha. Yep. You, uh... You don't think that was cowardly or anything? Come on, what do you take me for? It's my bad for not noticing the trap. Don't you think so, Kaima? Well, yeah, basically. Though I only pulled a nasty trick like that cause I couldn't figure out how to beat your lovely dragon wife head on. I time to give you what I owe. 
You can have the space for your tunnel. Uh. Huh. Wait. Wasn't our deal that I got half of Tsaya Mountain? Huh. That was only if you touched the dungeon core on the bottom floor of my dungeon. Yeah, and I did, with the crystal golem. The hell are you talking about? The bottom floor of my dungeon is the fifty-first floor. Ah. Holy crap. He got me. I had touched the dungeon core behind the boss room on the fiftieth floor. The actual bottom floor, the fifty-first floor, only had a treasure room and a bedroom. No dungeon core. In other words, I never even had the chance to beat him completely. I was doomed to a minor victory from the start. You've got to be kidding me. Ha! It's your bad for not noticing the trap, am I right, Kaima? Itetsu intentionally repeated the phrase I had just agreed with myself. I get it now. He made us wait to have this meeting until today so I couldn't recover from this trap. Even if I could think of some way to get the dungeon core to the bottommost floor and touch it again, it's too late. The dungeon battle is already over. It ended while I was sleeping, relieved that we had won so quickly. You trick me and I trick you, yeah? Hee <laughs> hee. Now we're equal. I thought this guy was just a gullible salamander, but I guess not. He's good. I'll accept a tie this time. And? Yeah. We're definitely gonna have a long and fruitful friendship. Day 90 and so, we completed our tunnel through Tsaya Mountain. We named it Tsaya Tunnel. Just that. Tsaya Tunnel. It was straight from start to finish, but it was long enough to take a few hours of walking to get through. Though it would take several days to loop around the mountain, so a few hours was a pretty big time saver nonetheless. Plus, it would encourage people to stay in our inn before making the trek through the tunnel or after getting through it. The tunnel was already built. All we had to do was charge people for using it. Our dungeon had finally gotten a way to earn free money. Free money. Ah, uh, that sounds so nice. I've been really busy managing the dungeon, building an inn, working in that inn, and buying a bunch of monsters and items while adventurers invade. On the other hand, I can just sleep while people pass through our tunnel. At worst, I'll have to count their entrance fee. I don't really know what you mean by free money, but it sounds amazing. Oh, it is. It sure is. Long live free money. Goodbye work, hello passive income. From this day forth, I will spend all day every day sleeping. I love it. Ah. Right, right. I need to ask Achika how much to charge for the entrance fee. Teach me, O oh wise and mighty Achika. Mm hmm? I'm gonna say that, like 50 coppers is the absolute max. People are gonna have to walk here since there aren't any good roads in the mountain, so yeah. And like, that means they're only gonna have as much stuff as they can carry. Can't really charge them much for that. We're totes gonna earn way more from the inn. Especially cause of all the people who come for our dungeon. What? You're gonna sleep through it? Ha ha, what are you talking about, master? This is a new dungeon, for beginners, with an inn right beside here. Things are deaf gonna get busier from now on, for sure. You're gonna have a lot to do, master. There's just so much only you can do, you know? What? The boss room was exceptionally crowded. That said, aside from the armored golems forming pristine rows on either side of a stone pathway, the only people in the room were me, the dungeon master, Rokuko, the dungeon core, and my slaves, Meat and Ichika. Rokuko was wearing a white dress that showed off her slender body perfectly. It was modeled after Haku's dress, so Rokuko liked it quite a lot. Meat and Ichika were both wearing maid uniforms, but not their normal ones. I had given them new ones for this occasion. In other words, we were all in full dress. Of course, I was no exception. I had on a glittering set of full, silver plate armor with a red cape. The golden designs made from a crushed gold coin were a key feature. Though, truthfully, it was steel armor with a surface covering of silver. And, just to be fully honest here, it was so heavy I couldn't move in it on my own. The whole set was actually one big golem so I could technically move, but a single slip-up would lead to me getting hurt pretty bad. I was going for the image of a king giving his people an audience. Me being the king, of course. And I mean, I was the dungeon master of this dungeon, 
which basically made me a king of sorts. I placed the three newcomers right outside of the door. With that, the preparations were complete. I had told them beforehand that I'd be holding a naming ceremony for them, but I hadn't said a word about it being this extravagant. Hee <laughs> hee. I can't wait to see the look on their faces. Enter! I called out and a golem opened the boss door. That is, the two large steel double doors with eagle decorations carved into them. The three girls who had been waiting behind the door looked towards me. A look of shock washed over them for a brief moment, but it quickly faded and they entered the room with serious expressions. Oh, I'm impressed. They know how to carry themselves. Stop there and kneel before me. The vampire in the center kneeled as ordered. In turn, the silky on her left and the apprentice which on her right kneeled as well. The vampire had silver hair and crimson eyes like glittering rubies. The freckled apprentice which wore a robe and wizard hat, with a simple staff. The silky was basically just a light green maid. Those three individuals were my dungeon's new recruits. The naming ceremony shall thus begin. I tensed my stomach to speak as powerfully and regally as possible. This is getting pretty fun. By the way, naming ceremonies weren't actually a thing so I had no template to follow. I was just winging it. Listen well, for I will now impart thy names upon thee. I stood up slowly, using the golem's assistance, and drew the sword on my hip. Vampire, raise thine head. As you wish. The vampire raised her head as ordered. Ah, uh, all right, let's see here. Her new name should be. To thee I grace the name of Ray. Understood. My gratitude is boundless. Man, I sound like a medieval asshole. Ha! Well, whatever. Too late to back out of this act now. I based her name on the fact that, due to customizing her spawn a little, she had an attack power of zero. Since Rei means zero, in Japanese, it's really easy to remember. Er, she looks really happy about that name. I, uh... Now I feel kinda bad for just lazily thinking it up on the spot. Sorry. Anyway. Next up. Silky. Raise thine head. Understood. This girl looked a lot more calm and gentle than the vampire. Rather than Ray. I guess the word graceful would fit her better than anything else. She kinda gave off some older sister vibes. Maybe some married woman vibes. Basically, she felt a little mature. To thee I grace the name of Kinyu. I will gratefully accept this name. Silky. Silk. Kinu means silk in Japanese. Thus, Kinyu. I thought about just calling her Kinu, but Kinyu sounded more like a real name in this world, so I rolled with that instead. Huh. What am I gonna name the next Silky? I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. Next up was the last one. Apprentice Witch. Raise thine head. Okay. Yeah. Yep. This girl's a lot more calm than Kinyu. Really, she's just totally laid back. She's definitely the kind of girl that doesn't give any fucks about anything. To the eye grace the name of Naruna. Thank you so much, teacher Mastir. Her name came from her being a witch, obviously. Huh. What does Naruna have to do with witches? Uh, I mean, witches are always stirring stuff in pots, right? Well, the word for stir in Japanese is Neru. Witches stir stuff so much they basically do it all day, am I right? Yeah, I'm right. Also, I haven't agreed to be her teacher yet. Come on. I pretty much gave them all half-assed names, but since they all came from a language that didn't exist in this world, I should be safe though they might actually be happy to know their names come from a different world, like Rokuko was. Thus ends the naming ceremony. All right, all I gotta do now is wrap this up by giving them their first orders. I went out of my way to set up a naming ceremony this elaborate all to tell them that there's a job I wanted them to dedicate their lives to. A duty so meaningful that they were utterly indispensable. A duty so vital that they would need to give it their absolute all day in and day out. Now then, I shall impart upon thee three my orders. Understood. Lay upon us whatever order you may wish, master. 
I let out a dramatic cough to set the tone. And then, when all eyes were on me, I spoke. Hereafter thou all shall assist this dungeon. By becoming employees of the inn I built near it. Understood. As you. Wish? Ray's stunned voice echoed through the room. Day one hundred the seasons moved on and it became summer. I was lazing around in my fairly nice room within the dancing doll inn. And in I built myself, I might add. Even though I had finally drilled a tunnel clean through Tsaya Mountain and found a way to get free money by charging people for going through it. That just backfired by making my end so much busier that the passage fee wasn't even worth it. I even ended up going out of my way to make a recreation room after enough visitors complained about there being nothing to do around here except visit the onsen. It was more of a recreation building, really, soundproofed and built a short distance away from the main inn. A lot of people spent basically all day in there. To sum the place up, it was a room where adventurers could play with the dice and cards found in the dungeon. Dice already existed in the world before now, but the playing cards were unique to our dungeon. Now more people were passing by the area. More people nearby, more people using the inn. Ichika's prediction had been right on the money. Fuck. Regarding the dungeon I'm actually supposed to be here for, I made it such that very rarely one of the golems wandering the labyrinth in first and second basement floors will have a knife. That knife being, of course, a golem blade, a special magic blade knife that vibrates and sharpens when you pour mana into it. Any adventurer that successfully takes down the golem gets their magic blade knife. There's only five of them walking around right now, though. As for the dungeon, the first area is suitable for beginners, as it only has goblins. After going a little deeper, one would be met with clay golems, and in the lower section I added a iron golem spawner, which spawns iron golems, and they can be sold as materials. They are pretty lucrative, so a lot of C-rank parties are raiding my dungeon now for iron golems. I also recycled the trap used in dungeon battle with Haku so it seems the lower area is a little hard to pass. I was getting money and DP from both those staying in the inn and those passing through the tunnel. Thanks to that, things were a lot more stable for me. Especially since I could turn the money into DP if need be. Which is why I had the spare time to laze around in my room. All right, time to do nothing but sleep all day. I prepared to get in bed and start snoozing, but at the last moment, the guild receptionist came to the inn. Apparently, she had something big to talk about. And so, I ended up in the conference room, talking to the receptionist while Rokuko sat beside me with a frozen smile on her face. What? Smithery? Yes. The blacksmiths wish to open a smithery here. It will be built some distance away from the inn and the guild due to the noise, but they do plan to build a branch office nearby just as the guild did. I assumed it would be best to tell you about this beforehand. Man, this sure is coming out of nowhere. Earlier today, a party of adventurers returned from the dungeon with the corpse of an iron golem. I am sure you know of this already, but it has been confirmed that iron golems are residing within the dungeon. Apparently, a dungeon with iron golems was treated as a gold mine. Or in this case, an iron mine. They were actually known as golem mines or quasi-mines to those in the business. Makes sense. Sources of ore are pretty valuable. And since the entirety of an iron golem's body is ore, no actual mining has to be done. A blacksmith can use the stuff right then and there. Of course they'd want to just go ahead and make a smithery here. Though apparently they were planning on making one here anyway to repair the adventurer's equipment, and so on. Nobody told me anything about that. Oh wait. That's what she's doing right now. Does all this mean that this place is gonna be put on maps now? Maps? It's already been on maps. It was added the moment we started building the branch office here. Wait, I thought dungeons weren't put on maps. Dungeons not managed by the guild are not placed on maps in order to prevent unready adventurers from visiting them on their own. There is no need or point to hiding a dungeon that has a guild branch office right next to its entrance. In fact, we are steadily advertising it to draw more people here. Oh. Crap. I might have made a huge mistake here. Soldiers of God will definitely come here if we're on a map. Ah, wait. Soldiers of Gods are heroes here and are automatic S-ranks in the guild. 
They can see information on whatever dungeon they want, whether it's on the maps or not. Though this is still definitely going to bring us more attention. There is one thing I would like to ask you about. Huh? What's that? When did you construct that recreation room? One day it wasn't there and the next it was, out of nowhere. A magician friend of Haku's popped it into existence for me. Ah, a friend of an A-rank adventurer. I see, that makes perfect sense. The receptionist and I nodded together. I was a friend of Haku's, so I wasn't lying to her. I just wasn't telling her the whole truth. The guild had lie-detecting magical tools, so I tried to refrain from lying to them at all times if possible. It was pretty annoying, to say the least. I was hoping she'd leave pretty soon after that, but we ended up discussing things for another hour. Having to stay on guard that whole time was exhausting. Day 129. I had decked myself out in equipment and went into the dungeon with me to signal that I was indeed an adventurer doing adventurer things, but upon leaving Goza grabbed me and dragged us to the guild for whatever reason. Two bearded, middle-aged dwarves were giving each other a bear hug in the guild's branch office. Gozu was the C-rank adventurer that had taken down the Iron Golem and retrieved its corpse. And apparently, Kentaro was the new blacksmith that'd be working here. A dungeon with magic blades and iron golems was perfect for a nearby smithery, so Gozu called over a blacksmith friend of his after coming here. Alrighty, Kaima. This is Kentara. Treat him right, why here? Ah, right. Uh, nice to meet you. So, why'd you bring me here? So, I'm gonna be building a smithery near here. I dunno when it'll be done, but if you ever need your weapons repaired, you know where to go. My dream is to make my own magic blade one day. Kantra stares at me for some time, and after a bit. Little lady, this sword, can you let me see it? Meat gives him her sword, and after analyzing it he asks, Is this a magic sword? Well, I will do a maintenance for you as a meeting gift. A free gift that sounds a good deal. If it's free, do mine too. That don't have any sign of use. He knows just by looking. A terrifying blacksmith. You all can check out another terrifying blacksmith video on this channel if you want. He took out a whetstone and started sharpening the knife. After a bit, he swung it around, looked at the blade from various angles, and then started sharpening it again. He repeated that several times. After several minutes, Kantara took a good look at the knife and then nodded in satisfaction. Looks like you're getting a lot of use out of this one. I can tell you've repaired it before. Good work. I like a warrior that takes care of their weapons. Kantara gave me a toothy smile. Right, it should be plenty sharp now. Just gotta top it off with a good ol'. Revitalize, and there. All done. Huh. Did you just use the survival magic spell revitalize? Not the earth magic spell sharpen? According to Achika, revitalize was a spell that energized the ground's natural state and somewhat helped improve crop growth. Sharpen, on the other hand, was a low-tier earth magic spell that increased a blade's sharpness. As far as I could tell, finishing a blade off would best be done with sharpen, not revitalize. You bet. Revitalize energizes the ground. So why wouldn't it energize swords, too? They're all made of stuff from the ground, you know. I hadn't even thought of that. Ores were indeed located within the ground, which made it part of the earth. I didn't expect this guy to beat me when it comes to magic. He's good. Your revitalize is basically just a good luck charm, though. I ain't ever seen another blacksmith use it before. Hey, fuck you too, Goza. My family's been using the spell for generations. And you know from experience my swords are sharper and last longer than any other blacksmiths, don't ya? Ha! That's cause you're a great blacksmith. The spell's barely changing anything. Really though, what would energizing a sword even do? Not like it's gonna grow legs and run to the enemies or nothing dot. Good grief. Swords are alive, you know? You're a dwarf too, Goza. You gotta learn to show us more respect for weapons. Speaking of which, the effects of spells could be changed by how you visualize them. Which meant that if you visualized revitalize as actually energizing a sword, that might end up happening in an abstract sort of way. 
It might even work like restoration magic for golems. I'll have to experiment some more with this later. Oof, we really got off subject there, eh? My bad. Point being, come to my place if you ever need a blacksmith. I'll mainly be dealing with weapons adventurers bring me, but I can make all sorts of practical things like nails and cutlery, too. Oh, right. Video games give most people the impression that blacksmiths did nothing but work with weapons and armor but they actually spent a lot of time making common everyday things as well. All right. I'll ring you up if I ever need something important. Leave it all to me. Though er, I'm gonna need a forge and whatnot before I can do anything. I'm gonna be making a simple one for myself, but it's still gonna take like a week or two. Come back then. Huh. That's a long time. What do you make forges out of? Eh? Bricks infused with some kind of material resistant to fire. I got a lot of red lizard scales for cheap a while back. I was thinking of using them. Oh, that's very fantasy. But yeah, makes sense that you'd make a forge out of fire resistant bricks. And, speaking of which, I have a lot of phoenix eggshells left over. I bet those would be good for his forge. They resist the dragon's fire, after all. I stealthily withdrew a single egg's worth of shells and handed them over to Kantara. Here, consider this an upfront payment. If you want some fire-resistant stuff, these should be perfect for you. Eggshells? Let's see here. Yep, they're fire-resistant. Shells from fire-resistant monsters are pretty good materials. These'll be great for my forge. I'll gladly take them. Sure. Just do a good job when the time comes. And. If you ever figure out how to make magic blades, give me one. Hey now, Kaima, you really think some broken eggshells are worth a magic blade? Day 132 for some reason. After the blacksmith arrived everyone around me was suddenly all about expansion. The guild was even talking about building a tavern beside their branch office. Why? Why is this happening? But there was no use crying over spilled milk. And people gathering around the dungeon wasn't all bad. We got more DP from them, after all. But I think we're getting a little too big. Nowadays, there's always at least one adventurer rooming in our inn. Master, we need you to replenish our food stores. Meat, who managed distribution of food in the kitchen, came walking into my room. Summoning a bunch of food was a real pain, but we had to provide meals for our visitors. I bought the meals, fruits, and vegetables we were lacking and handed them over to Meat who then stashed it all away into her storage, an alternate dimension where time didn't pass. Rokuko could summon the same food I could, but for some reason, the food I summoned tasted better. It probably had to do with how much we knew about the food itself. Suddenly, meat dropped some of the food I handed over to her. Luckily it was just a bread roll wrapped in plastic, so it touching the ground wasn't really a problem. You're not looking so good. Are you all right? I put my hand on her forehead. It was so sweaty my hand stuck to it, and hot enough that she obviously had a fever. That made me finally notice that Meat looked a little pale and sick. It was hard to notice since her dark skin was akin to a deep tan. I'd have noticed sooner if she had much whiter skin like Rokuko. Um, ma. Uh, I'm fine, I think. Meat, as a dog bee skin, had a significantly sturdier body than your average human but she was still a kid who probably wasn't even ten years old yet. Get in bed and rest. That's an order. Kaya! Ah, you um understood. I laid the sick meat into my futon and left my room to take her place in the kitchen. Crap, I ended up working. I groaned to myself in sorrow as I wiped Nika's forehead with a wet towel. She had fallen asleep in my futon. Nika's fever probably arose from exhaustion made worse by the heat. Basically, overworking in the summer. She needed some good rest. Rokuko came in my room with some water for meat, while I was sitting all tired out because of all the work I had to do in the inn. Are you okay? Did you two take a rest? I saw that the water she is carrying is lukewarm. Wait a minute, it's lukewarm water. But daily magic can't make cold water, right? She was right. With daily magic you can make water, but you can't change temperature of that water. Um, just use ice magic, maybe? So I used my cheat skill, 
Auto Translator. Change the chant of water spell from water become a ball to cold water become a small ball. Water. Seeing the cold water Rokuko was really shocked. Translation sheet is useful for these things. Perhaps meat is weak due to fatigue. She must rest for now. And then I thought. We have insufficient manpower. So that's how I started to increase the number of my employees. Crap, I ended up working. I groaned to myself in sorrow as I wiped Meat's forehead with a wet towel. She had fallen asleep in my futon. Meat's fever probably arose from exhaustion made worse by the heat. Basically, overworking in the summer. She needed some good rest. Which was fine, but that introduced another problem. We're understaffed. I mean, yeah? I noticed we were light on staff a while ago. We bought a chica, started an inn, and lately have been getting more and more customers. We had one receptionist. One cook in the in the kitchen. Both roles which absolutely had to be filled once our doors opened. But there were only four people managing the dungeon and the inn, myself included. That just wasn't enough. Especially since two people minimum were absolutely required at all times. Golems could handle all of the heavy lifting and carrying, so most of what we had to do ourselves involved interacting with visitors. Thanks to the survival magic spell purification, Cleaning and laundry were so overwhelmingly easy they hardly took any time or effort at all, but interacting with customers drained a lot of mental and physical energy. I only worked in the kitchen for a single day, but despite there being way fewer customers than there would be in a town cafeteria, the fact that Meat usually managed it on her own really impressed me. Like, sincerely. Plus, people hardly complained about stuff in the cafeteria. Ichiko would race out from behind the counter and deal with any issues that popped up, but since Meat was a beastkin, a slave, and a child, you could count on one hand how many times people complained. In fact, you could count that on one finger, since there had only ever been one serious complaint with her in charge. And yet I had been swarmed with complaints the only day I worked there. The heck's up with that? Things calmed down after I had Rokuko help out in her DP saving form. Seriously? Are they all a bunch of lilicons? Not only that, but, and I forgot about this all the time, using magic ate up mana, which was basically like your mental energy in a way. Mead had to cast storage each time she took out food. That must have been a heavy burden on her. I let it slip me by like an idiot since she worked with a calm expression every day, but she must have been pretty tired all the time. And yet... Whenever I used her as a Dakimakura at night, she would just smile at me without complaining a single time. I didn't know what to say. I'm starting to think she's too good to just be my slave. What's up with this super lowly? Master? Oh, you're awake? How do you feel? I rubbed Meat's head. Her dog tail wagged beneath the blanket I had covered her with, signaling her happiness. I'm okay now. Here, drink this mana potion and stay in bed. You don't have to be my Dakimakura tonight. NGH. B but, where will you sleep? I can just sleep in a random room, I'll be fine. Good thing we live in an inn. Meat sunk visibly after hearing that. She was sad about not getting to work. What a nice, loyal dog, girl. But really, thinking about it, I hadn't really been thinking about giving anyone days off. I could sleep whenever I wanted and although I had told the chica and meat they could do whatever they wanted when there weren't any visitors, that was pretty rare for us nowadays. Rather, we were in the middle of a long chain of consecutive workdays. Not to mention that meat had to work as my Dakimakura on top of all that. And she didn't even get any days off. Plus, I was giving her room and board, but she didn't have a wage or anything. Basically, she was working every day for no pay with no breaks. That may sound inspiring, but really it was practically criminal and made me feel terrible now that I had realized it. To sum things up, we were way, way understaffed. I had to do something about this so meet, Ichika, and even I could get as much sleep as we needed. Day 133 meet must have fully recovered after resting a little more, as once I woke up she had stealthily returned to fulfill her duty as my Dakimakura. She apparently snuck into my bed while I was sleeping. She sure is dedicated to her work. And she even replaced the blanket with a thinner one so it wouldn't get too hot. 
she's good. I had talked a lot about us being understaffed, but we couldn't just hire new people willy-nilly. Our inn was overflowing with secrets about our dungeon. Like how the light in Rokoko's room is actually the dungeon core. What could we do, then? Well, I could buy slaves, like I did with the Chica, but I really doubted that I would find any hidden gems like her among the other slaves. Even so, I needed to get some extra employees somehow. With our current numbers, I wouldn't really be able to take someone with me and leave the inn for any extended period of time. Despite having tunneled through the mountain, I still hadn't taken a chica to Pavela, for instance. Though we were getting a few visitors from Pavela traveling through the tunnel. And so, I decided to summon some new employees in the master room with Rokuko. The master room, a sort of subspace located within the dungeon core, was wide and large enough for us to summon a dragon within it. But this time, we were summoning human-sized monsters so we decided to just do the summoning in a corner. All right, this time, I'm gonna summon some employees for our inn. Okaway. Basically, you're going to want monsters that look like humans, right? Chloe, the butler that Haku traveled with, was in fact a monster known as a succubus. What I wanted was a girl monster that looked like a normal person, had human intelligence, and preferably could cook. Also, good feet. And just putting it out there, I'm not summoning any male monsters exclusively out of deference to the sponsor of our dungeon, Haku. I'm not trying to make a harem here. I swear. But human-type monsters are really expensive. Do we have enough DP? They are? Dang. If I wanted to do this cheaply, slaves would probably be the way to go. So why was I intentionally buying expensive human-type monsters? because monsters with human intelligence might have the power to use DP. Rather, they were probably so expensive precisely because they could use DP. Oh, I get it. Monsters that can use DP would be able to take care of the entire end for us, even if we aren't here. Yep, that's the idea. Anyway, I looked at the catalog, and yeah, I'm thinking we should go with some succubi. They're good fighters, which is nice and they're just generally competent around the board. Not to mention that Chloe proves succubi can be good helpers. That's really comforting to know. But what about, um, Redra, was it? The Red Dragon. I think we could get a dragon too, since they can turn into humans like that. That'd be ideal in a lot of ways, but we don't have enough DP to buy a dragon that can turn into a human. Really, we couldn't afford any worthwhile dragon right now and Redra still had a big tail after transforming. I'd like two or three helpers here, so. Then succubi won't be an option either. They're super expensive. By the way, they were expensive enough that we'd use up basically all our DP buying them. Though that wouldn't be a huge problem since we now had a stable DP income. Oh, I have an idea. Why don't we make Fenny learn how to turn into a human? He's still an egg but Atetsa promised to hatch him with Redra's fire breath, right? Oh crap, I totally forgot about that. About the egg, Redra went into a rampage just from seeing it, so I was keeping the egg with us until her trauma faded. Well, even if phoenixes can turn into humans, he'll be a baby. That won't be very useful. That's true. I wouldn't know how to teach him that kind of thing anyway. Ah. Uh, these monster helpers won't need to be good fighters, right? Right. Managing the inn will be their main job, not fighting. What about this, then? Rokuko pointed at a vampire. Wait, these things are crazy strong. They cost tons of DP. I noticed this while skimming the catalog a while ago, but for some reason vampires have a lot of variants. They've got, like, pages of variants all on their own. And lower-ranked vampires are super cheap. A lesser vampire would probably be feral or something, so... Oh wow, even a normal vampire is pretty cheap. Only 30,000 DP. I could make that work. It'd hurt my metaphorical wallet, but thinking about it in terms of how much we earn on a consistent basis, it wouldn't be too bad. We'd recently stabilized to earning about 500 DP a day, so even if we used all our saved-up DP at once, we would still be totally fine. By the way, higher-level vampires cost a little over 10 million DP. They were called true ancestors. But don't vampires turn to ash when they get hit by sunlight? 
There's a lot variance, but there's even more customization options. See? It says immune to sunlight right there. Whoa, whoa, but that's pretty expensive too. Now it's 200,000 DP. That's what these options are for. Like, the option for how much attack power they have. They all change how much DP the changes cost, I think. The attack power option had a maximum of 100% and a minimum of 0%. Okay, now watch when I set its attack to 0% as a test. Rokuko fiddled with the menu to minimize her attack power, which in turn made the immune to sunlight option cost only 1 DP. Whoa, what? This is amazing. Not only that, but all the other weak point cancelling options were super cheap as well. Though classic, awesome vampire powers like turning into bats and the ability to use their blood as a weapon remained expensive. This is pretty interesting. Let's test out some more options. Right? And so, the result of us customizing the vampire like crazy. She doesn't have any special powers, and she can't fly or grow wings. She does have fangs and spirit and no weak points, but thanks to that she has zero attack power. Is. Is this even a vampire anymore? She didn't even need need to drink blood anymore. Really, she stopped being a vampire the second we made it such that she only needed to eat meat every once in a while to be fine. This vampire was basically just a normal human. Wait, actually, even normal humans can do some decent damage. This girl isn't even a human. But thanks to all that, her cost had gone down from 30,000 DP to 15,000 DP. She cost about as much as a lesser vampire. Only weaker. Well, she wouldn't be useful at all without human intelligence, so. Whether or not she's even still a vampire may be up for debate, but I'll keep her in mind. Might find a better monster, though. What about this silky thing? Apparently it's some kind of fairy spirit that does house chores and stuff. Silkies. House spirits with beautiful appearances that help the owners of their homes with chores. Good looks were a huge plus for an employees. They had a reasonable price of 10,000 DP, too, since they weren't very strong. This is a definite contender. Oh man, what about this one? A Zashiki Warashi. One costs 50,000 DP, but they look pretty good. They were a spirit that brought good luck just by existing. One might even be a good poster girl for our inn, or something. Really draw those visitors in. That's a luck spirit. But they're invisible to everyone but kids and people with pure hearts, so... Oh man, that's a problem. Our customers have got to be able to see our employees. Rejected. Too bad. There are witches, too. How about them? Witches, huh? Should be fine. They are human type, after all. Wait. Aren't witches just, like, straight-up humans? What makes these witches monsters? Eh? Um, they're magic stones, I guess? Oh, yeah? In this world, magic stones are what define a monster. I totally forgot. Witches had a few variants as well. Apprentice witch, adult witch, and sorceress. Apprentices only cost 15,000 DP. Apparently, they each came with spells memorized from the start. Though apprentices only got two low-tier spells. Really though, it might be a bit late for me to be asking about this, but I wonder how summoning these monsters with DP works. Do they get pulled out of some other dimension or whatever like I was? Or does the dungeon actually make the monster somehow? I think it usually just makes the monsters with DP. You're kind of a special exception, Kaima. And I mean, usually monsters obey when you give them an order, so. Whoa, what? Then why did I get summoned? Maybe the gacha is just special. Really, I think you're the weird one here, not the dungeon. Don't call me weird. Anyway, I decided on the monsters I wanted to summon. A vampire, customized, a silky, and a witch apprentice. I decided to get one of each kind in order to see which I should summon more of in the future. I'll just, uh, I'll just pray that at least one of them is intelligent enough to interact with customers. Vampire, silky, witch. Summon. A magic circle swooshed out from the middle of the room and expanded to fill it before shrinking back down to a circle in front of us about one meter wide. 
Then three girls appeared above it. First was a brown-haired girl with a distinctive robe and staff. Yeah, this has got to be the witch, apprentice. She looks like a normal girl. I'm gonna be ticked if she looks this normal but still can't talk or something. Next was a girl in a green maid outfit with light green hair. This is probably the Silky. She's got a maid outfit, so yeah. Silky. I doubt a vampire would come in a maid outfit. And really, I'm just glad she's not half-transparent, or whatever. Last came a silver-haired girl wearing a black bondage suit. By process of elimination, this must be the vampire. Though I don't see any bat wings or fangs right now. The three of them briefly floated above the magic circle, but soon gently sunk to the ground. The vampire opened her eyes, silver hair so long it reached all the way down her back swaying behind her. Her sharp eyes, crimson like rubies, shifted to focus on Rokuko and me. Greetings, my master. She talked. She can talk. Yay, Kaima. She has human intelligence. Eh? Um? Oh, the vampire's getting confused. That means she's thinking about what's happening. She can think. This is a complete and total success. Hell yeah. The vampire was absolutely devastated. She was sobbing and wailing incredibly loudly. Like she was crying her absolute heart out. Reason being, she had realized how weak she really was and just couldn't handle it. I'm not gonna pull any punches here. She's weak enough that a single goblin could beat her in a fight. And no way. NGH, I am weaker than a human. Weaker than a goblin. Me, a vampire. This is humiliating. She sat on the ground and started beating her fists against the ground. But her given her attack power of zero, she was really just kinda weakly slapping it. Meanwhile, the silky tried gently comforting her. She's got a real motherly spirit. I kinda feel like I should start addressing her as. Ma'am. Now. And my master is just a human. He definitely made me weak so he could force me into prostitution or something. I'll never get to fight as a real monster. Uh, nah, I'm not gonna do that. Though she's right in that I didn't summon her to fight as a monster. Anyway, nothing good would come from leaving her there to be miserable. Having no other choice, I activated my absolute authority. Dungeon masters were much higher on the authority totem pole than summon monsters. All right. It's time for you three to listen to what I have to say. That's in order. Understood. The three of them answered respectfully in unison. I feel like if I just said, Work at my and please, KT Chen X, they'd get depressed or something. Mmm, all right. I'll just bring it up later. Uh, first of all, I want to check a few things. State your race and names. I am a vampire. I have no name. I am a silky. I don't have a name. I'm you, an apprentice witch. No name here. Neat. Guess this is what happens when you don't name your monsters. Unlike slaves that just abandoned their names, these monsters never even had one. Looks like I've gotta name you three then. The three monster girls all locked their eyes on me after hearing that. The vampire in particular was looking at me with a shocked expression. Why you're going to grace us with the honor of becoming named? Named. I guess that's a thing. There must be something special about having a name. Time to ask Rokuko. H.M.? Um, yeah, monsters feel special when they're given a name. It's a sign that the dungeon master really trusts them, and they usually work a lot harder to repay that trust. Remember Gobsuk? He worked hard for us, didn't he? Gobsuk was a named monster, huh? That's a surprise. But, well... He sure did save our butts. All right. I'm gonna start off by giving each of you names, but I'll need some time to get everything ready. Wait here until I'm done. Rokuko, take care of M for me. Eh? So, um, what do you want me to do? It'll take me about half a day to get things ready. Keep them fed until then. I left taking care of the monsters to Rokuko and shifted my focus to setting up an extravagant naming ceremony. Hee <laughs> hee. I'll give them names in a moment so moving they'll remember it for the rest of their lives, and while they're all emotional, I'll tell them what their real job is. 
They'll be so happy about getting names that they'll jump at the chance to work in our inn. Anyway, first things first. I really need to spice up the boss room a bit. It's just a blank stone cube right now, pretty much. I decided to start with the throne. I wouldn't be sitting on it very much, so looking imposing came before comfort. Thus, I built a heavy and imposing throne made of stone. I put it on top of a two-step staircase such that one could look down upon invaders while sitting. That was a major point. A demon king could sit in a throne like this and nobody would blink an eye. And so, after lining the golems up, I started the naming ceremony for the newcomers. I told them their duty at the naming ceremony. Ray, the vampire, let out a stunned cry. I ignored it. Master. What do you mean, employees of your inn? Ray asked for clarification with a shaky voice. Well, I mean, anyone with a little brain power could figure out a monster with zero attack power wouldn't be summoned to do any fighting. But maybe she's misunderstanding something. I should explain in a little more detail for them. My dungeon runs an inn for humans, and I needed employees to deal with customers. Basically, you three are all possible candidates for some newly opened positions of power in my dungeon. Keep that in mind. Are you telling us to grovel before the humans and serve them? Don't take it in a weird way. Now, let's be clear. Are you going to refuse my orders? If you can't bear to work with the humans, say so. I'll need to give her another job if she would really hate working in the inn. Ray fell silent to ponder my question. Kinu the Silky remained still with the same peaceful smile as her expression, while Naruna the Apprentice which was staring off into space as if she didn't understand what anyone was saying. Uh, I'm getting kind of worried now. No, I won't refuse. I will accept with honor any order you give me. Ray looked at me with determination in her eyes. Hell yeah, just as planned. I knew holding a naming ceremony would be worth it. I told the Chica to step in front of them. This is Ichika. She's my slave and has been working in the inn for a while. Listen to what she says as if her words are my own. Sup, I'm Ichika. Let's work the hell out of that inn, my dudes. Oh, okay. Why? You're a human, aren't you? And a slave. Understood. We will be in your case, Lady Ichika. Um, yeah, sounds good. Let's be friends, Lady Ichika. Ray seems like kind of a hard ass. Kinyu's probably gonna be the best worker out of them. Naruna, uh, I dunno. I just don't know. Huh. I created all three of them through DP, but they're all pretty different. Is that a species thing or what? And thus ends the naming ceremony. Day 134 I took Rokuko and the three new hires outside of the inn. This is where you three are gonna be rooming. The spot was only about a minute's walk away from the front entrance in the direction of the dungeon. By the way, I had them sleep in the inn last night as a means of getting accustomed to where they would be working. You're going to make them sleep outside? They're monsters, so that won't kill them or anything, but... Nah, I definitely wouldn't make my employees sleep outside. I'm gonna be building a little dorm here. Hmm. So, what's up with the mask? I had put on my Nerican mask to hide my true identity while building the dorm. There was the guild branch office right across from the inn, and I wanted to be safe even if someone in there saw what I was doing. Okay? I have a good reason for using this mask. Don't look at me with those sad eyes, Rokuko. You're using your precious DP on us? Thank you very much. Huh? No way, that'd be a waste. I'm definitely in major saving mode right now since I spent a ton of DP on you three. Eh? Rokuko and I started building in front of the monster girls. First up was making a hallway to to the inn. I manipulated wood with create golem to open a hole in the inn's wall and set it up for the hallway. Fast and easy. Next was the building itself. I had thought about preparing the walls and ceiling beforehand so I only had to connect them, but then I realized if I just built the entire building and hallway within the dungeon in the first place, all I had to do after that was connect it to the inn. In other words, I was using a modular building system. Just like space stations did. With Rokuko's power, we could take the fully constructed building and hallway out of the master room and place them wherever we wanted. That's our dungeon core for you. 
All we had to do after that was put the pieces together. What's the inside of the building look like? A bunch of two Tatama mat sized rooms with a bed and dresser in each. Of course, everything inside was made with Create Golem. So convenient. I had Rokuko take out the modules before connecting them with Create Golem and some nearby wood. I put a lot of effort into making this expansion seem like it had always been a part of the inn, and... Done. Though that effort was mostly wasted since my mask disguise would hide my identity even if someone saw us. Construction took about three minutes total. That was probably as fast as possible, given our current restraints. All right, all done. This module-based building should let me add to the inn without closing it down or anything. Nice. Your magic is always so useful, Kaima. Anyway, I hadn't heard anything from the three monster girls since I started. I turned around and saw the witch apprentice Naruna glancing between me and the building with shining eyes. The other two were staring slack-jawed at the building. I meant that literally, too. Their jaws were loose and their mouths were hanging open. I'd probably look like that, too, if I saw someone construct a building in three minutes from seemingly nothing. I looked at them and awaited a response. As expected, Naruna was the first one to snap out of her shock. You're amazing, master! I'll do anything, so please become my teacher! Oh? Anything, H.M. Now, now. Naruna. Girls shouldn't make promises like that so easily. I'll even give you my body if you want, so please. Aya. Wait, I already belong to you, Mastier. Uh, how about you start off learning to work the front desk and we take things from there? Thank you very much, Master. Well, guess I'm her teacher now. I kinda got caught off guard by how serious she was, but it might be smart to rotate between using her and meat as my docky. It must be hard on me doing that every single night with no breaks. Splitting the load should help her out. Wait, no. I can't be a magic teacher. I barely know any magic. The only spells I know are one of each beginner and two mid-tier spells, and I'm leaving the actual chanting to the auto-translator. I'm pretty confident I won't be able to teach her a single thing. Telling her to spend every other night as my docky while teaching her Jack Diddly Squat would basically be equivalent to handing someone a bundle of counterfeit bills where only the outer one is real. That's not how I roll. I'm not disappointed to lose her as a docky. I'm not feeling like total garbage right now. I didn't summon her to do that kind of thing. I'm fine like this. I'm fine. My thoughts were interrupted by the other two monster girls snapping out of their shock. I see that you are no mere human, master. I suppose that you are a monster summoned by an extremely powerful wizard? This certainly seems like a building worth cleaning. More rooms. More. Hey, watch it, Ray. I'm just a normal human. Well, I'm a dungeon master, but yeah. Just like you'd expect from a silky, Kinny basically lived for doing chores. She said the building was worth cleaning. Likely because silkies tended to clean everything by hand without relying on survival magic simply because they loved cleaning so much. The maid outfit they were born with wasn't just for show. Anyway, I successfully killed two birds with one stone by showing the newbies my power as dungeon master while simultaneously expanding the inn. I could leave everything else to Ichika and finally get to sleep. Only wake me up if something really weird is happening, please. So, working as a receptionist wasn't actually that hard. The hardest part about it was doing the mental math when calculating prices and such. But none of the math was hard enough that you couldn't scrape by with basic counting skills. Or to say it in earth terms, even an elementary schooler could handle it no problem. There was a time when I thought that, anyway. A distant, distant time. There were people in this world that couldn't read and there were people that couldn't do elementary school to math. Really, more people couldn't do math than could. Two times two is four. Two times two is four. What is two times two? Point eight? That's probably it. Now master will start teaching me magic, yay yay. I'm afraid the answer is six, you two. All three of the monster girls were idiots. You were just saying it equals four. This vampire's just treating multiplication tables like a spell incantation. She's not understanding them at all. Well, that's that, master. What do you think we should do? 
Ichika had turned to me for help after witnessing their complete failure. Uh, I guess multiplication tables might be too much for them. Makes sense, the numbers they're saying are technically in Japanese. Must be harder to learn that way. Really, it's impressive that Meet and Ichika memorized them. They must have really pushed themselves. Oh yeah, dude, I already knew a little multiplication, but what really helped is how my collar squeezed harder the longer I took to memorize them. That was hella motivating. Whoa, what? Dang, my bad. You can have as many curry rolls as you want today. Seconds, thirds, fourths, whatever. Oh, you sure know how to treat a girl right. I've got to remember to let me eat as many hamburgers as she wants. Anyway, now my job is to make being a receptionist so easy even these three could handle it. Luckily, they can read, so using the menu to check prices and so on is fully within their abilities. The math is the real problem here. Right. I'll make a calculator. I just had to make something like an electric calculator or a cash register. It'd be nice if I could just buy one with DP, but there was no electricity in this world and machine-like things weren't shown in the catalog in the first place. Guess I have to make one on my own. And so I made one. It took five hours and ten minutes to build. Just gotta have the three monster girls try it out. This is an abacus. How does one use it? Rather than making it look like the abacus is used in modern Japan, I designed it such that it would be easy for denizens of another world to understand how it works which meant putting nine balls each on a total of eight rows. It would let them calculate any transaction, as long as it didn't surpass 10,000 gold coins. Plus, I exploited its nature as a golem to its maximum extent, basically making it a magic tool. What's the price of five people staying the night and ordering four drank lunches and one C-rank lunch? Th the balls are moving on their own. Six five zero. Six hundred and fifty coppers. This is quite impressive. You can read this as six silvers and fifty coppers as well. Your amazing master. Basically, the abacus would automatically do the calculations after hearing voice commands. Building the abacus took ten minutes. Teaching it the prices of rooms and meals took five hours. Looks like our employee shortage has been taken care of. I settled on making some slot machines. They could just sit on their own without anyone managing them and they'd earn us some cash. Slot machines were a perfect way to entertain people while taking their money. Visually, they would look like giant boxes with spinning, drum-like things in the top middle. I made all the parts with Create Golem, and then added a lever to give it spinning power. I kinda just winged it for the insides and really just half-assed a way to make the lever spin the drums when pulled down. My main focus was making it spin only once you pulled down the lever pretty far rather than by pulling it at all. That gave each spin a lot more of. It was the drum golem's job to figure out whether or not the images on the drums matched after they stopped. It was also the golem's job to pay money if they did match. As a bonus, I made it such that the drums would stop on their own after slowing down enough. I even included a button that allowed the customer to stop them early. But naturally, I set the drums to intentionally avoid lining up for a big win most of the time. Only rarely would they actually allow the customer to win the biggest prize. It would happen every now and again, but this way, Aaron would always earn more money. What, you think that's cheap? You think I'm ripping them off? Come on, I'm not running a charity here. This is how all casinos work. And anyway, let me give a big shout out to Create Golem for making it easy to build such a complex machine. So convenient. Even if someone took one of the machines apart to figure out how they work, the insides are so half-assed that they'd have to conclude they're just magic tools. Very nice. Anyway, after finishing a test model of one, I called the chica over. This would be a good opportunity for the newbies to get used to manning the front desk, especially since not many visitors usually came around this hour. So, this is a slot machine. Give it a test play for me. Here's 500 coppers to start with. Oh, so this is a slot machine, huh? Leave everything to me. I'm gonna double your money. I mean, we're the ones paying out here, so it's all just our money. I get it, I get it. 
Ichika put three clanking coins into the machine and pulled the lever with a thunk. The drums started to spin quickly. Oh, they're spinning! Whoa, and if I press this button, they stop. The drums stopped after she pressed the button. Oh. So. Did I win? Nah, the images don't match up. Try again. Mmm, mm k Ichika put more coppers in and got to spinning. One hour later. She had gotten a few early successes that put her above the initial five hundred coppers, but by this point she had lost enough that she only had fifty left. She was playing the slots so hard I was kind of worried that she would break the machine. Guess I don't need to worry about making it more flashy. I'll spruce things up if people ever get bored of this model. And I'll make the next ones out of metal. Ichika's squeezing the box so hard I can hear the wood creaking. Ichika. That's enough playtesting for now. And no way. I still have money left, dude. I'm just about to turn things around. Oh, like, I was a single image off getting the grand thousand copper prize. Doesn't that make you want to roll again? I'll win next time for sure. For sure. Ah, uh, yeah, she's an addict. She's the exact kind of person who would take out a loan due to gambling too much, and then try to pay back that loan by gambling. And she didn't get better even after literally getting enslaved because of it. The addiction runs deep. Sorry, but you won't be winning big. I made the machine such that it actively avoids that. It'll barely ever let the grand prize images match. You. What? Ichika hung her head, crestfallen, face drenched with despair. Yeah, I honestly never thought I'd see someone so devastated from losing 456 coppers. Hashtag Ray's perspective. Nothing's happening today, either. I, the vampire Ray, am a monster. A monster's duty is to be summoned by a dungeon and fight off invaders for it. And yet my current duty is to serve the invaders. I recently was given the name Ray, and thus became a named monster. To monsters, being named is something very special. Some monsters are turned into bosses on the basis of their name alone. And yet, my duty is to work as a receptionist in an inn. A junior receptionist, even. I really would like to repay the dungeon for blessing me with a name during such a grand ceremony. But I honestly feel very let down by all this. What I really want to do is mow down these invaders. Crush their skulls and offer their corpses to the dungeon, earning a DP. However, Lord Kaima, the dungeon master, is a human. In other words, he very likely chose to survive by sucking up to his fellow humans, rather than fighting them as most dungeons do. No. Surely he is just sharpening his fangs until he's strong enough to resist them in full. He usually acts all sleepy and such, but his destructive aura was truly overwhelming during the naming ceremony. Just thinking about his exquisite yet tasteful silver armor and clear, glittering sword is enough to make me want to swear loyalty to him all over again. And yet he ordered me to work as an in-receptionist. Ha! I open the window in the room given to me and look up to the sky. The weather is poor, with the sun shining brightly. I think about myself as the sun's rays pour down on me. I'm a vampire, but sunlight doesn't affect me at all. Normally, vampires have many weaknesses. But a true ancestor is invincible. They display overwhelming physical and magical strength boldly walking the lands whether it be the darkest night or the brightest day. That is a true ancestor, the origin of all vampires and an unbeatable monster. Sometimes, normal vampires will be largely immune to one weakness common to their race. Those are known as true descendants among vampires. And I happen to be one of them. In fact, I am immune to all weaknesses, much like an actual true ancestor. That would practically make me a true ancestor myself. If the blessings were not cursed by the lack of any attack power whatsoever. Rather, I cannot use any of the powers normally afforded to vampires. I am the same as a human. No, I'm even weaker than a human. My attack power is lower than even a goblin's, after all. I sigh to myself again. As a proud vampire, I cannot let this situation stand. My pride demands that I be useful to my master. Yet here I am, doing nothing despite being blessed with a name. Now that I think about it, 
Kinyu is both cleaning in the inn and studying how to cook. Naruna is studying magic. I imagine she will be a big help to the inn somehow once she learns more magic. I'm the only one here who's just... useless. This isn't good. At this rate, the only path left to me will soon be servicing him at night. He hey. You're a vampire. That makes you a real creature of the night, yeah? Ah, uh, no. Please give my clothes back. Hmph. This is the only way I can get any use out of a waste of food and space like you. NGH, just thinking about that is making me blush. I couldn't refuse him either way because he's my master, but I really do want to help the inn however I can. I come across a farm after walking for a little while. It's one of the farm's master has golems harvesting. He grows several kinds of crops here, but they're currently harvesting sugar beets to make sugar with. H.M. Maybe I could help with the harvesting? Let's see. Dot. There's nowhere for me to help. It's all simple work golems can easily do. And since I don't have the authority to order the golems around, I just get in their way if I try to help. Not to mention that helping in the first place would be pointless since golems don't get tired. Grr. I can't even help here. I continue walking. Eventually, I reach the Great Saya Mountain Tunnel. Hmm. Coming here was pretty pointless. It costs money to enter the tunnel, and there's no reason for me to enter it in the first place. Ah, uh, a trader just came out. He's carrying a massive bag and looks like a trader adventurer. Most traders passing through here are bringing salt from Pavela to sell in Saya. They then buy wooden goods, dry food, and so on, which they then sell back in Pavela. Maybe I could make money by doing something like that too. Wait, or not. I'm not good enough at math for that. I need the abacus's help to do anything. NGGGH. I really need to study until I can do multiplication tables, or whatever those chants were. Hashtag Kaima's perspective. My dungeon monitoring got interrupted by Ray walking up to me with a serious look on her face. She had something important to talk about, apparently. So, what's up? Well, I want to help the dungeon more. I'll do anything, so please, give me a noble duty to fulfill. Ray looked at me straight in the eyes. Seriously? When did she turn into such a corporate slaw? Wait, this is a dungeon. Dungeon slave, not corporate. When did she turn into such a dungeon slave? This. This must be thanks to the naming ceremony. Though honestly, all I really want her to do is work the front desk. That's more than enough on its own, really. I want to be helpful to the dungeon, just like Kinyu and Naruna are. For the dungeon's sake, and for yours, master. I mean, you manning the front desk is already a big help, you know? You do not need to lie for my sake, master. I am undoubtedly a failure of a vampire. So much of a failure that I cannot even count a few copper coins properly. Hey, don't worry about that. I'm just glad I found a way to automate the pricing stuff. It's like a register. Wait, wait. I made the slot machine deposit coins on its own. Maybe I could make an actual, completely automated register. But anyway. A job for Ray, huh? I gotta admit, there's not too much a vampire with no special abilities or attack power can do. I know I summoned her that way myself, but I really hadn't planned on her being anything more than an in-employee. H.M. Maybe I can think of something. I looked down from Ray's serious gaze and noticed that I had left the map up. Wait a second. You can order monsters around without being strong yourself. I ordered golems around long distance back during the last dungeon battle no problem. I wonder if Ray could do that too. Actually, can Ray even make the menu pop up? It'd be nice if, like, the menu let me give others restricted usage of it or something. She is a dungeon monster, after all. If you can't let others use the menu too, I have no idea how assigning subordinates to sub-dungeons would work. Master, is there truly nothing I can do for you? Ah. Uh, sorry, sorry. Give me just a minute. I'm thinking of a good job for you to do. I searched the menu. Oh, there it is. I figured it would be here, but I'm still surprised. Let's see here. Restricted usage privileges. 
I can choose Gobsuk, Feni, Ray, Kinyu, and Nirina. Wait, why Gobsuk? The others are all white. Why is his gray? Oh, crop. Can I not remove named monsters from lists like this? Dang. We better stop giving away names like candy. I don't want these kinds of things to end up super disorganized. Since Niku and Ichika aren't in the list, I guess having some kind of connection to the dungeon is essential. Oh, Tessel's not here either. Maybe cause I made him through Create Golem? All right. You're gonna be helping me with a little experiment. You understood. I am a vampire, so I should have a stronger body than most humans. You may be as rough with me as you like, I do not mind. With her permission, I experimentally gave Ray restricted access to the menu. Seemed like there were a lot of specific options I could use to customize how much access she had. I set the range of her access to the dungeon, plus the inn, and... Wait. Limit DP usage? H, hold on. This has been here the whole time? This means I don't have to summon all the food myself, right? Holy crap. I should have looked into this sooner. Though maybe all this only showed up because I've named over five monsters. Gah, permission granted, permission granted. No limits on buying any item purchasable with existing DP. Permission granted. I'll just treat any monster that can use the menu as like, a dungeon administrator or something. I originally summoned these three monster girls intending for them to be higher-ups in the dungeon, so. If Ray does well with this, I'll give Kinyu and Narina menu access too. All right, let's see it. Show me what you can do. Yeah? Let's see what. And my boobs? You want to see my boobs? There's no breast milk though, but if it's for you, master, I will gladly give you my body. What? The menu. Show me the menu. Why the heck did this girl suddenly start blabbering about boobs? F forgive me. You were staring at my chest while pointing at them and poking the air, so... Uh. Oh, yeah? Other people can't see the menu. Crap. I just looked like a total pervert. Wait. Thinking about this another way. Could I get away with staring at a girl's feet by claiming I was looking at the menu? Ah, uh, nah, ultimately I'd still just look like a guy staring at her feet. Gonna have to give this dream up. I brought up the menu. I see. You can make the menu visible or invisible to certain people. You must have been looking at an invisible menu. That's right. And so, she gained the ability to bring up the menu. She could now monitor the dungeon and give orders to the monsters within it. Vampires are supposed to be skilled warriors, so I figured she would probably do a good job directing them. Okay. I want you to help me out with the dungeon. Yes. As you wish, master. Come on. You're really starting to sound like a sex slave or something. I didn't summon you for that. I swear. Afterwards, I confirmed that I could restrict and expand her access at will. She seemed pretty overjoyed to be helping with the dungeon, so I was pretty glad that the access restrictions didn't end up becoming permanent. Day 139 By the way, Kaima, why haven't we hatched Fenny's egg yet? Rokuko dropped that bomb after visiting my room to hang out. Oh crap. I totally forgot about that. Yo, Kaima, it's been a while. Actually, nah, it ain't been too long. Last time we met was when we built this room, which was about one month ago. That so? Guess that might be kinda long for one of you humans? Itetsu the salamander grinned his lizard grin as if happy about something. He was the Flame Caverns Dungeon Core. Despite appearances, he was a nice and friendly guy. He wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed, but he could be surprisingly competent at times. But he wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. He wasn't. The sharpest tool in the shed. Apparently she was still a little afraid of eggs. She was pretty pathetic for a dragon, to be honest. But I could only imagine what a phoenix born from the fire breath of a red dragon would look like. Is this really gonna be okay? It's not gonna start running around or anything, right? With everything ready, Rokuko and I took cover in the dungeon core room past the boss room. Redra's breath was powerful enough to knock back nearby stone golems even if they were just in the vicinity. No way would either of us survive in there with her. 
but we'd want to imprint the phoenix on us and all that, so I wanted to stay close. Itetsu, nice guy that he was, let us use the core room. And so, we were watching the boss room through Itetsu's dungeon monitor. Seriously, what a good guy Itetsu is. Total bro. Okay, here I go. Ha. Fuh. Redra unleashed her flame breath upon the egg, heating it up. And I mean she really unleashed it. Blinding light was shooting out of her mouth like a star. The ground directly beneath the egg was fine thanks to tile infused with its eggshells, but the surrounding ground was melting a little. Also, Rokuko looked at the monitor directly and screamed, My eyes! Or something. Fuh fuh. Ha ha. Why yeah, I'm feeling kinda tired. After about thirty minutes of breathing fire as hard as she could, Redra finally took a breather. Sheesh. That's some crazy stamina. Hey, the egg moved. It's cracking. Oh wow it is. It's about time for us to go in there. Hold up. The room's real fucking hot right now. The egg's about to hatch. We went to where Redra was pointing and saw that the crack had just about finished circling the egg. And so, the phoenix hatched. It was like a small duckling, but it had radiant white feathers. It just hatched and it already has feathers? I guess that's just how birds work. Or maybe it's just how phoenixes work. Oh. This is a phoenix, huh? Feathers don't look red to me. I've fucking heard of some soldier of God adventuring with a blue phoenix, but I ain't never heard of a white phoenix. Blue, huh? That's the color of fire when it gets as hot as it can get. Guess blue phoenixes are a thing. Which means their color probably changes depending on the kind of fire that hatches their eggs. Can I touch him? He's not burning hot or anything, right? Should be alright. Phoenix fire isn't real, hot fire. It's like fucking illusions or something. Same as mine. Pretty sure that Phoenix has some fire shooting skills, but you'll be fine if he doesn't use M on you. Give M some orders now to stop him from doing anything dangerous. Huh. I guess that's how normal dungeons do it. I followed Atetsu's advice and ordered the phoenix to not attack its allies. No friendly fire here. That should do it. All right, let me touch it too. Ah, uh, what? Are you going to try ripping his feathers off this time? Whoa, hold up. What kind of guy do you think I am? Rip off his feathers. The feathers of a phoenix. That might not be a bad idea. Wait, no? Uh, yeah, no. I'll just stick to touching him this time. I reached my hand out to Fenny. Scree! Ka! H. Hey, stop that, it hurts. Ouch. He sure does hate you, Kaima. He had jabbed me with his beak. Huh. But I ordered him not to attack allies. Does he maybe remember how I broke his shell over and over when he was an egg? Man, I didn't know phoenixes hold grudges. He needs to get over himself. TCH, all right. Best thing to do here is win his heart through food. Itetsu, what do phoenixes eat? Fire and shit. Hey, Redra, feed them a little of your fire breath. You got it. Step back a little. Rokuko and I got a good distance away from Fenny and watched as Redra breathed fire on him as hard as she could. Oh, crap. I can feel the heat over here. Hello? I think I'm gonna catch fire. Scree scree. Fenny looked pretty happy getting bathed in fire like that. He hey. That's right, eat up. Eat up and let your hate for me fade away. Wait. What? Isn't this Redra feeding him, not me? Crap. I've gotta learn some fire magic. And so, we brought Fenny back to the inn. Oh? What kind of bird is that? Ray, sitting at the receptionist's desk looked at Fenny with a curious expression. Fenny the Phoenix. Yeah, Rokuko named him. And also named him, before we even summoned you. Play nice. I opened the menu and showed her that Fenny's name was above hers in the named monsters column. Ah, uh, I see. Forgive my rudeness, Sir Fenny. Let us serve our master together with honor. Day 143 Haku came to visit the day after I was hit with the brutal reality of my poor farming skills. Does this woman just have nothing to do all day? Or so I thought, 
but she called both Rokuko and me to her room to talk about some serious business. We went with a complimentary cream soda, and once we got there, she dropped an absolute bomb on us. A hero is coming! A hero. In this world, heroes were soldiers of God summoned from other worlds. They had cheat skills and the Adventurer's Guild gave them an automatic S rank. Their main job was conquering dungeons, as destroying dungeon cores brought them great rewards. Some guy claiming to be a god basically wanted me to do the same thing, but I don't count because I became a dungeon master. Whoa, a hero. Seriously? I wouldn't lie about this. Though I do understand how you feel. Wait. Sister, a hero is coming? Not one of the soldiers of God you always talk about. My, my. Aren't you clever, Rokuko? Indeed, a hero. I've already brainwashed him into a loyal servant, so you have nothing to fear. Phew, that's a relief. I'm not sure what she means by him being a loyal servant, but at least he's not out for her blood. I'm pretty sure she mentioned brainwashing him. I'm not going to think about that. By the way, Haku's hero training manual was a very convenient, for Haku, book that taught heroes which dungeons were okay to destroy, and which dungeons were not okay to destroy. Dungeons managed by the guild like our old, ordinary cave, and our current, cave of greed, were, of course, dungeons that were not okay to destroy. Needless to say, Haku's, ivory labyrinth, was included, given that it was the literal foundation of the empire. So, that hero heard about the playing cards and such produced by your dungeon. He immediately started wondering if it had something to do with the world he came from. In other words, he fell for your plot to lure heroes out hook, line, and sinker. All right. I get it now. Yeah, makes sense. A hero summoned to this world would definitely find a dungeon filled with earth loot pretty suspicious. Uh... Haku seems to think that was some genius plan I hatched to lure in heroes, but really, I didn't intend for this at all. It was just a mistake. I'm sorry. Hiding my inner panic, I grinned and passed it all off as something I had indeed planned for. In any case, I don't know for what purpose you would attempt to draw a hero out, but do remember that this Wataru Nishimi is my servant. Hide the truth in accordance to what's written in Intro to Dungeonology and do return him alive, if you would. Intro to Dungeonology was a book for humans Haku had written to teach them about dungeons. Naturally, it was filled with lies and half-truths that benefited dungeons. The best example of that was the safe zone. The book claimed that no monsters could enter certain special light-filled rooms, but in truth, that was all an act on the dungeon's part to make adventurers let their guards down. I understand completely. Don't worry, I won't kill him. Fufu, I appreciate men who know how to strike a deal. Here, state anything you want. I'll see what I can do. Okay, here's a nice garter belt and some socks. Please wear them, thank you. Eh? Yeah, I really want to say that, but I probably shouldn't. Hey, Rokuko, why are you glaring at me? I'm not gonna say it. I'm not. I would like some DP then. I'll need to modify the dungeon a little to capture the hero alive. Then as thanks for accepting my request, I will preemptively reward you with 200,000 DP. Haku was a terrifying person that would casually hand out more DP than we currently made in a year. She wasn't actually a person, but you'd get the point. Not to mention, she also gave Rokuko a tip and paid for her in room. Haku's generosity had no bottom, much like her dungeon because her dungeon was so massive. Day 144 Haku returned to the capital after enjoying a full night's stay at our dancing doll inn. So, this is so much DP, we really don't want any to leak out and be wasted. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself, Haku. It was nice that she gave us 200,000 DP, but I had no idea what to do with it. I thought it might be fun to summon a slime and raise it or something, so I checked the DP catalog which thereby forces me to address a topic which has heretofore been the massive elephant in the room. There were two different kinds of slime monsters in this world. First, jellies. They were weak in every way imaginable. They were squishy, jiggled when they walked, were mostly transparent, and died nigh instantly. Of course, they had next to no attack power either. 
The only positive thing about them was their abnormally low cost of one jelly per one dp. That, and the fact they could be eaten. I wonder if I could turn these jellies into actual gelatin or something. They were the lowest of the low. Even goblins got extermination quests, but pretty much everyone ignored jellies. The other kind were slimes. They had squishy and stiky bodies that could deform so easily that physical blows barely hurt them. They cost 10,000 dp each. Each was especially weak to a certain element, but they were omnivores that could eat basically anything. Including humans, of course. These were the monsters people would think of if you brought up slimes. There were magma slimes in the flame caverns beside us, for example. Those were definitely weak to water. Oh yeah, and speaking of which, I had already set up jelly spawners to serve as food for goblins. For no reason in particular, I called a jelly over. I then squeezed it. Oh. Yep, it's just as squishy as I expected. Squish, squish. Suddenly, a flash of inspiration struck me from nowhere. I got onto the ground and rested my head on the jelly like a pillow. Oh who, this is perfect. Nice and squishy. It's not as good as my heavenly pillow, but it's not half bad. And it only costs one dp. Fwa. My man used Rimuru as a pillow. Anyway back to the story, I woke up from my afternoon nap to find that I had fatally crushed the jelly, with its death juices covering my face. Keep it in your pants, comment section. The weight of my head must have been squeezing its inner body juices out. Now that's a problem I'm gonna have to fix. Maybe I could cover it with a layer of plastic or something. Though, uh, the jelly would still end up getting crushed that way. Oh well. The road to a good night's sleep is paved with the corpses of a thousand jellies. Oh man. Now I'm really like one of those dungeon masters that use their monsters like disposable tools. Rokuko walked in right as I was finishing up. Hey, Kaima. Shouldn't we be planning for the hero? Me, honestly, we don't really need to. Eh? Really? Haku gave you 200,000 DP and you aren't even going to use any of it? Yeah, I mean, I already have a plan to deal with the hero and I honestly don't think we'll really need to do much. Even if he got all the way through our dungeon, all we'd lose is some of our homemade golem blades after he beat the iron Hanawa golem. Thanks to Haku's teachings, brainwashing, we didn't need to worry about him destroying the core. Not to mention that the core inside the dungeon was just a dummy core, with the real one being inside Rokuko's room. Though I was starting to think that leaving it in her room was actually not exactly the safest thing in the world. No invader could sneak up on us, but still. H.M. Since we can use the castling function at any time, I think I'll put the core back inside the dungeon and only swap it out once the hero gets close or something. Anyway, it was important that we didn't take things too far and end up drawing too much attention to ourselves. Now would be a good opportunity to lean back and see just how strong heroes really were. The only preparations we really needed to make were building a backup iron Hanawa golem and some magic blades. Basically, I was pretty relaxed. But yeah, it'd be a waste to just sit on this 200,000 DP. I'll strengthen the dungeon a little. Specifically, now seems like a good time to build a new area. Okay. What kind of area? I've got two ideas. A Colosseum area and a Grasslands area. I would put the Colosseum area right before the boss room, and I would make it so you could reach the Grasslands area through the storeroom area. If you went through the Colosseum, you'd reach the boss fight. If you went through the Grasslands, you'd hit a dead end. Also, the Grasslands area would have the terrain modifiers Sky, 50,000 DP, and Grasslands, 500 DP. Haku told me about them when we were discussing human farms. I was pretty sure that terrain modifiers weren't in the catalog until Haku brought them up, so I imagine they had some requirement for showing up that we skipped. Terrain modifiers worked on the entire floor they were placed on. For instance, the sky would simulate a working sun all the way down to the hot sunlight. There were even nights and rainy days too, making it a real sky. Other modifiers existed too, like the beach and volcano modifiers. The volcano modifier was a super cheap 100 dp, but the beach modifier cost over 100,000 dp. 
I figured it was more expensive because oceans existing inside of a volcano just wasn't natural. You could use DP to shape the ground and make a miniature world within your dungeon. Apparently these modifiers originally existed to help monsters live as comfortable a life as possible, but according to Haku, they could also be used to help lessen the stress of humans living in human farms, which led to them living longer. Though even with a sky in place, it only worked on the ceilings of rooms in the floor without being any wider or taller. Therefore, it was best to use it with a large room on the floor. I'll, uh, keep it small enough that they don't try building a village inside of it. Having a sky just near the entrance should be good enough. Really, I had mainly decided to include the grasslands area because I wanted to see what the heck a fake sky, constrained to the ceiling of a room would look like. I'm also gonna put a safe zone in the grasslands area. It'll basically be like a break zone, a place for adventurers to relax and get some rest. H.M. Maybe I should spawn some rabbits around here, too. You sure are nice to the adventurers. Yep. Cause this is gonna be a place that does what safe zones are actually supposed to do. That being, encourage adventurers to relax such that they're more susceptible to surprise attacks that wipe them all out. Safe zones aren't actual safe zones at all. Of course, this one will normally be a safe place to camp out without any monsters. A trap sprung constantly would get caught in no time. Traps only work when they're rarely sprung. So like, adventurers will stop here to rest before the boss, and then bam! We get em when their guard is down. Yep, that's the idea. And so, I got to work really overhauling the dungeon. But first came golems digging out space for the new floors, so it'd be a while until everything was ready. Plus, I had to keep an eye on the map to make sure we didn't run into the flame caverns. Thankfully, though, I didn't need to worry about anyone noticing these changes since nobody had gotten past the puzzle area. At most, they noticed the new colored jellies. Day 145 the day after I placed those colored jelly spawners, the guild receptionist came to see me. Kaima, I have some news for you. Although you may have already heard of this, the dungeon is showing signs of a paradigm shift. I request that you either avoid entering the dungeon or otherwise stay on the first floor. Ah. Th thanks for the heads up. Right, paradigm shifts. People think that new monsters showing up is a sign of a paradigm shift. I don't have any plans for holding a dungeon battle, so. Dang. I forgot. By the way, they were apparently going to place a defensive line by the entrance in case monsters came rushing out. I was on call to join the line at some point. It was basically in the form of a personal guild quest, but one I couldn't really refuse. I don't know how to say this, but... Uh, I'm sorry everyone. Wow, Kaima, you don't usually make big mistakes like this. Did you not get enough sleep? Maybe not. Maybe not indeed. The scale of the dungeon was getting so big that I was having trouble keeping up. It was impossible not to forget things. Come on. Get a grip, Kaima. You're the real heart and soul of this dungeon now. Everyone's counting you. Yeah, I'll be more careful. I didn't talk to anyone about the colored jellies first so I can't blame you for not noticing. But seriously, don't hesitate to tell me when I'm making a mistake. I mess stuff up and forget things like anyone else. Ahaha, you? Making a mistake? What kind of joke is that, Kaima? I'm not joking. If you forget that I'm a dungeon master summoned from another world, I'm basically a normal human without any cheat skills, you know? Rokuko sighed and looked off into the distance. Well, yeah? I knew that. I've known it the whole time, and I'm okay with that. I wasn't totally serious when I said it but I honestly was okay with leaving the dungeon to you after you got rid of those bandits. Wait, what? When did I become a hard worker and Rokuko a lazy slacker? This is just messed up. I'll try expanding the dungeon with my own ideas, too. So for right now, just look forward to what I'm going to build. Yeah. I'll leave that whole area to you, so go ahead and fill our dungeon with as many goblins as you want. I seriously don't like goblins that much, okay? Yeah, I know. I know that, Rokuko. Just follow your heart. It sure sounds like you don't believe me at all. 
Well, either way, it's all yours. I'll just focus on my guild work as an adventurer for now. I know this is all my fault, but man, working sure does suck. Day 148 I was guarding the dungeon's entrance against a paradigm shift that wasn't ever gonna come. It sucked and was totally pointless. That said, the only people who knew that were those involved with the dungeon. The guild had done their due diligence and ordered a barricade built around the entrance and sent out mandatory quests involving guarding the front door and investigating any changes within the dungeon. Although only a few adventurers were actively guarding the barricade at any time, a large number of fairly skilled adventurers were gathered in the in-just-in case they were needed. The result? A ton more DP for me, the one good thing about this whole mess. Anyway, today I had guard duty with the C-rank adventurer Gozu. It really wasn't so bad once you got used to it. Where's Rokuko? She's the owner of the inn, so she gets a free pass. Hey, Gozu. The only thing that changed was some colored jellies, right? What's the problem with that? Kaima, it's a pretty fucking big deal for a bunch of monsters to start appearing out of nowhere in any dungeon. Even jellies. Hey, Gozu. Mind if I go to sleep? Get a grip, Kaima. You're only a C-rank in this dungeon. If things get too bad, that might change. Keep a close eye on that entrance. Your future depends on it. Yeah. But I already know what's up, so it's hard to care at all. Cause I know there's nothing to worry about. I kept up the conversation with Gozu. So, how's that blacksmith friend of yours doing? Kantara? Pretty good. Seems like he's making a good living here. Those eggshells were pretty rare, he said. Oh, really? I did get them from Haku, so yeah. Phoenix eggshells really did have a huge resistance to fire. It'd be a pain if people started asking where I got them, so I decided to just pass it off as if Haku gave them to me. And yep, goes and nodded to himself after hearing it. You can never know what to expect from A ranks. Oh, and by the way, we made an oven out of Phoenix eggshells just for the fun of it. It ended up being pretty much the best oven I had ever seen in my life. Kim Yu, being a chore loving Silky, was super pumped about it. A small ember was all it needed to cook juicy meat, apparently. It'd burn if you let your guard down for a second, but to her that just meant it was the perfect place to show her skills. All right, I think I'll have him make some kitchen knives in that forge. Just for Kinyu. Oh? Given a present to that cute green lady, eh? I thought for sure you had a thing for little girls, but looks like you have a thing for nice and curvy women too. Gahaha. Hey, don't get the wrong idea. I'm a foot fetishist, not a lilicon. And despite my love of feet, I haven't used my absolute authority to order any of my underlings to give me their socks and shoes. I'm an absolute gentleman. Each of those three monster girls have delicious, delicious feet and I wa him. They have shapely feet, so if I weren't such a gentleman, there'd be some seriously R-rated stuff going on right now. That girl's cooking urine's food, right? I'd bet Kantara would be stoked to be making knives for a cook that good. I'd hope so. Oh, how much do knives cost? Dunno if I could buy them if they're too expensive. You could buy plenty no problem if you bag an iron golem in the dungeon. If you're really pressed for cash, you could just ask for a favor. Just pay him back by letting us buy beer in the inn. You guys want to drink that much. And workers don't want to deal with drunkards causing a lot of problems. Get the guild to build you a tavern or something. Who knows when we get to drink beer, though? How many days does it even take to build a tavern? Ah, all right. Maybe I'll ask the wizard who built the employee dorm next to the inn to make a tavern next. He'd finish it in no time, but his work is expensive. Oh yeah, that dorm did pop out of nowhere. You're in growing all the time is one of the seven big mysteries of the Cave of Desire, you know. Wait, what? Seven big mysteries? Since when did that become a thing? When did people start talking about those? Huh? You haven't heard of them before? Hey, you're one of them. People are always talking about an adventurer who barely works staying at the inn night after night somehow. Oof. What about the other five? Other than the dorm built in a night and the lazy adventurer, there's the spots beloved by A-rank adventurers, the mysterious blonde lowly, the impossibly cozy onsen, 
the legendary S-rank meal, and the ever-working golems. Every single mystery of this dungeon just has to do with our inn. And hey, the onsen being cozy isn't a mystery, that's just a fact. And apparently the owner of the inn slips into your room at night, all the time. Some people are saying you'd get to stay at the inn for free cause you're leeching off her. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't say things like that, man. None of that's true. If people learn that's true, Haku's gonna find out too and kill me. Huh. But we've got plenty of eyewitnesses who saw the owner sneaking into your room. Rokuko is in my party and we have tactical strategy meetings sometimes. There's nothing mysterious about it. Really now? Goza cackled to himself. This jerk's just messing with me. But you know, Kaima, you're a dude too. Dancha ever want to just let loose or something, know what I mean? Sorry, but the only thing I lust for is sleep. Oddly enough, maybe due to being a dungeon master, I didn't really get as horny as I used to. Maybe it was when Ichika first joined the crew. Before that, I could barely stop myself from jumping at Rokuko and Meat's feet. Nowadays? Eh. It's not so bad. Though I still check out their feet when I get the chance. At this rate, if I can just conquer my sense of hunger, I'll be free to do nothing but sleep constantly. Oh, what about that little dog girl, then? Guess I don't have to worry about her, huh? That's right. You don't need to worry about meat at all. I'm not the kind of guy who'd go into full horn dog mode in front of a little kid. As long as meat's around keeping watch, I'll never become a pervert. So, yeah? No worries, my man. But you know, I can't shake TH feeling that you might be working her too hard. Heh. She actually starts pouting if I don't let her sleep in the same bed as me, man. If she's working too hard, it's because she wants to. Yeah? She must really care about you. You treat her right, ya hear? Of course. We kept on chatting and continued guarding the dungeon entrance against monsters that would never be coming. Day 152 you might not think so, but sitting down all day during guard duty was surprisingly tiring. I went back to my room and fell asleep the moment my shift was over. And thus was my life for an uncomfortably long time. But now that's finally over. Nothing had happened after a solid week, so the guild concluded everything was safe and took down the barricade. Ha, finally, I can take it easy again. Rokuko swung my door open and rushed in again the next morning. Did I never teach her how to knock? Meh. Whatever. I closed my eyes and let myself drift along the pleasant sleepy waves. Morning, huh? Mornings are for sleeping through. Zzz. I know that you humans are actually supposed to wake up in the morning. Wait, now's not the time for joking around. The hero is here, the hero. The hero? All right, got it. I'll get up. In like five minutes. Wake up now. The hero's already here. He's busy in the guild's branch office right now, but he'll be coming our way any second. Rokuko beat her fists against me through my blanket. That didn't really hurt, but it was pretty annoying. Guess I should get up already. And I mean, the hero is here, so... Fwaea. All right, all right. The hero's here, huh? Let's check him out. I opened the map and zoomed to the guild branch office. I checked his DP. How much DP he earned us over a day, and saw. Holy cow, 1,000 DP. That's how strong heroes are? Dang, they're in a league of their own. I could roll the 1,000 DP gacha every day with this kind of income. Or in goblin terms, I could summon 50 a day. I want him to get out of here ASAP, but I also want him to stay for a while. What a tricky guy. Rokuko, get the grand suite ready. But that room is reserved for Hakune-sama. We've been treating the grand suite like it belongs to Haku, but it's just a normal room like any other. We're an inn. We gotta let the visitors sleep in the room they pay for. I don't give a damn. Prepare the A, rank meal too, while you are at it. It shouldn't matter if it's a kid's meal. And get him to stay for as long as possible. As for the children's deluxe lunch, well, whatever. Just give him the same thing we gave Haku. Now I'm gonna go back to sleep so the hero doesn't see me. I laid back down after watching Rokuko leave my room. Okay. 
Finally time to sleep. Oh no, Kaima. But the moment I started falling asleep, Rokuko yet again kicked my door open, this time so hard it broke off its hinges and flew inside my room. So she finally broke it, huh? Now I definitely have to teach Rokuko about knocking. I must avenge my noble door's death. What happened this time? Is it something so bad you really can't handle it without me? But upon hearing my question, Rokuko blushed bright red and lowered her eyes before finally responding while fidgeting. The hero, P, 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 proposed to me. W, H, what should I do, Kaima? Dot, he, what? Hashtag Wataru's perspective. So this is the cave of desire. Wataru Nishimi. That was the name of the hero who had been summoned from Japan to the string province of the Liverio Empire. Despite being summoned when he was still in his third year of high school, he had been thoroughly trained by the string province's chivalric knight order from the moment of his summoning until only recently. When he asked why he had been summoned, they told him that they needed his power to defeat a demon king. But apparently, the Duke of String had performed the hero summoning ceremony without permission from the Empire. He thought that it wouldn't be a problem if Wataru could defeat a demon king and bring honor to his house. Unfortunately, the Empire learned about his existence, before he finished his training. Before he brought them any honor. As a result, the Duke was executed for hiding a hero from the state, and trying to monopolize his power. Heroes were geopolitically equivalent to a weapon of mass destruction, as they were by default strong enough to earn an S rank in the Adventurer's Guild. Summoning a hero without permission was basically the same thing as stealing government secrets and building a long-range nuclear warhead. Yeah, you would need more than a firearm license to do something like that. And although the Liverio Empire was by no means on good terms with the demon realm, Invading another country without authorization from the standing emperor would be an act of clear treason. Wataru could hardly blame the empire for the execution. The duke was clearly at fault. Not to mention that his exclusive goal had been to gain more power, since he considered himself more suitable to the throne than anyone else. In fact, his introduction to Wataru had been, Greetings, hero. I am Bree String, future emperor of these lands though as of yet I am still a mere duke. There were a lot of problems with that introduction. Wataru didn't even understand how he planned to become the emperor in the first place, given his status as a duke. He didn't have imperial blood, so his only option would be a bloody coup d'etat. Not much chance of that succeeding. In the end, the real emperor executed the duke and entrusted Wataru to Haku Leverio, his ancestor. Despite looking by all accounts like a human, her massive lifespan and immense beauty had led many to believe that she was actually a high elf. She had acquiesced the throne to her children long ago and was in the middle of retirement, with an imperial villa as her home. Though she remained just as powerful and influential as she was when she founded the Liverio Empire, both her influence and beauty hadn't changed over the years. And on top of that, she was also an A-rank adventurer known as the White-Winged Goddess. She involved herself in both the politics of the empire and everyday affairs across the lands. Some said she was the most important person in the entire empire, even more so than the emperor himself. Wait, isn't she supposed to be in retirement? The definition for retirement must be different in this world, thought Wataru. Under Haku's protection, Wataru became a hero known throughout the Liverio Empire. He formally left the string knight order that had been training him and became a direct subject of the empire itself. A noble title was still being prepared for him, but in the meantime he was being considered one of Haku's personal bodyguards. And why did a hero such as he go to the Cave of Desire? Simple, he had seen one of the decks of cards brought to the imperial capital by a traitor. The cards were made of a much higher quality paper than almost any he had seen in this world, and they had pretty pictures imprinted on them. The moment Wataru saw the cards, he couldn't help but remember the world he had almost forgotten. Earth and his home, Japan. On top of all that, the container for the box of cards had a barcode on it. It was a clear, nostalgic sign that the cards were from his original world. Although residents of this fantasy world would only see it as a meaningless pattern, to him the barcode was an undeniable link to Japan. Wataru immediately considered finding out where the cards came from or rather, 
where he could get them himself, to be his most important goal. He was Haku's bodyguard in name only, after all. Completing that goal was surprisingly simple, as if his path had been prepared for him. After requesting leave from Haku and explaining why, she informed him that he was looking for the very place that she often snuck off to on private business. As she had no reason to stop him from going there, she granted his request and even prepared a carriage for him. After about half a month of riding within the bumpy carriage, Wataru finally reached the Cave of Desire. This is the place, right? Before him was a shabby guild branch office and an inn. Nothing else. He later heard about a nearby smithery, but he couldn't see it from where he was. Wataru immediately headed for the inn. But right before going inside, remembered that he should probably visit the guild first to announce his arrival. Unfortunately, they offered him a cup of tea that he couldn't refuse, which took more time than he would have liked. Being an S rank's not as easy as it sounds. This kind of thing never happened to me back when I was a C rank. But he couldn't go back to being a C rank even if he wanted to. Heroes are an automatic S rank within the guild. Automatic. He headed back to the inn. W welcome to my inn. A girl in a dress greeted him immediately upon entry. Her long blonde hair fell to the ground as she bowed in greeting to him. She then glanced around the room before finally stammering out the rest of her greeting. Th thank you v very much for visiting. Visiting our dancing doll in. I'm Rokuko, its owner. The owner herself was greeting him. They must have been contacted about his arrival beforehand. But seriously, she was stammering so much. And she bit her tongue midway through her sentence. Somehow. That felt very calming. Wataru subconsciously smiled. For some reason, he couldn't take his eyes off Rokuko. He felt something very familiar, very nostalgic about her. Sir? W.H. What is it? Rokuko, confused by Wataru's staring, peered at him. Ah, uh, you're nothing. I'm Wataru Nishimi. Um, I heard from Lady Haku that you have a sweet room she recommends. She also said the food is really good. What? Oh, okay. Give me just a second. Um, there's a chair right over there. Go ahead and sit. She left it at that and dashed into a hallway. Wataru noticed that she stopped being very polite by the end of her greeting, probably due to not being very used to interacting with visitors, but he didn't mind. He sat in the recommended seat and took a deep breath. The air smelled slightly like Japan, he thought. Yeah. There's definitely something special about this place. He thought back to the past three years. A lot had happened. He started to wonder how his old buddies from the String Knights Order were doing, but stopped before he remembered the traumas he had associated with that time in his life. It wasn't long before Rokuko came back. Something about her definitely drew him in. The grand suite is this way. Please follow me. He followed after Rokuko. Before him were her swaying blonde hair and cute butt. He knew she wasn't trying to seduce him or anything of the sort, but for some reason, he couldn't look away from her but its swaying form captivated him. I don't get it. This has never happened to me before. His heart beat faster as he felt something similar to lust mixed with nostalgia. I want to try squeezing it. Wait, what am I thinking? Wataru shook his head to get rid of his lustful thoughts. Sir? Ah, uh, I didn't mean it. Um, rather, this is the grand suite. And here is your key. Thank you. Before he knew it, they had reached the grand suite. He took the key from the owner and looked around the room. The glass window, wallpaper, and furniture were all reasonable. He felt as if he had seen furniture exactly like it before, but it wouldn't be odd if they had been made within this fantasy world. But the massage chair in the middle of the room was a different story, especially since it would vibrate if you put money into a box beside it. I don't see any power outlets or anything. Ah, uh, sir, when will you be eating? We're serving breakfast right now, and... Ah, uh, but you have to buy a food ticket first. Ah, uh, but I think visitors staying in the suite can order from their room? It was very clear from her constant confusion that she wasn't used to dealing with customers. Thankfully, Wataru found that more amusing than anything. Your name's Rokuko, if I remember correctly. 
Who are you, really? Th the owner of this inn, of course. Rokuko glanced away, but Wataru had more or less already guessed the truth. Haka liked this place. She recommended it. The design of the inn. After mulling everything together and drawing a conclusion, Wataru spoke. Will you become my partner? Eh? No way. She rejected him so fast and hard she didn't even try to be polite. Hashtag Kaima's perspective proposing to Rokuko? What, does this guy wanna die? Haku's gonna execute him the second he goes home if she hears about this. And I mean, that won't be a problem for me or anything, but I don't wanna abandon a Japanese brother of mine like that. I'm in the middle of trying to live like a good person. So, what should I do, Kaima? First of all, what exactly did he say to you? Eh? And the mom, he said please become my partner, or something like that. Rokuko blushed and fidgeted, but... Was that really a proposal? Partner was a word with lots of different meanings. It certainly was often used to denote a married couple, but it could also just mean two people working together, like Rokuko and I. I've called Rokuko my partner more than a few times, after all. Ah. Wait. Is Mr. Automatic Translation playing some major tricks on me again? Hey, Rokuko. Would you mind defining partner for me real fast? Well, obviously, I turned him right down. You're the only partner I need, Kaima. Th thanks. So, you turned him down. What's the problem? Hold on. Um, well. He's being really pushy about it. He wants to eat breakfast with me so we can talk. You come too, Kaima. An invitation from a mighty S-rank adventurer, huh? She could just turn him down like anyone else. There are no rules about obeying their every command or anything. But I guess we're gonna have to talk to him at some point. We may as well do it over a meal. And yeah, uh, I get the feeling letting Rokuko talk to him alone would be a huge mistake. She'll definitely let something major slip. Maybe she's already let something slip. It's possible. Like, what did she do that led to him asking her to be his partner? I can't even imagine. Was it just love at first sight? And so, I ended up talking directly with the hero. It was hard to turn down an invitation to eat together. We were in the grand suite. I was sitting opposite to the hero, wearing my Narakin mask so that I could pass myself off as the mysterious earth wizard adventurer. Rokuko was beside me. Also, since I was trying to hide my black Japanese hair, I had converted the mask into more of a full-plate helmet with slits for eye openings. I could lift up the mouth plate to eat. It was pretty convenient, so I planned on replacing my mask with it entirely. Dyeing my hair entirely was another option, but I didn't know how to dye it, and it'd be annoying to dye my hair whenever I had to do anything special in public. But most importantly... I didn't want to impact the quality of my sleep by messing with my hair. Greetings, Lord Hero. I am Narakin. This is my partner, Rokuko. It is an honor to meet you. It's nice to meet you, too. I am Wataru Nishimi. Um, Narakin. Rokuko. I'm sorry to be so rude despite inviting you to this meal, but the food's so different from what I expected I don't know if I'll be able to say much for a bit. I'm sorry. The plan had been to talk while eating, but despite worrying if the children's lunch would be enough for him, the hero had completely fallen head over heels for it. He had been staring at the food and the cream soda ever since Kinyu started setting the table. Maybe it had been a mistake to give him the normal A-rank meal? Since he grew up in Japan, he knew how much a meal like this would actually cost. Even still, I thought that it was a bit ridiculous to ask five gold for it. And so, the hero became absorbed in silently eating his food. He had a deadly serious expression on his face the entire time. Uh, you're like twenty years old, so it's kinda awkward watching you silently eat a lunch for children like this. Rokuko and I ate silently as well. Even if we tried talking to him, he just shot us down so hard it kinda felt like he'd murder us if we got in the way of his eating. I knew it. He must be friggin' pissed about the price. Curse you, Ichika, or so I thought, but apparently I was wrong. Thank you for the meal. Wataru, after drinking down all the cream soda and leaving not a single crumb on his plate, started crying. 
I'm sorry, this food just reminded me of my hometown. The home I'll never be able to return to. Three years. Haku said that Wataru had been summoned to this world three years ago. That's as long as it would take to enter and graduate from a Japanese high school. It wasn't a short time frame at all, and a lot must have happened to him over those years. I didn't know what, but judging from his reaction to the food, it wasn't hard to imagine that his life here had been a lot, lot harder than his old life. You can't go home? Right. My home is in another world, and there's no way to reach it from this one. I'm still looking for a way to return, but... Even if I do find one, I won't be able to use it. I've... I've killed people with my own hands since coming to this world. That is an unforgivable crime where I come from. He had killed people since coming to this world, and thus considered himself incapable of returning to Japan. He wouldn't be arrested for murdering fantasy people or anything, but I imagine he was talking from an emotional perspective. If you can't go home, why are you searching for a way back? So that if I find someone else in my situation, I can help them return home. Well, that's one reason, but I guess homesickness is what really drives me. I miss my home more than I can describe. This place is so much easier to live in than Japan that I don't really feel like going back myself. But maybe I'll start missing home eventually? As long as I get to sleep, I'm happy. I understand why Haku recommended this in to me. There's definitely a connection between this place and Japan. I have a lot of questions I want to ask you too. Is that okay? If there are questions I can answer, I will try. Okay. Rice. Wataru thanked me and placed a box of cards on the table. I've heard that boxes of cards like this can be found within the Cave of Greed. You've heard right, they're all over the place on the first floor. We buy them from adventurers for five coppers each. Wait, um, what's this weird pattern thingy? The hero grinned. Rokuko's comment made me realize what he was pointing out. I felt the blood drain from my face and a shiver run down my spine. It's a barcode. These things have barcodes on them? That's it. We're done for. No way out of this one. That's what I'm talking about. This pattern is called a barcode, and a special technique allows one to extract information about a product through it. Ah, uh, now that you mention it, I have been wondering what this pattern meant. Very interesting. I played it as cool as I could. Yeah. This guy's definitely thinking I'm Japanese. My reaction just now may have sealed the deal for him. We might have an ace detective on our hands. Oh, right. He definitely asked Haku about the barcode too. That must be why she was so sure I had some genius plan to attract heroes. The barcodes were perfect bait. Sorry. It was just a dumb mistake. So, basically, I think that this dungeon might be a key to finding my way back home. I see. Well, investigate it all you want, but keep in mind this is a dungeon for beginners. Don't tear it up too much. Right. I'll keep that in mind. Either way, I would like to rent this room for the next week. With that said, the hero Wataru bowed to us deeply. H.M. He seems like a nice enough guy, but what should I do with him? Oh. Right. I should follow up on that whole proposing to Rokuko thing. Pretty sure he was just asking her to be his investigation partner or something, but yeah. By the way, I heard something about you proposing to Rokuko? Wataru spat out his drink. Did he tie that knot with his tongue? Yeah, well, yeah, I did. She turned me down, though. But I'm not giving up on her. I'll definitely make her fall for me. You do know that Rokuko is Haku's little sister, right? You're definitely gonna have an, uh, accident if you lay your hands on her. Don't worry, I won't do anything without Rokuko's consent. I care about what she thinks. If you care about what she thinks, why didn't you give up on her after she turned you down? I also happen to be her partner already, so... Oh, but she's not wearing a ring. Have you not given her one yet? A ring? I guess where you're from, hero, there's a custom of giving a ring to one's partner. We live out in the country as you can see, so it's likely that our cultures differ in that respect. In that case, I can gift her a ring myself. I'll have one sent to her tomorrow if you can tell me her size. 
Ha 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 ha, no need. I can find a ring for her on my own. This isn't the kind of gift to leave to another person, I think. I glanced at Rokuko and saw that she was grinning, her cheeks flushed. I feel like this conversation's going down a bad path. I was just saying what came to mind, but really, what the heck does? Partner. Actually mean to these two. He brought up a ring. I should have just manned up and asked what. Partner. Meant when I had the chance. I'm pretty bad at just going with the flow. Does he mean like a wedding ring? That's right. We're definitely partners. If you really care that much about Rokuko, I would like you to prove it. Huh? Prove it. Yes. If you can prove that you two really are that close, I might find it in me to give up on her. Yeah, I don't know what's wrong with this guy. But I think I get what he's saying. So basically, Rokuko and I just have to kiss in front of you. Hi, hi, hi. And no, HH, hold on. And no way, no way. I am not ready for that yet, no way. Rokuko shook both hands in front of her face, blushing bright red. Seriously? If you turn a kiss down that intensely, the hero's definitely not gonna drop this. Though if we did kiss, Haku would probably execute me later, so. This is fine too. Ha, seems like Rokuko's not up for a kiss. Which means I still have a chance to win her over and take her from you. Seriously? You're just gonna say it like that? What a guy. Now, now, Rokuko is just a little shy, that's all. We may not look it, but we are partners in body and soul. Oh? Okay, let's do it this way. I fell in love with her at first sight. Show me that you have what it takes to protect Rokuko. For instance, if you're a better adventurer than me, I'll be confident leaving her to you. Ha ha ha, surely you jest. Isn't it a little much to ask that I'd be a better adventurer than you, an S rank? Don't worry. I was a C rank before the guild automatically boosted me up to S rank. Come on, that's gotta be because the duke was putting pressure on them. He didn't want you shooting up the ranks and getting noticed by Haku, since she actually runs the guild. Wataru stood up and spoke in a deeper, cooler tone of voice. Narakin, I'll fight you for Rokuko. No thanks. I shot him down. Narakin, I'll fight you for Rokuko. No thanks. Saying it twice won't change anything. But why? Because there's absolutely no reason for me to do so. Judging from everything you've said up to this point, what you're doing now is nothing more than trying to wrap me up in your failed confession. You're being a nuisance. NGH. You're right. Ah, uh, why not? Go ahead, fight him over me. Rokuko, however, was pretty into the idea for whatever reason. Very well. But tell me, hero, what's in it for me if I win? Why? Air, um. How about? I keep quiet about you being a Japanese person, Narakin? Does that sound fair? Why would you suggest that I am Japanese? Aren't you? Yep. I totally am, but saying that here would just be sealing my fate. And if I say no, he might have a lie-detecting magic tool that would likewise seal my fate. The only thing I can do here is change the topic and get him confused. Let's assume I am a Japanese person. Why would you telling others that be a problem for me? I don't know, but it must be problematic to you since you're wearing that mask to hide it. If it's not a problem, why don't you take off the mask so we can talk as Japanese people face to face? It's possible that my face is just so scarred and hideous that I don't want anybody to see it. I would prefer it if you did not press this subject. Ah. Uh, I am sorry. I didn't think about that. Wataru bowed in apology, accepting his mistake. Dang. This guy is a lot nicer than I thought he'd be. In any case, I refuse your challenge. There's just no reason for me to accept. I see, that's unfortunate. Yeah? Well, you don't look too sad about it. Hmm. I bet he's planning something. But despite my suspicion, the meal ended without him pulling anything funny. Anyway, I'm gonna hide out in the master room for the next week and pass it off as Narakin going off on a business trip or something. That should help me avoid having any more difficult conversations like this one. Day 156 and so, 
three days passed. We got about 4,500 dp from Wateru staying those three days. Plus, his room fee had totaled to 75 gold coins, with an additional 25 gold coins for food. We were making the big bucks. The big bucks. Oh, and ten of those gold coins from the food came from a tip he gave Rokuko and me for eating with him. We were repaying the thanks by giving him a free sandwich each morning. But man, the grand suite really is something special. We're making as much now as we do when Haku comes over. The hero's not tipping Rokuko like Haku does, but he innately gives us DP just by existing. That's a big help, since Haku's passive DP value is zero a day for whatever reason. Hey, Kaima! What are you going to give me that ring? I've been waiting for it, you know. Huh? Ring? What are you talking about? You forgot. I like the partner ring? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, that thing. I remember. Yeah, the ring. Right. So, what kind of ring do you want? Gold? Silver? Something flashy? I just want whatever ring you think would fit me the best. That kind of hands-off advice is the hardest to deal with. Eh, whatever. This is a present, after all. Rokuko has blonde hair and blue eyes, so a bright red ring would probably look good on her. It'll take a bit before it's ready. Is that okay? Yeah, um, uh huh. I'm looking forward to it. Rokuko left my room while fidgeting. Is she holding in pee or something? Wait, no, she's a dungeon core. Must be something else. By the way, I asked Ichika what partner meant, and she told me it meant companion with a strong nuance of two being as one. Married couples were often called partners, but so were parties of two friendly adventurers. Unless I'm just being cocky here, I think Rokuko might be a little in love with me. I'm not sure what there is to love about me, but yeah. Honestly, I wouldn't mind if she was. She has the exact kind of cute feet that I love, after all. But let's say that, theoretically, she and I got together. Oh crap. Haku just murdered my theoretical self. How did that ever happen? My imagination's too powerful for my own good. Right after I finished taking my pre-sleep nap, Rokuko came walking in, eating a purin. Kaima, the hero is looking for you. Me? Not Narakin? I don't know why, but I've got a bad feeling about this. I'm pretty sure he's never met me as anyone but Narakin before. Why is he looking for me, specifically? Mmm, he's looking for you, Kaima. He wants to talk to you about meat, or something. The Japanese hero wants to talk to me about the dog-eared lowly slave working in my inn. Yeah, all right, I can already guess what he has to say. Yuff, this feels like it's gonna be annoying. Can't you tell him I'm not here? Wheel, the regulars in the end were all like that guys always sleeping in the end, Kaima? TCH. I let my guard down. But a conversation about meat, huh? Oh man, wait. Did he fall in love with meat since Rokuko rejected him? Man, this hero is a real playboy. I shook myself awake and headed to the cafeteria. I wanted to avoid meeting the hero like this, but eh, whatever. Meeting him as Narakin had just been a cautionary step while testing the waters. My true identity wasn't a huge secret or anything, though I had hoped to hide it from him if possible. The moment I entered the cafeteria, Meat came running and clung to me. Everyone turned to look at us. Master. Hey. Good girl, good girl. What's up? I rubbed Meat's head, causing her to happily wag her tail and ears. She was so sweet it warmed my heart. All right, time to take her back to my room and sleep. Are you Kaima? The hero stopped us. Come on, man, read the friggin' mood. That's right. Who are you? Wataru Nishimi. I wanted to talk to you about that little girl, but now I have other business with you. Judging from the direction of his gaze, Wataru was probably looking at my hair. So, did he figure out I'm Narakin? I didn't use a fake voice or anything back then, so it's possible. It'd be a little hard to talk out here. You're Narakin, aren't you? Nope. I'm Kaima. You sound exactly the same. How are you here when you said you were out on a trip? Didn't Narakin mention the horrible scars on his face? 
I don't have a scratch on mine. Ah, that's true. Wait. I didn't see the scars with my own eyes. I knew it. You just dressed up as Narakin to hide your black hair, didn't you? TCH. Couldn't manage to trick him. Um. You're a Japanese person too, right? You look like one, and the only people here with black hair are heroes. Which means Japanese people. Oh, really? I didn't know that. My parents were Japanese, and I know a lot about Japan. I don't know everything about it, though. Oh, I see. Man, he sure looks disappointed. Guess he didn't notice I never said I'm not Japanese. So, what did you want to talk to me about? Air, I said half of it on the way here, but... Is this girl Japanese, too? She has black hair, too, I mean. Not sure about the dog ears, though. He did just say that only Japanese people have black hair. There might be people with black hair that live a long ways away, but around here, it's pretty rare. Honestly, I want to know where meat came from, too. I found meat recently, so I don't know. Have any ideas, meat? I don't know anything about my past. All my memories are blurry. But, I'd be happy if I were the same as you, master. What a little cutie. I rubbed meat's head. Air. You really are Japanese, aren't you? Narakin. I'm not Narakin. I'm Kaima. All right. Kaima. Crash. Wataru hit the table so hard it broke. It all happened in an instant. I had built the table to be pretty strong, but Wataru split it in two with a single slam of his fist. It collapsed in on itself like a V-shape. A moment later, I broke out in a cold sweat. W-H, why the heck did he break the table? And Meat had jumped in front of me protectively with her golem knife brandished, glaring at the hero. Oh geez, this girl's super cool. I didn't think you were the kind of guy to lay your hands on little girls. I can't leave Rokuko with you. Don't get near Haka's little sister. I would like to thank our first ever channel member, Gluttony Gaming. Thanks man, this means a lot to me. Thank you for your support, and thanks to all of you who watched my videos. Thank you guys. And that's it for the video guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And if you did, hit that subscribe button. And don't forget to press that bell icon so you don't miss any future updates. And I will see you all in the next one.